Good morning. Today's date is March 7th, 2023. My name is Joseph Ely, a member of your AB support team for today's proceedings, and I'd formally like to welcome you to the 180th meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee. At this time, I would like to hand the meeting over to Dr. Chair, Dr. Hana El Sali. Dr. El Sali. Thank you, Mr. Ely. Welcome uh, to the public, to the committee members and the participants to the 180th uh, Vaccine and Related Biological Products uh, Advisory Committee meeting. During this meeting, we will be discussing uh, the flu vaccine strain selection for the Northern Hemisphere for the season 2023-2024. I want to remind our committee members that during the discussion uh, time to uh, use the raise your hand function uh, so I can see who is uh, ready for comments and questions and uh, I will call upon you upon that. Please um, unmute yourself and turn on your camera. Um, I would like to turn the meeting uh, now over to Dr. Susan Paydar, the designated federal officer for the meeting for uh, the conflict of interest statement and introductory remarks. Thank you, Dr. El Salvi. Um, good morning, everyone. Um, this is Dr. Susan Paidar, and it is my great honor to serve as the designated federal officer for today's 180th Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee meeting. On behalf of the FDA, the Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, CBER, and the committee, I'm happy to welcome everyone for today's virtual meeting. Today, the committee will meet in open session to discuss and make recommendations on the selection of strains to be included in the influenza virus vaccines for the 2023-2024 influenza season. Today's meeting and the topic were announced in the Federal Register Notice that was published on February 9th, 2023. At this time, I would like to acknowledge outstanding leadership of Dr. Peter Marks, Director, Center for Biologics Evaluation and Research, Dr. David Caslow, Director, Office of Vaccines Research and Review, Dr. Ware, Director, Division of Viral Products, OBRR, and Dr. Sudakar Agnihotram, Acting Senior Advisor to the Office Director, Office of Vaccines Research and Review. I also would like to thank my Division Director, Dr. Prabha Atreya, and her excellent leadership, and my team whose contributions have been critical for preparing today's meeting. Ms. Valerie Vashio, Ms. Karen Thomas, Ms. Joanne Lipkine, and Ms. Lisa Johnson. I also would like to express our sincere appreciation to Mr. Joseph Ely in facilitating the meeting today. Also, our sincere gratitude goes to many CBER and FDA staff working very hard behind the scenes trying to ensure that today's virtual meeting will also be a successful one, like all the previous FERPAC meetings. Please direct any press media questions for today's meeting for FDA's Office of the Media Affairs at fdaoma at fda.hhs.gov. The transcriptionists for today's meeting are Catherine Diaz and Deborah De La Croce from Translation Excellence. We'll begin today's meeting by taking a formal roll call uh, for the committee members and temporary non-voting members. When it is your turn, please turn on your video camera, unmute your phone, and then state your first and last name, institution, and areas of expertise. And when finished, you can turn your camera off so we can proceed with the next person. Please see the member roster slides in which we'll begin with the chair, Dr. Hannah Al-Sali. Dr. Al-Sali, can we start, please? Thank you. Good morning, Hannah Al-Sali, uh, Baylor College of Medicine. I'm an infectious diseases specialist, adult ID, and my research focuses on clinical vaccine development. Great, thank you, Dr. Asali. Dr. Paula Annunziata, our industry representative. Good morning, my name is Paula Annunziato. I head uh, vaccines global clinical development at Merck, and as was just mentioned, I'm the non-voting industry representative for today's meeting. Great, thank you, Dr. Annunziato. Next is Dr. Adam Berger. Uh, hi, my name is Adam Berger. I'm the director of the Division of Clinical and Healthcare Research Policy here at the National Institutes of Health. Uh, I'm a geneticist by training with additional training in uh, immunology. Thanks. Great, thank you. Next is Dr. Henry Bernstein. Good morning. Good morning, everyone. 
I'm uh, Hank Bernstein. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the Zucker School of Medicine at Hofstra Northwell. I have expertise in pediatrics and vaccines. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Dr. Archana Chatterjee. Good morning. My name is Archana Chatterjee. I have the honor and privilege of serving as the Dean of Chicago Medical School and Vice President for Medical Affairs at Rosalind Franklin University in North Chicago. I'm a pediatric infectious diseases specialist by background and training with a special interest in vaccines. Thank you. Great, thank you. Next is Captain Amanda Cohn. Good morning, I'm Amanda Cohn. I'm a pediatrician and medical epidemiologist at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention with expertise in uh, vaccine preventable diseases and vaccine policy. Thank you, Dr. Cohn. Next is Dr. Haley Gans. Good morning. I'm Dr. Haley Gans, Pediatric Infectious Disease at Stanford and the Director of our Pediatric Infectious Disease Program for Immunocompromised Hosts. And my research is at the host pathogen interface using immunology. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gans. Next is Dr. Holly James. Good morning. Um, my name is Holly James. I'm a biostatistician by training. I'm a faculty member at the Fred Hatch Cancer Center in Seattle, and my uh, specialty is vaccine evaluation. Great. Thank you. Next is Dr. Arnold Monto. I'm Arnold Monto. I'm at the University of Michigan School of Public Health, where I work on vaccine preventable uh, respiratory inf uh, infections and uh, other respiratory infections that are not yet vaccine preventable. Uh, my main interest is influenza. Thank you so much, Dr. Monto. Um, next is Dr. Paul Offit. Yes, good morning. Uh, my name is Paul Offit. I am a professor of pediatrics in the Division of Infectious Diseases at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and the Perelman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, and my expertise is in the area of vaccines. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much. Um, Dr. Stephen Pergan? I'm not quite sure if he has joined the meeting yet. Okay, we'll come back to Dr. Program if he's not available. Um, we'll we'll um, go with Dr. Stanley Perlman. Dr. Perlman. Oh, good morning. I am uh, Stanley Perlman. I'm a professor of microbiology and immunology and, and, and the pediatrics at the University of Iowa. My specialty is in pediatric infectious diseases and, and coronaviruses. Thank you so much. Um, Dr. Jay Portnoy, our consumer representative. Good morning. I'm Dr. Jay Portnoy. I'm a professor of pediatrics at the University of Missouri, Kansas City School of Medicine. I'm an allergist immunologist in the Division of Allergy, Asthma, and Pulmonology at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City. Thank you, Dr. Portnoy. Next, we'll do roll call of our temporary voting member and temporary non-voting member. Colonel Douglas Batzik, our temporary voting member. Dr. Batzik? You're mute, Dr. Badzik. Dr. Badzik, you're mute. No, I cannot hear you. Okay, while you're, okay, try it one more time. Okay, I'm gonna move to Dr. David Wentworth while you're trying to figure out the audio on your part with Derek and Joseph. Um, Dr. David Wentworth, our temporary non-voting member. Uh, thank you. I am Dr. David Wentworth, and I am the branch chief of the virology surveillance and diagnostics branch in the influenza division at the CDC, and I'm also our WHO collaborating center director there. Great. Thank you so much. I'm going to come back to Dr. Badzik one more time, see if his audio is working now. All right, can you yes, hear me? Yes, it is working. All right, fantastic. All right, uh, my name is Doug Badzik, and I represent the Department of Defense. I'm a preventive medicine, pre pre medicine physician, and I'm also the Director of Preventive Medicine for the Office of the Secretary of Defense for Health Affairs. Thank you. Fantastic, thank you. I'm gonna also uh, call on Dr. Pergam and see if he's in the room. If not, I can um, move on to the FDA. Uh, see why. Uh, I believe he's not here. Okay. All right. So uh, we have a total of 15 participants, 13 voting and two non-voting members. I'll proceed with reading the FDA conflict of interest disclosure statement for the public record. 
The Food and um, Drug Administration, FDA, is convening virtually today, March 7, 2023, the 180th meeting of the Vaccines and Related Biological Products Advisory Committee, VRPAC, under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act, FACA of 1972. Dr. Hannah El-Sali is serving as the voting chair for today's meeting. Today on March 7, 2023, the committee will meet in open session to discuss and make recommendations on the selection of strains to be included in the influenza virus vaccines for the 2023-2024 influenza season. This topic is determined to be a particular matter involving specific parties PMISP. With the exception of industry representative member, all standing and temporary voting members of the VRPAC are appointed special government employees, SGEs, or regular government employees, RGEs, from other agencies and are subject to federal conflict of interest laws and regulations. The following information on the status of this committee's compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws, including but not limited to 18 U.S.C. Section 208, is being provided to participants in today's meeting and to the public. Related to the discussions at this meeting, all members, RGE, and um, SGE consultants of this committee have been screened for potential financial conflict of interest of their own, as well as those imputed to them, including those of their spouse or minor children, and for the purposes of 18 U.S. Code 208, their employers. These interests may include investments, consulting, expert um, witness testimony, contracts and grants, cooperative research and development agreements, teaching, speaking, writing, patents and royalties, and primary employment. These may include interests that are current or under negotiation. FDA has determined that all members of this advisory committee, both regular and temporary members, are in compliance with federal ethics and conflict of interest laws. Under 18 U.S.C. Section 208, Congress has authorized FDA to grant waivers to special government employees and regular government employees who have financial conflicts of interest when it is determined that the agency's need for special government employees services outweighs the potential for a conflict of interest created by, um, the, by the financial interests involved, or when the interest of a regular government employee is not so substantial as to be deemed likely to affect the integrity of the services which the government may expect from the employee. Based on today's agenda and all financial interests reported by committee members and consultants, no conflict of interest waivers have been issued under 18 U.S. Code 208 in connection with this committee, with this meeting. We have the following consultant serving as a temporary voting member, Colonel Douglas Badzik, DOD representative. We also have Dr. David Wentworth from the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, serving as a temporary non-voting member and speaker for this meeting. As a speaker and temporary non-voting member, Dr. David Wentworth is not only allowed to respond to the clarifying questions from the committee members, but also authorized to participate in committee discussions in general. However, he is not authorized to participate in the committee voting process. Dr. Paula Anunziato of Merck will serve as the industry representative for today's meeting. Industry representatives are not appointed as special government employees and serve as non-voting members of the committee. Industry representatives act on behalf of all regulated industry and bring general industry perspective to the committee. Dr. Jay Portnoy is serving as consumer representative for this committee. Consumer representatives are appointed as special government employees and are screened and cleared prior to their participation in the meeting. They are voting members of the committee. Disclosure of conflicts of interest for speakers and guest speakers follows applicable federal laws, regulations, and FDA guidance. The guest and industry speakers for today's meeting are as follows. Dr. Lisa Groskopf, Chief Medical Officer in the Epidemiology and Prevention Branch at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, CDC, Atlanta, Georgia. Dr. Anthony Fries, DOD Global Respiratory Pathogen Surveillance Program Lead, United States Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine, Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, Ohio. Dr. Elizabeth Neimeyer, Director, Technical Life Cycle Management Influenza, 
Global Vaccines Manufacturing Science and Technology, GSK, Germany. The speakers have been screened for conflicts of interest and cleared to participate as a speaker for today's meeting. As guest speakers, Drs. Groskop and Anthony Fries are allowed to respond to the clarifying questions from the committee members following their presentations. However, they're not authorized to participate in committee discussions or to participate in the committee voting process. Dr. Elizabeth Neimeyer is serving as a guest speaker from industry to provide flu vaccine manufacturers perspective to the committee. Dr. Neimeyer is allowed to respond to the clarifying questions from the committee members following her presentation. However, she is not authorized to participate in committee discussions or voting process. FDA encourages all meeting participants, including open public hearing speakers, to advise the committee of any financial relationships that they may have with any affected firms, its products, and if known, its direct competitors. We would like to remind standing and temporary members that if the discussions involve any other products or firms not already on the agenda for which an FDA participant has a personal or imputed financial interest, the participants need to inform the DFO and exclude themselves from the discussion, and their exclusion will be noted for the record. This concludes my reading of, of the conflict of interest statement for the public record. I now hand over the meeting back to our chair, Dr. El Sali. Dr. El Sali. Thank you, Dr. Paydar. The introduction to the meeting will be now given by Dr. Jerry Weir. Dr. Jerry Weir is the director of the Division of Viral Products at the Office of Vaccine Research and Review at CBER FDA. Dr. Weir? Good morning, and thank you. Uh, welcome to the our annual Northern Hemisphere Influenza Vaccine String Composition Meeting. Uh, as everyone knows, we do this every year about this time. Uh, you can go to the next slide. Um, the purpose of today's VRPAC committee discussion is to review surveillance and epidemiology data, genetic and antigenic characteristics of recent virus isolates, serological responses to current vaccines, and the availability of candidate vaccine strains and reagents. After that review, the committee will be asked to discuss and then make recommendations for the strains of influenza A, both H1N1 and H3N2, and the B viruses to be included in the 2023-2024 influenza vaccine that are licensed for use in the United States. Next slide. Um, you will hear a lot of data presented today. Uh, you'll get presentations from the CDC, from the Department of Defense, an update from CBER about the availability of critical reagents and, and vaccine viruses, and a presentation from the manufacturers of their, their perspective. Uh, this is a lot of data condensed into a short period of time, but it covers a lot of a lot of different things, including the epidemiology of circulating strains and surveillance data from the U.S. and around the world. The data will include antigenic relationships among contemporary viruses and candidate vaccine strains. Uh, the type of data will include hemagglutination inhibition and microneutralization tests using post-infection ferret sera, uh, also HI and microneutralization tests using panels of sera from humans who have received recent influenza vaccines. You'll also see data from antigenic cartography, phylogenetic analysis of H1 and NA genes, as well as vaccine effectiveness data. Next slide. As I said, we do this every year about this time. Uh, this slide reminds you of what we did about this time last year. On February 25th, 2022, and shortly thereafter on March 3rd, 2022, uh, the WHO and the Verb Pack made recommendations for the influenza season that we're currently in, 2022-2023. At that time, both the WHO and the Burp Pack made recommendations for the influenza A H1N1 strain, as shown on the slide, an A Victoria 2570-2019 H1N1 pandemic 09-like virus for egg-based vaccines, and an A Wisconsin 588-2019 H1N1 pandemic 09-like virus for cell and recombinant-based vaccines. 
the WHO and VRPAC recommended for the influenza A H3N2 component of the vaccines and A Darwin 9 2021 H3N2 like virus for egg based vaccines and an A Darwin 6 2021 H3N2 like virus for cell and recombinant based vaccines. The WHO and the VRPAC recommended an influenza B component for trivalent and quadrivalent vaccines. It was a B Austria 1359417 2021-like virus from the B Victoria lineage and also recommended for quadrivalent vaccines containing the above three vaccine viruses, a B Phuket 3073-2013-like virus from the B Yamagata lineage. Next slide. More recently, uh, in fact, just a little over a week ago, the WHO made a recommendation for next year's vaccine strains. In other words, this is for the 2023-2024 season. Uh, the WHO made this recommendation and recommended the following for the influenza A component, the H1N1 component. Uh, the WHO recommended an A Victoria 4897-2022 H1N1 pandemic 09 like virus for egg-based vaccine vaccines and an A Wisconsin 67 2022 H1N1 pandemic 09 like virus for cell and recombinant based vaccines. Uh, this differs from the previous, the current year's vaccine. For the influenza H3N2 component, uh, the WHO recommended an A Darwin 9 2021 H3N2 like virus for egg based vaccines and an A Darwin 6 2021 H3N2 like virus for cell and recombinant based vaccines. The WHO recommended an influenza B uh, from the B Victoria lineage, the B Austria 1359417-2021 like virus that was in the previous year's vaccines, and also recommended for quadrivalent vaccines containing the above three viruses, a B Phuket 3073-2013 like virus. Uh, next slide. So with that as a background, uh, as I said, you'll hear a lot of uh, data to support those recommendations. The committee will be discussing which influenza strains should be recommended for the antigenic composition of the 2023-2024 influenza virus vaccine in the U.S. Uh, this is the purpose of today's meeting. While the WHO makes global recommendations, it's, uh, it's critical that all uh, national thought regulatory authorities make the recommendations for the vaccines in their own countries, and that's the role of the VRPAC in this process and the FDA in this process. Uh, the next slide. I'm not going to read all of this, but what we do uh, as we do this every year, we have options for what for the VRPAC to consider. And what we do is we start with the recommendations that the WHO has made, and we consider those, and the committee has the option of making those recommendations or recommending alternative uh, uh, comp vaccine candidate compositions for the H1N1, the H3N2, and the influenza B components. I'm not reading this slide because it's, it's basically captured in the next slide, which will be the voting questions. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. So this is the way we, we do the voting. We try to somewhat simplify it, uh, and we do the voting in four pieces uh, for each, basically one vote for each subtype. And so the committee would be asked to vote first on the H1N1 component, then the H3N2 component, then the influenza B component, component for trivalent and quadrivalent, and then finally a fourth vote for the quadrivalent vaccines to contain the fourth strain. And so we start with the, again, we start with a recommendation with the WHO and then go from there. And so for question number one, for the influenza A H1N1 component of the 2023-2024 influenza virus vaccines in the U.S., does the committee recommend an A Victoria 4897 uh, uh, H1N1 PDO9 like virus for egg based vaccines and an A Wisconsin 67 2019 H1N1 pandemic 09 like virus for cell and recombinant vaccines. For the second voting question, for the influenza A H3N2 component of the 2023 2024 influenza virus vaccine in the US, does the committee recommend? One, an A Darwin 9 2021 H3N2 like virus for egg based vaccines, and an A Darwin 6 2021 like virus for cell and recombinant based vaccines. 
For the third voting question, the committee will be asked for the influenza B component of the 2023-2024 trivalent and quadrivalent influenza virus vaccines in the U.S. Does the committee recommend inclusion of a B Austria 1359417-2021 like virus from the B Victoria lineage? And the final voting question will be for quadrivalent 2023-2024 influenza vaccines in the U.S. Does the committee recommend inclusion of a B Phuket 3073-2013 like virus from the B Yamagata lineage as the second influenza B strain in the vaccine? So those will be the questions that we'll face later in the day. Uh, that's all for the introduction. I'm happy to take any questions if uh, anyone has any. Back to you, Dr. El Sally. Thank you, Dr. Weir. Uh, I invite the committee members to use the uh, raise your hand function uh, in the Zoom at the ribbon below. And the first question comes from Dr. Bernstein. Thanks, Dr. Weir, for that overview. I just had a question. It, uh, it, it seems that the Yamagata lineage has not uh, had a prominent role. Has there ever been a quadrivalent influenza vaccine, is it even possible where there would might be three A strains and one B strain rather than two A's and two B's? No. Um, the reason is because quadrivalent vaccines, as they're licensed, are for a H1N1, an H3N2, a B Victoria, and a B Yamagata strain. That's the way the licenses are set up. Uh, when the quadrivalents were licensed, we had to have data showing that the inclusion of that fourth strain did not adversely affect the, uh, the vaccine uh, performance or the quality of the vaccine. Similarly, if there were a change to do something else, like uh, occasionally it gets uh, 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 thrown around, could it be two uh, H1N1 uh, components or it could be two H3s, uh, there would have to be, first of all, a recommendation for that. But second of all, each manufacturer would have to amend their license to make sure that that was permissible. In other words, they would have to have data to support that. So we can't just make such a recommendation. Uh, it, would, it would involve a license change for each of the manufacturers. Does that help? Yes, thanks for the explanation. Uh, one question pertaining to the H1N1. Uh, you indicated that it changed, but but it is still Victoria, right? Like that's what we used last year or this year. Yeah, it's but they're a... they're actually different strains. Um, okay, they just didn't change yeah. the the name of it. The number changed. Yeah, yeah. There are lots of A Victorias last year. Okay. Plus a was a 2570-2019. This one's a 4897-2022. So yeah, okay. it all depends on the on, on where the strain is isolated. It's where the designation comes from. Okay, so that clarifies it. The H1N1 is different, y'all. Okay. Yes. Uh, any the other both, question? Both the, both, the egg, both the egg based and the um, cell based recommendations from WHO are different from last year. That's true. Additional questions to Dr. Weir. I see no raised hands. Thank you, Dr. Weir. Thank you. Uh, next on our agenda is US surveillance, uh, which will be presented by Dr. Lisa Groskopf. Dr. Lisa Groskopf is medical officer, epidemiology and prevention branch influenza division at the CDC. Dr. Groskopf. Hi, can, uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much. Um, good morning. Thanks for the invitation to be here today. Um, this will be a brief summary of 2022-23 U.S. influenza activity and also, as is uh, traditional at this meeting, um, a bit of um, the preliminary 2022-23 VE estimates from the CDC networks. Next slide. So we'll start with the U.S. Uh, activity for the season. The reports of data from CDC influenza surveillance networks are available online through FluView, which is updated weekly. Um, most of the slides here are from the most recent report, which is for the week ending February 25th, 2023. Starting with virologic surveillance, results of influenza positive tests are reported weekly to CDC from a large network of clinical and public health laboratories in the U.S., the data on the left are from clinical laboratories and show the percent of influenza specimens or tests that were positive 
by Surveillance Week um, for several recent flu seasons with the current 22-23 season represented by um, the red line with the dots superimposed. For 2022-23, the percent of tests positive peaked in late November, early December at about 26%, which is comparable with many of the previous seasons shown, but higher than 2021 in bright red, um, for which you can see the activity sort of hugging the x-axis, um, and we had historically low activity that season, also higher than 2021-22, which is in light blue. Note also that the peak of the current season's activity curve is shifted to the left earlier in the seasons compared with what is typical from the other seasons shown. As of the most recent Luvi report, the percent of specimens positive has declined from that peak and is about 1%. On the right, the other component of the system, the public health laboratories, tells us about the influenza viral types and subtypes that are in circulation. From October 2022 through the end of this past January 23, 99.5% of specimens were influenza A viruses. Overall, 76% were H3N2, which are in red. Um, there are There is, however, appreciable co-circulation at 24% of H1N1 PDM09, which is an orange. Uh, yellow represents the flu A viruses that are not subtyped. So note there's very minimal green, which represents the influenza B viruses in this graph, just a narrow sliver at the 12 o'clock position. As of the end of January, um, only 0.5% were flu B, all of which were Victoria lineage. Um, taking it a month further out in time, um, as of the most recent flu B report, which is the week ending February 25th, the overall cumulative breakdown of the A versus B is similar with 99.3% A and 0.7% B viruses. Next slide, please. So next, influenza-like illness or ILI surveillance. These data are from ILINet, which is a large network of providers reporting weekly the percent of outpatient visits that were for ILI. So importantly, these illnesses are not all influenza specifically. They're not lab confirmed. There are other respiratory viruses causing similar symptoms in this mix. However, tracking ILI activities provides some sense of potential flu activity from season to season. Looking at the current season, which is the line with the triangles, ILI activity peaked in late November, early December and declined subsequently. Like the chart in the last slides showing the percent of specimens that were positive for flu, the ILI peak for this season is shifted to the left earlier in the season compared with recent seasons. For the last several weeks, ILI activity is hovering just above the national baseline of 2.5%. Next slide, please. So next, long-term care facility surveillance. Long-term care facilities, or LTCFs, from all 50 states and U.S. territories report data on influenza virus infections among residents through the National Healthcare Safety Network, or NHSN, long-term care facility component. During week eight, which was the week ending the 25th of February, 67 or 0.5% of a little over 14,000 reporting facilities reported at least one influenza positive test among their recipients. This decreased by a little over 5% compared with the previous week seven. Next slide. Influenza-associated hospitalizations, these data are from FluServeNet. Um, this is data that is associated with lab-confirmed flu-associated hospitalizations, um, and it shows cumulative hospitalizations per 100,000 by week. Cumulative hospitalizations for this season, which is um, the curve with the superimposed dots, which is, again, shifted to the left, um, they leveled off at about 59 to 60 per 100,000 population in recent weeks. Note here that two, again, curve is shift to the left earlier than other seasons. Also, uh, the cumulative hospitalization rate is higher than that observed in 2020-21 and 2021-22. Next slide, please. The last two surveillance slides are on mortality surveillance. So this, the first one, is from the National Center for Health Statistics. These data come from death certificates and do not represent lab-confirmed illnesses. As of March 2nd, 2023, 9.2% of the deaths that occurred during the week ending February 25th, 2023, or week eight, were due to pneumonia, influenza, and or COVID-19, which we abbreviate as PIC. This percentage was relatively stable compared to the previous week seven and is above the epidemic threshold of 7.3% for this week. Among the 2,202 PIC deaths reported for this week, 916 had COVID-19 listed as an underlying or contributing cause of death on the death certificate, and 34 listed influenza. While the current PIC mortality is due primarily to COVID-19, the proportion due to influenza increased from October through mid-December 
decreased for seven weeks and has been stable for the past four weeks. Next slide. Finally, pediatric deaths. These data reflect deaths associated with laboratory confirmed influenza among children, which has been reportable in the United States since 2004. Thus far, as of the week ending February 25th, 117 pediatric deaths have been reported this season. This is unfortunately more than the 2020-21 season for which one was reported, as well as 2021-22 for which 45 were reported. Next slide. So as an overview summary, as of the week ending February 25th, 2023, influenza activity rose early in the US, peaking nationally during late November, early December, with the percent of tests positive peaking at about 26%, currently it's about 1%. Influenza A, H3, N2 viruses have predominated with co-circulation of influenza A, H1, N1, PDM09 viruses, the cumulative influenza-associated hospitalization rate has leveled in recent weeks to about 59 to 60 per 100,000. 117 influenza-associated pediatric deaths have been reported thus far this season. Overall influenza activity is increased compared with the previous two seasons. And influenza U.S. activity is currently low. Next slide, please. Before moving on to preliminary V estimates for this season, I just want to acknowledge my surveillance colleagues who collect, analyze, and report this data every week and who assisted in preparing these slides. Thank you. Next slide. So shifting gears to interim influenza vaccine effectiveness estimates um, for the 2022-23 season, um, these are preliminary data, and uh, as is the case, normally interim estimates can change over the course of time as more data are available. The data that I'm going to discuss um, are from three CDC networks, NVSN, IV, and Vision. These data were presented recently at the February 22nd ACIP meeting by Samantha Olson, Nathaniel Lewis, and Mark 1040, um, who lead this work with their teams. And I want to thank them a great deal for their um, and their collaborators' work and also for the slides which follow. Next slide. So again, these are preliminary results, uh, interim estimates. Um, they come from three networks, which evaluate vaccine effectiveness against laboratory-confirmed influenza-associated outpatient visits, emergency department visits, and or hospitalizations in different age groups, which we'll go over as we discuss each network. Next slide, please. Now, these are three separate networks, and there are some differences um, slight in the methodologies and also the age groups and the specific outcomes that each network evaluates, but there are some commonalities to the three, which we'll go over here. In each, enrollees have acute respiratory illness and are tested for influenza. Data, data here presented reflect um, dates from enrollment from fall 2022 to early 2023. The design in each is a test negative design, which involves comparing the vaccination odds among case patients who test positive. They have influenza A confirmed by molecular assay versus control patients testing negative for influenza and SARS-CoV-2. The estimates presented are all for influenza A here, as we saw in the earlier slide in the surveillance section, there really has not been sufficient circulation of influenza B. Vaccination status is defined as receipt of any 2022-23 seasonal flu vaccine according to medical records, immunization registries, claims data, and or self-report. Vaccine effectiveness, or VE, is calculated in each of these as 1 minus the adjusted odds ratio times 100%. Next slide. So the first one we'll cover is the preliminary VE estimates against influenza-associated hospitalizations and emergency department visits among children aged six months through 17 years from the new vaccine surveillance network, or NVSN. So again, these are hospitalizations and emergency department visits, and this is a pediatric population. Next slide. In this network, estimated VE against laboratory-confirmed influenza A in hospital and emergency department settings among children ages six months through 17 years overall was 49%. The point estimate was slightly higher at 68% for inpatient stays than 42% for the emergency department visits. 
And it was slightly lower at 45% for the H3N2 viruses compared with 50, 56% for the H1N1 viruses, although you can see there's overlap in the confidence intervals. All of these estimates are statistically significant. Next slide. So to briefly summarize for the preliminary VE estimates from NBSN, through January 25th, 2023, influenza vaccination significantly reduced laboratory confirmed medically attended influenza with a VE of 68% against pediatric hospitalizations and 42% against pediatric emergency department visits. Important protection was noted against both H3N2 and H1N1 associated illnesses. Next slide. For our second network, preliminary VE estimates against influenza-associated hospitalization among patients age 18 years and older. So in this case, we have adults and our outcome is flu-associated hospitalization. This is from the Investigating Respiratory Viruses in the Acutely Ill or IV network. Next slide. In this network, Estimated VE against laboratory-confirmed influenza A in inpatient settings among persons 18 years and older overall was 43%. The point estimate was a bit higher at 51% for the younger group here, the 18 through 64-year-olds, than 35% for those 65 years and older, although there's still appreciable VE for the latter older age group. Among those with an immunocompromising condition, VE was similar to the overall population at 44%. All of these estimates are statistically significant. Next slide. To summarize preliminary VE estimates from IV, through January 31st, 2023, influenza vaccination significantly reduced laboratory confirmed medically attended influenza with an estimated VE of 43% against adult hospitalizations. Important protection was noted among adults aged 18 through 64 years and 65 years and older, and among immunocompromised adults. Next slide. The last set of results are preliminary VE estimates against influenza-associated hospitalizations and emergency department or urgent care visits among persons aged 18 years and older from the Vision Network. So again, we have adults and our outcomes are hospitalizations and emergency department or urgent care. Next slide. There are two graphs for this network. Um, we'll go with this first one, which is the emergency department and urgent care visits. We'll do this first. Overall with Envision, estimated VE against lab-confirmed influenza A in these settings among adults aged 18 years and older was 44%. Point estimate was slightly higher at 46% for those 18 through 64 years than 39% for those 65 years and older. These estimates were statistically significant. Among the subset with an immunocompromising condition, estimated VE was 30%. You can see um, if you look at the columns with the numeric data in it, our numbers are smaller here, and the estimated VE is less precise with a lower bound of the confidence interval at minus 2%. Next slide. Within the same network, estimated VE against lab-confirmed influenza A in inpatient settings was 39% among all persons 18 years and older, and was slightly lower at 20% among the 18 through 64 years old group relative to 42% among those 65 years and older. Among the immunocompromised subset, the estimated VE was 31%. All of these results are statistically significant. So to summarize the um, next slide, please, sorry. To summarize the uh, preliminary VE estimates from vision, through January 2023, influenza vaccination significantly reduced lab-confirmed medically attended influenza with a vaccine effectiveness estimate of 39% against adult hospitalizations and 44% against adult emergency department or urgent care visits. Notable VE was observed across age groups and among immunocompromised persons. Estimates were higher this year than VE estimates against hospitalization and emergency department or urgent care visits from last season, 2021-22, which were each about 25% at the same vision sites. 
um, limitations here and, and also with the previous data um, discussed for IV, we do not at this point have data by influenza A subtype. Next slide. So to summarize data overall from the three flu VE networks uh, that were discussed here, Across three CDC flu VE platforms, we observed consistent influenza vaccine effectiveness for the 2022-23 season. Influenza vaccination provided substantial protection against inpatient, emergency department, and outpatient illness among all ages, and provided substantial protection among important high-risk groups, that is, those ages 65 years and older, and immunocompromised persons. Next slide. So in closing, I would just like to very deeply thank the colleagues and their collaborators who actually do this work um, from NBSN. And next slide. And from the IV network, next slide. And from Vision. Thanks very much. That uh, ends my presentation. Be happy to take any questions or afterward after the next presentation as, as the committee wishes. Thank you. Hmm. Thank you, Dr. Groskopf. I would like uh, to invite my committee members to start uh, using the raise your hand function to ask questions for the CDC. And Dr. Portnoy, first question from Dr. Portnoy. All right, thank you. And th thank you for that uh, detailed presentation. It's very informative. Um, one thing that constantly bothers me, we just got through reviewing RSV vaccines where the effectiveness was 80%. Um, I've seen COVID vaccines where it's 90%. And yet influenza vaccines are consistently in the 30, 40, 50% range. Why, why are these vaccines so much less effective? Is it that the strains aren't being matched properly? Are the vaccines not inducing an adequate immune response? Or do you have any idea of why, why these vaccines are just so much less effective than what we're used to seeing with other agents? I, I think that possibly a, a better answer might be possibly provided by, by Dr. Wentworth. But, but one thing to note about it is that um, in general um, with flu, particularly with flu A, um, in seasons when we have a, a good match, um, we tend to see VE in the 40 to 60 percent range. And you know, it is true that that is not you know in line with a lot of the VE that we see for other pathogens, you know, tetanus, HPV, um, many other things. However, we do have also a pathogen that's constantly changing. So even when on the whole things seem like a good match, um, we don't have control over what the virus is doing on a continual basis. The strains are selected. Uh, importantly, they have to be far early in advance so that the vaccine can be prepared on time. Um, another important thing to note is that we we do at CDC annually estimate the estimated burden averted by vaccination. And even in a season, one recent example is a 2017-18 season, which was fairly severe um, and for which overall vaccine, vaccine effectiveness was about 39%. Um, does prevent substantial morbidity and mortality in terms of illnesses, hospitalizations, medical visits, and deaths. Um, I, I'm, I'm less able to answer the question of why it is the way it is other than the fact that we do have you know, strain changes or, or strain evolution constantly over the course of the year. Well, just imagine how many hospitalizations and deaths it could avoid if it was 80 to 90% effective. Just imagine. Thank Would you. be amazing. The second question comes from Dr. Gantz. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I had a question about sort of the nuance of the more severe outcomes. Um, you didn't talk about um, hospitalizations to the ICU, for instance, or mortality um, in terms of vaccine effectiveness. I wondered if we had that more um, nuanced data in, in terms of some of the outcomes, particularly in pediatrics. Um, no, at least at least not currently. The, the the network data that we have now are are what are available. I will check on whether the the networks that follow hospitalizations are able to um, sort out hospitalizations by you know relative severity. I guess the main index is as you would as you suggested. For example, ICU versus not. So I I will check on that and I can probably get an answer back to the committee today if that if that's all right. Um, but um, currently what we have is what we have. Um, it is possible that some more data might be available, for example, about H3N1 versus, or sorry, H3N2 versus H1N1 later in the season, though difficult to know. Um, 
but these data are refined over the course of the, the year um, leading into the fall. So things might look a little bit different by then. Hmm. Okay, thank you. I have a methodological question and it pertains to the first, well, the introductory slides. You indicated that the flu VE was calculated by excluding individuals who also had positive SARS-CoV-2. And, yes. And then my my question pertains to the um, prevalent SARS-CoV-2 upon hospital admission and, and, and visits for all sorts of reasons. During uh, the, the November, December timeframe and up until now, we are seeing a lot of prevalent SARS-CoV-2. And uh, so these are people being admitted to, to the hospitals for any reasons, yet they're SARS-CoV-2 positive. I wonder if, you know, as a sensitivity analysis or how would this data change if uh, we analyze by, by, by factoring an estimate for the prevalent SARS-CoV-2? And did it, did it exclude a lot of patients that way? That is something I'll, I'll have to check with the investigators on their network, uh, that network about. The, the reason for excluding um, those patients is that it was, it was when this was assessed last year, um, the assessment was that including those who were positive for SARS-CoV-2 introduced some bias into the VE calculation. Yeah. So the cleanest way with which to deal with that was to, and, and it did make a substantial difference last season for 2021-22. For but I and they have they do the group does typically do sensitivity analyses of within without, but I would need to just to be certain of what they did this year, I would need to ask them. So I will do that. Okay. Thank you. By by prevalence, you you yeah, by prevalence. Um, okay. <clears throat> let me let me check on that. Sorry, Dr. O'Sullivan. Thank you. Dr. Perman. Yes, I had a similar question. Uh, to the to Dr. Elsali's question, so I was going to add RSV into the mix too to see how much, how double uh, dual infections was that was considered, and also the second uh, part again with acquisition. So you showed data on adults with a SARS-CoV-2 infection versus flu. Do you have similar data for pediatrics, and also uh, throwing in RSV? Um, not that um, RSV was not considered for this season. Uh, yet um, that I can that I know um, I don't know what is planned as far as the additional analyses for um, considering relative pre prevalence of RSV, but I can also check on that as well. And then also SARS-CoV-2 in pediatrics. Do you have uh, that information compared to flu? Um, I, I don't have the information on the prevalence. No, I'm sorry. Okay, yeah, thank you. Thank you. Dr. Chatterjee? Thanks, um, Hannah. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Grosskopf, for, Grosskopf, for your presentation. I have two questions, and uh, they're getting into the weeds a little bit, and the data sets that you presented uh, from may not be able to answer the questions, but I was just curious if there are maybe other sources of data for these questions. The first is um, whether we have... Um, vaccine efficacy uh, laid out by the type of vaccine that was used. So high dose adjuvanted versus uh, regular uh, dose vaccines. And the second question is uh, around egg-based versus cell-based vaccines, whether there's any difference noted in the VE based on those. At present, we don't. Um, confirmation of vaccines received is something that occurs through the spring into the summer. Um, there are times when there is enough information at the very end of the season when the final estimates are being prepared for publication where there are enough data. Um, but as of right now, no. Um, one limitation of this is that in general, the networks that um, the sites that participated in these networks aren't um, dictated which vaccine to use. Um, so we tend to not sometimes have a very as high uptake of some vaccines uh, compared with others. Um, there is actually one extra slide I have that shows um, if it is possible to bring up the slide deck. Um, and if, you, if you'd like to see that, that, that shows what the relative utility of the 
um, use, at least in one of the networks was. But, but essentially what, what I can say is we don't have information yet, for example, on high dose versus adjuvanted. Um, we have not had in general appreciable uptake of LAIV in recent seasons to be able to do LAIV independent mm -hmm. estimates. Um, there's been overall less use, for example, of recombinant than of the other uh, vaccines so far. Um, so at, at this point, um, we definitely don't have that data. It's possible that some might come later when we have a better sense of vaccine use, but um, at, it, it's hard to predict how that will go at this juncture. Thank you. Certainly. Thank you. Uh, I do not see any raised hands. Uh, any final questions to Dr. Groskopf? Okay, hearing none. Thank you, Dr. Groskopf. Uh, as always, uh, very uh, uh, highly anticipated data with every season. <clears throat> uh, next on the agenda uh, will be the global influenza virus surveillance and characterization. Uh, Dr. David Wentworth, uh, director of the WHO Collabor Collaborating uh, Center for Surveillance, Epidemiology, and Control of Influenza, Branch Chief, Virology, Surveillance, and Diagnostic uh, Branch, Influenza Division Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. Dr. David Wentworth. Thank you very much, Dr. Aselli. And I'm going to try to share my screen. If you can give me the thumbs up that it's uh, functional, that would be great. And then I'm going to probably turn off my video so that I save some bandwidth. Yeah, we can see your screen well. Wonderful. Okay. So, um, yeah, we're going to move right along. And so the outline for today is to cover the WHO vaccine consultation meeting, which occurred for the Northern Hemisphere 23-24 season, as Dr. Weir did a nice job introducing I'm going to spend the more the most considerable amount of time on the H1N1 viruses, and that's because they are a strain change for us. And I'll describe in detail the, only the key information to the recommendation to update the antigen for the Northern Hemisphere 2023-2024 season. I will also talk about AH3N2 viruses as well as influenza B viruses. I'm going to try to limit this discussion in part because the vaccine antigens remain unchanged. I'll spend a little more time on H3N2 just to uh, illustrate why it was not changed. Um, so the meeting occurred, as Dr. Weir pointed out, just a few weeks ago. It was held uh, from the 20th to the 23rd of February. It's still a hybrid meeting. We had a couple of participants, uh, these two that were participating uh, virtually uh, from Vector Labs for the zoonotic point uh, and from uh, Scenic in China, Diane Wong there. Uh, and then it was chaired by Kanta Subarao, who's pictured here next to me. Um, and we had nine advisors that are the directors of the WHO CCs, as well as the essential regulatory laboratories, like your FDA is one of those. Um, and the disclosures of interest are always done at the start of the meeting. There's 39 observers from national influenza centers and other locations, and many experts from WHO regional offices and headquarters. And then we had an information meeting held on the 24th, where we presented the data to vaccine manufacturers. So as, as uh, Dr. Weir pointed out, I'll just be quick on this slide where the H1N1 component changed I have here. And the confusing thing, as Dr. Al Sally already pointed out, is um, it's kind of funny, but uh, it's uh, serendipitous, I guess. The, the Victoria 4897 is the new antigen, and it was Victoria 2405 from 2019. And actually, the cell-based was an A Wisconsin 588. Uh, 2019, and it's been updated to Wisconsin 67 from 2022. So um, I hope to not confuse you on those points as I run through these slides. And I'm going to very briefly cover activity so that we can spend a bit more time um, uh, on the actual virological information. This slide is showing the number of positives, uh, positive specimens for influenza by subtype and lineage. And so you can see it was actually kind of an early peak uh, in April uh, here for the Southern Hemisphere. 
uh, and then an early peak uh, globally in from November and already dissipating down. And I'll show you this on another graph as well. And this is also showing you the subtypes that circulated. And actually, if you remember back to Dr. Groskopf's slides, the globally, we had kind of a similar phenomenon with the combination of H1 and H3 co-circulating around the same time rather than at different points in time during the season, which we sometimes see. So to give you an idea globally, what we saw, this is about the same numbers as for the US, um, for the viruses that were characterized. Of those that were subtyped, almost 70% were H3N2, so 69%, and 31% were H1N1. This is showing you the global distribution by country. And it's a world map illustrating where the influenza viruses by subtype and B lineage were uh, seen between September 2022 and January 2023. And so what you can really appreciate here is that influenza A, which is the blue colors in the pie charts, um, predominated in most regions. And the exceptions were really like West Africa, um, South Africa, uh, in some countries in Central Africa and Central Asia, as well as Southeast Asia, um, and the Russian Federation, uh, which had quite a bit of H1, uh, which you can see there. All right, so we're going to get into the H1N1 viruses. And this slide now shows the number of H1N1 viruses detected by the Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System. I've, uh, the acronym is GISRIS here. Um, and really, you can focus on the last couple of seasons, the yellow and the uh, red being the 22-23 time points. And you can see that we had this major increase in H1N1 really uh, in the northern hemisphere part of the season. And it, it peaked uh, before the end of 2022 and started to fall. And you can see it coming in here into week four, where the last data was available at the time of the meeting, but continuing to fall. And this is now a similar map, which I've showed before, but it's now showing you the percent positive specimens tested, and the key is here. The light yellow is 0.1 to 5%, and then as you get into the dark red, you get to greater than 30%. And what you can see is that it's based on these percent positives between September 2022 and January 2023. And we saw a higher percent positivity in some countries in Eastern Europe, East Africa, Southeast Asia, and a few countries in Central Asia and North Africa, as well as South America, uh, here and here, for example. Okay. So now we're going to get into the phylogeography. So this is a very high-level view of the HA phylogenetics combined with the geographic origin or where the virus was isolated or identify where the specimen was taken is a better way to say that. And it's going from this heat map over here is showing you the years 2020 to 2023. And the phylogeny is a very dense phylogeny going down from that time point. And what we can see is I'll just try to uh, cover these bullets here, and those are partly there for visually impaired people so that their reader will show, will read those to them. Um, and so you can see in 2020, prior to the emergence of the SARS pandemic, we had quite a bit of circulation of this, this group called 6B.5, and it was split into 5B, and, and then uh, 5A was just starting to emerge. And then we had the COVID bottleneck where we're very few H1N1 viruses were isolated. But coming through that bottleneck, 5A1s continued to survive. These were in Africa for the most part in the beginning, and then they moved into Europe and uh, Oceania, for example, and a few in South America, which is the light blue. Um, and then there's this split here at the phylogenetic tree, and I'll go into some more detail about this. And this is where their 5A2 viruses come into play, and they've continued to evolve and split into a number of subgroups that I'll show you on a more detailed slide. So some of the key viruses here are Hawaii 70, which was the previous cell-based vaccine uh, uh, in the 2020 era, and Wisconsin 588, which um, we got this year in our vaccine, um, and Sydney 5, which is the vaccine recommended for the Southern Hemisphere 2023. Uh, season, 
And then Victoria 4897 and Wisconsin 67 down at the bottom, which are these most recent recommendations. And so as promised, this is a more detailed tree. I'll try to keep the alphabet soup to a minimum. I just wanna point out a few key features of the 5A1 and the 5A2 that were probably hard to appreciate on that high level overview. The 5A1 virus is now, we're kind of at the bottom of this phylogeny here. You can see where Hawaii 70 is. This small little bar represents the 5A1 viruses. And you can still see that there are some 5A1 viruses circulating. So this is showing you from September through January. Um, you can still see a few of those circulating, primarily in Africa and a few in Europe were detected. Um, but they're still decreasing in proportion as we looked at them over time. And there was a couple in, uh, so Africa, South America, Oceania, and then 5A2, that's what you can see. I've highlighted the blue, this is this blue background. All of these are the 5A2 major clade and they've broken up now. We've uh, broken them into subclades to make it a little bit easier to track. And so what we have are the 5A2A viruses, which break at this uh, juncture here. And they're shown in this kind of salmon colored bar, uh, which is both at the bottom and the top of this phylogeny. And in the middle of the phylogeny are the, uh, the 2A1, the 5A2A1 group, okay? And so these 5A2A viruses, they typically have these amino acid changes. Representatives of those are this India Pune and IV 32 35, 46 from 2021 and A Sydney 5, 2021. And then where you get another breakpoint is here around this amino acid changes. It's combining two different uh, branches of the phylogeny uh, in total, but the key point mutations are at 142R and 137S. And, and so you can see that these 5A1 viruses, they typically have these 137S, 142R, and these other changes. And Victoria 4897 and Wisconsin 67 fall into that clade. And so these are, I've, I've highlighted them as the recommendation for the egg, the Victoria, and the recommendation for the cell is this Wisconsin 67. Okay. And um, I guess I should point out a couple of more features of this tree before we move on. So I, I showed you the phylogeny, but where they circulated, you can see over time, um, a lot of these 5A2 viruses you can see are just global. Um, and it's a mixture of viruses that are 5A2A and 5A2A1, with the predominant of 5A2A1 really being seen in Europe, which is the green, North America and the blue, and uh, this aqua color is South America. And so they were in Central Europe uh, as well. Okay, and then uh, I'll show you this data later in, in cartography, but the first, the final bit here is this also includes some antigenic information. So uh, the tick marks illustrate viruses that were tested. These are, this is data from the CDC. So tested at the CDC with ferret antisera against the um, Wisconsin 588 cell. And if it's less than or equal to fourfold, it's ticked on this in a yellow color. And then if it's greater than that, if it's hitting eightfold or more, it's in blue. And so you can see this kind of binary distribution where everything we tested in the 5A2 groups, whether it was a 2A or a 2A1, react well with that 588 ferret antisera, and those in the 5A1 react poorly with that. Um, and now I'm going to show you, so that phylogeny might be a little confusing. I'll show you what's happened to the hemagglutinin molecule as a monomer. And so on the left-hand side, we're just going to base our comparisons on the Wisconsin 588 cell. And I'm going to orient you to a couple major antigenic epitopes. So this is showing you the monomer of an X-ray crystal structure of the hemagglutinin molecule. Antigenic site SB is up here on kind of the left-hand side of this face in the blue. Antigenic site SA is also at the top, and it's in this peach color. And one interesting thing is ferrets have an immunodominance feature for antigenic site SA, which we're really recognizing more and more. Um, the receptor binding site is circled here. That's the RBS, and it's right at this kind of uh, kind of uh, 
divot in the, so it's going down into the HA molecule in between uh, sites SB and SA can be involved, and then antigenic site CA, which is in green, and antigenic site CB in yellow. So now if we look at the Wisconsin 47, which is a, a good representative of very emerging uh, virus, probably the most divergent 2A1, 5A, 2A1 virus. I'll call it 2A1 in the shorthand sometimes. Um, you can see a number of substitutions up towards the head of the hemagglutinin, Q189E, A186T, all in site SB there, um, E224A, which is close to the receptor binding site in, in site SB as well, K142R, which you can see right here, this is in site CA, and P137S, which is also in site CA. And then they have a Q, uh, K54Q up here. And this we call this head part here, HA1, the top domain. And the, the bottom part is HA2, which is a stock domain. And we rotate it. And another substitution that's popping up in a, in a number of viruses is this T216A, but it's not in all of them. And it's not in the, that's the one difference between Wisconsin 47 and Wisconsin 67, is that it, the 67 lacks that T216A. So this summarizes now the ferret antigenic data. And I showed you just CDC's data with the tick mark, so you could see that. And what we saw was when we compare it to the, the Wisconsin 588 cell antigen, so antisera made against that vaccine antigen, 94% um, of the viruses were considered within two to fourfold, which is very good. And then we start seeing some reductions, um, greater than eightfold or greater uh, at 6%. Um, and you can see the Francis Crick Institute had a little bit higher for that, but they also were in Europe and had, uh, and they also get a number of specimens from Africa and other countries around the world. So they had a lot more 5A1s and that partly why they had a higher percentage uh, with eightfold. Uh, overall, it was 90% considered two to fourfold and 10% um, eightfold or more. And the egg-based Victoria 2570 did very well as well with 94% and 6%. So now diving into just one small table that helps to make up that hemagglutination inhibition data. Here I'm showing you kind of the binary pattern of the HA clade 5A1 viruses, which are in these first two columns, and 5A2 viruses, which are represented by this like column three and four. So this is Victoria 2570 egg virus, so the, the Northern Hemisphere vaccine candidates in a cell-like virus. So this is kind of the equivalent of Wisconsin 588. And you can see very good reactivity against all these 5A2A viruses and the 2A1 viruses, whereas the 5A1 antisera um, to Brisbane and Guangdong Maonan, uh, which is like, uh, you can see very poor reactivity of all these viruses, even though they react well with all the 5A1 viruses. Now, if we move to the recommended uh, Prototypes, here you have the Victoria 4897 egg on the last column. You can see that that antigen is stimulating excellent immunity and reacting very well. So the 5A2A1 HA clade virus antisera inhibited all the recently circulating viruses very well. And we only saw, but we only saw modest reductions with ferret antisera to the, uh, the, the new 2A1 viruses. Now, when we look by cartography, that same feature is borne out. And you can see um, I've explained cartography to our group many times. I think you guys are really probably very up on it, but I just want to, I'll do a little level setting. Each square is worth a two-fold reduction or difference in antigenicity. And what you can see here is the cluster of 5A2, clade 5A2 viruses. So these are viruses with HA clade 5A2, all forming a cluster here. And these are the more, more recent viruses since February 2022. The older viruses are shown in gray that have been tested. So you can see, appreciate what that's like. And then the older 5A1 viruses are down here. And so you can see these are forming two distinct groups of viruses that are really easy to see. And um, viruses in each clade cluster with the respective vaccine antigen. So here's the previous vaccine antigen, Guangdong Meonan or Hawaii 70 like antigen. And then even the more recent virus is still clustering pretty close to that. 
Um, and then we have the Wisconsin 588 cell antigen shown here in the red and the Victoria 2470 in the egg-shaped red. Uh, and then the new antigen, the Wisconsin 67, the new recommended antigen you're considering shown in the purple. And so while it looks quite subtle in the ferret data, there is a little bit of, of differentiation here that you can pick out by through the cartography that's a little bit easier to see than on the HI tables. Um, but they're all really within fourfold of each other. And that's really illustrated by this serum circle. So now what we're looking at is cartography that's illustrating serum reactivity of the, the um, Wisconsin 47 uh, 2022 serum. And so this is a Wisconsin 67-like virus or antisera. I showed you that HA molecule. And it's showing that if uh, with serum like this, you really cover that whole group very well. Um, and that circle is within eightfold. I should really point that out. So you really want that to be a little bit tighter here for really good vaccine antigen. Um, and that's what it looks to be. But outside of that circle is where we would have uh, more antigenic drift. Now, one of the most important things is how does human serum react when we vaccinate folks with the Wisconsin 588 cell-based vaccine, a like antigen or the egg-based Victoria 2, uh, 2470. And so this is showing you now in a lot of pediatric, a lot of panels starting with pediatric and going to elderly. So six to 35 months at the top row, down to uh, greater than 65 on the bottom row. And we have a number of uh, vaccine platforms being used here. So this is IIV4, so an egg-based inactivated vaccine. And then the pediatric three to eight-year-olds, there's flu cell vax and an egg-based vaccine. And in pediatric nine to 17, there's flu cell vax and egg-based in an adult. So that is 18 to 49 age group. There's uh, flu cell vax, uh, recombinant flu block and inactivated uh, egg-based vaccine. And so um, then we got in the older adult, the IV4 again, and the elderly high dose IV4. And so now I'm gonna walk you across the top uh, of the column headers here. And so we have representatives from the 5A2. So this is very similar to the antigen that was included in the vaccine. And that's set to 100 for the comparison of all these other vaccine uh, antigens or serology antigens, I should say. So the 2A group represented by that India Pune or the Sydney 5, you can start to see just as you get a couple of additional mutations beyond the, the base 2A, which is the India, you start to see more reductions. And this light orange color that you can see here on this key is where um, the 90% confidence interval around the geometric mean tighter point estimate starts to touch the 50% line. So the point estimates above the 50% line but the confidence interval has at least touched it or crossed it. And now when we get to the 5A2A1s, you start to see the deeper reds where the point estimates start to move below the 50% confidence interval. And so hopefully through this heat map, you can see basically all the, all the age panels are showing more reductions as we get into the further evolved 5A2A1 viruses, such as the Ghana 2711 and the Wisconsin 47 which has that additional T216A substitution that Ghana and Wisconsin 67 lack. So um, basically with the exception of the youngest pediatric group, we saw reduced geometric mean titers in the 2A and the 2A1s to summarize here a little bit. And the other point I would like to point out, and this is kind of a nice thing to understand, the 5A viruses and 5A1 viruses preceded uh, the 5A2 viruses in circulation in our population. And they also preceded um, the vaccine recommendation. So the previous vaccine recommendation was Hawaii 70-like or Guangdong Mayo non-egg-like. And that, that virus was used in the vaccine previously and it circulated previously. And so what you can see in these younger age groups, we're seeing uh, not great coverage, very kind of similar to the ferrets by um, being immunized with that vaccine. However, in the older, um, from nine to adults, basically, you're seeing now blue colors back there, which means 
good geometric mean titers that are very similar to the geometric mean titer that's set at 100. And so this is likely a boost of memory response and sometimes called a back boost. Now, so that was just CDC data, and this is data from all the WHO CCs and ERLs that conduct um, post-vaccination human serology. And I'm not going to walk you through it, but basically we had um, even additional serum from the UK, Japan, and China. Uh, included in these panels. And you can see that the data really is illustrating that for the most part, all the centers agree and that we saw reductions in these 5A2As and particularly the 5A2A1s. And so what that's demonstrating is that, the, that these 5A2HA genes are accumulating changes in epitopes such as site SB, which I pointed out on the, on the molecule, that better escape antibodies induced by the current vaccine. And examples of that are really these 2A, Sydney 5, and to a certain extent, the India Pune-like viruses. And then when they acquire the additional changes in site CA, which is the P137S and the K142R, like these 2A1 viruses over here, like Ghana, and um, the other one I pointed out, Wisconsin 47, and like viruses, um, we see even further reductions and we get to those darker reds or darker oranges going to red. And so that's really further reducing the human antibody recognition um, that's induced by the vaccine we're currently used, using. And so to summarize the H1N1 viruses, um, we have, uh, they've been detected in all geographic regions most uh, viruses circulating in this period expressed HA genes in major clades 5A1 or 5A2. And there's a, a variety of, there's two 5A2 subclades that are new. One's the 5A2A, and it has these amino acid changes. They predominated in Asia and some countries in Europe and Africa. And so you can see here a phylogeny I pulled from Nextrain, which is listed here. This is just, it's, it's proportionally pretty good because they uh, do some things to decrease bias of the sequence data. And so you can see the 5A1 here representing a smaller proportion. And then the 5A2 breakpoint being here, being all these viruses here. And then the 2A1s being up here at the top. And they predominated in, in North America, in the US, for example, and in some countries in South America and Europe. With the ferret anisera, um, they showed a clear dis difference or distinct difference between the 5A1 and 5A2 viruses. And that's illustrated by this kind of phenomenon where 5A2 anisera of Wisconsin 588 recognized all the 5A2 viruses, including the subclades 2A and 2A1, but poorly recognized the 5A1 viruses. Um, also, the, a 2A1 virus like Wisconsin uh, 6722 and Victoria 4897, which I showed you data on that egg antigen, recognized the recently circulating 2A and 2A1 subclades well. Now, with post-vaccination sera collected from people instead of ferrets with the Northern Hemisphere 2022 vaccine, which included Wisconsin 588-like viruses or Victoria 2470-like viruses, the GMTs were reduced significantly in most serum panels against most recent H1N1 pdm 9 viruses expressing the 2A and 2A1 HA genes and showed that the majority of recent viruses, particularly HA clade 2A1, were escaping some of the antibodies induced by vaccination. Um, just for completeness, this isn't really related to vaccine. I have this data in here because it's a good place to talk about neuraminidase inhibitors or endonuclease inhibitors. Um, of the 1,361 viruses tested, four showed resistance in genetic or phenotypic analysis. And with the endonuclease inhibitor, baloxavir marboxol, 1,107 viruses tested, none showed resistance. So now I'm going to turn your attention to H3N2 viruses. Um, the similar format, this is the number of viruses detected by GISRIS. Again, you can harken back to what Dr. Groskopf showed you, particularly for the most recent season. We saw an early season of the H3N2 starting in week 38, kind of unusual. You can see where, where year 2021 started, where we started to have flu back after the SARS uh, bottleneck. Um, but it's a very early season, peaked and started to decline and continues to decline as we move into week four. 
uh, in the red line there. This is showing you where the activity occurred. And again, the darker orange color is showing you more activity. Um, and so you can see based on this global map on the percent positives of all specimens tested between September 2022 and January 2023, that there was significant H3 to H3 N2 activity. Um, which is five to thirty percent positivity, and it was in several regions, including North America, uh, Northwest Africa. You can see over here, and um, Europe, and in some countries in Asia and South America. So quite a bit of H3N2 activity in Europe, and, and quite a bit in Southeast Asia. So this is now. I don't have a very large high-level phylogeny for the sake of time, but. Um, We've really tried to reduce some of the alphabet soup in the H3 and, and uh, ad made additional clades. And so we've renamed these clade one. The full name is here, 3C2A1, B2, A1, and two. So these are the two major clades that continue to circulate and they um, have evolved into some subclades. So clade one is shown down here on the tree. Um, a, a subclade involved that's 1A.1, and it's represented by this A. Henan virus from China. This is where these viruses primarily circulated. Uh, nearly all were detected there. For the clade 2 viruses, that's shown at this breakpoint here. So all these viruses are clade 2 viruses, and they formed a number of subclades 2A through D. In the most recent six months, clades 2C and D have actually decreased. And so really what we're seeing is 2A and 2B viruses. So the 2A branch point here and the 2B viruses here. And the 2B viruses are represented by this A Florida 57 2022. The 2A viruses have further diversified quite a bit um, into 2A1, represented by the A Maryland, 2A1B, the A Michigan 60, a 2A3B, a 2A3 represented by A Alaska, and um, 2A3A and a further mutation, 2A3A1, represented by A Massachusetts. And um, all these clade 2 viruses show really global dissemination. And that's illustrated here a bit. And so clade 1A1, as I, as I already pointed out, that's this um, kind of purple color, really detected primarily or only in China. The clade 2 subclades predominate and show global distribution. We're seeing primarily in this point of time with predominance of 2A1B, 2A3A1, and 2B. And uh, overall, the 2B predominated in this period. So the 2B is this like kind of green color. And so you can see how much of it was in North America, although we did have many of the other subclades co-circulating, how much of it was in South America, in Europe, um, really globally, you can always find uh, 2B. So now um, we've talked about what these key point uh, antigenic sites are on the Darwin 6, and then I'm showing you where changes in the various uh, clades occur compared to the Darwin 6 vaccine strain. And um, again, with a light peach color being antigenic site B, uh, antigenic site A in the green. So H3 and H1 have different nomenclature for their antigenic sites, but the but the A and B are basically in the head again. And then these ones on the side, antigenic site E and D and C. So a couple of things I just want to be briefly point out to you is that while you're seeing lots of diversity genetically, we're seeing some parallel evolution. So for example, this 140K, um, which uh, is occurring here, in site A, or on the border of it, um, is occurring in multiple clades. So some people call that convergent evolution or parallel evolution. And we're also seeing E50K in a number of these. And so though, though that's a clue that the virus is really trying to escape our immunity uh, with some of these changes. And we're, we're also seeing, uh, for example, G53N in the 2A3A1 viruses and G53D in the 2B viruses. So same position, different change. Um, of all of these, you can kind of appreciate that the Massachusetts 18 has the most amino acid changes in the head of the HA, including one at this 96, which is different than the other ones. And that star means that uh, asparagine to a serine would actually create a potential glycosylation signal at position 94, which also happens to be an asparagine. 
So NXS would be asparagine link glycosylation signal. So now the analysis of these viruses by Anasera to the antigens recommended for the Northern Hemisphere 22-23 season, Darwin-6 cell-based, Darwin-9 egg-based vaccines. You can see um, really quite good totals with 97% of them being um, covered by, you know, well neutralized by Anasera to the Darwin-6 vaccine. And, and only 3% being eightfold or greater. Um, a similar phenomenon with the egg, but we do see reductions in the number of two, two to fourfold and increase in the number of eightfold. And that's not uncommon in an H3 egg-based antigen. Looking at the cartography now, you can see uh, the relationship between the Darwin-6 cell and egg antigens in the cartography, as well as all of these clades uh, that are have evolved and are co-circulating. So on the left, we're looking at hint data from the, that's high uh, contrast imaging and neutralization test by RCC in Atlanta, or plaque reduction neutralization test by the CC in London. So both very similar type tests, virus neutralization tests, um, uh, cell-based infection assays, and very similar patterns where we're getting groupings of all the different subclades of 2A viruses forming one group. And um, the original, the clade one type virus, which would be the 1A.1 being down here in these older viruses. And they're not uh, be able, able to be appreciated here because no, no test viruses had that uh, genotype for the correct data. So now we're gonna move to a little bit more data on what the serum looks like. And so here, when you look at the antiserum to the Darwin 6 2021 from two centers, you really get a very similar pattern. The square represents the serum here, and the circle represents everything inside of the circle has eightfold or less uh, reactivity uh, compared to the homologous titer of Darwin 6. And, and each square represents twofold. So you can see that these are pretty much within fourfold of, and that's why 97% of them are considered reactive with the Darwin 6 Anasera. And um, the Crick uses Stockholm 5 as their Darwin 6 like virus, but they put that Anasera here. And again, two different centers getting very similar data using uh, a similar assay. Now, when we compare some potential other antisera, say, for example, a Florida 57, which is one of those 2B viruses, you can see that that serum is placed here in this cartography, but we start to lose some of the viruses, um, their reactivity pattern. So you're covering these 2B virus as well, which are this bright orange color here, but not covering as well some of the uh, 2A1 uh, viruses here. And then if we uh, work with an antisera against this Thailand 8, which represents that 2A, 3A1 group, which may be the most uh, evolved group, um, you can see it really pushes that serum circle to the right. And while you cover those 2A, 3A viruses and 2A, 3A1s well, you lose coverage of some of the other viruses, including some of the 2B viruses. And finally, the human uh, antisera shows really good reactivity. I won't walk you through. It's all the same serum panels I showed for the H1, which was very critical for the H1 uh, information. And so I won't walk you through all that, but you can see we had a large panel of the different clades, the, one, the 2A1A, 2A1B, 2A3, 2A3A1, the Massachusetts 18 or Thailand 8-like viruses, and the Florida 57. These are the two most predominant groups and, and more evolved viruses. And then the 1A1, which is a very different clade virus represented by that high 35. And what you can see really is good reactivity with most of these and actually very good reactivity with the highly evolved. We did see some reductions. And remember this light orange color here is where the 90% the confidence interval is uh, crossing or touching the 50% threshold line uh, in this non-inferiority analysis. Now, to dive into that data, I'm going to show you a little bit more. This is why I'm going to spend a little more time on this. So it's the same antigens here. Um, and what you can see and appreciate just with two of the 
two of the uh, groups here, the nine to 17 and the adult with uh, a couple of different style of vaccines that um, if you look at their pre titer, so against the, the base virus, so the, this is the antigen that should be like what's in the vaccine, whether it's Darwin six or Darwin nine, uh, Darwin six for flu cell, Darwin nine for an egg based, um, what you can appreciate is prior to vaccination, they have a geometric mean titer around 23. So if I'm looking at flu vax in the top row here, um, and it, it after post-vaccination, it goes up to 437. And the percentage indicates how many of those folks now have a titer greater than or equal to 40, which is a correlate of protection. Now, if we start going across to some of these newer emerging lineages, we're seeing that we're getting good boosting, good forward boosting into the uh, Maryland 2, like the 1A viruses with, with a GMT of, of 394, Michigan 60, some reduction, but uh, GMT of 243 and 663 for the Alaska, and actually very good tighter for this Massachusetts 18 and the Florida 57. And really a pretty good back boost against these 1A-like viruses. And that same pattern holds true for like the egg-based vaccine in the same age group. And then when we get into the adults, we're not get, seeing quite as high a titers uh, boosting, but we're still seeing really good change from pre-vaccination to post-vaccination. And you can see that in each of the columns here. So a pre-vaccination titer against this advanced Massachusetts 18 um, of 15 jumps to 243, for example. And with the flu block, you can see higher titers uh, were achieved in that case. So um, what did I want to tell you here? The antibodies and uh, titers increased to all clades, which I just walked you through, in particular, the 2A1A, the 2A1B, and the 2A3A1, which are all increasing. And we did see good but smaller increases in the 2B, which is this Florida 57. So you can see like 320 versus 394, for example, in this group. Um, all right. So I know you like to see some of the individual serology, so I added that. So the uh, in many countries, so to summarize the global circulation and phylogeny, we, we had uh, reporting of influenza A viruses and H3N2 subtype predominated uh, in almost everywhere. Um, there was significant H3 activity observed in North America, Northwest Africa, Europe, and some countries of Asia. Um, the phylogenetics of the HA uh, of the viruses circulating in this period belong to two major clades, the clade one, and that's evolved into the subclade 1A1, which has this I48T and K197N substitutions, and they were detected primarily in viruses circulating in China. And the clade two, which has global dissemination, evolved into um, kind of medium-sized clades, the 2A through 2D, and the 2A have further evolved into multiple subclades. And the 2A1B, the 2A3A, and uh, 2B have predominated in this uh, reporting period. So viruses expressing the clade 2 HA genes included subclades that are antigenically closely related and are antigenically distinct from the 1A1 viruses. And so that was the big gap you saw between the, the one point S of 1A1 virus I had on the cartography from the CDC. Um, Barrett Anasira to Darwin 6 recognized all the clade 2 viruses, whether they're in, in all their subclades, very well. Um, with one, uh, the, the viruses expressing the 2B showing some subtle reductions in reactivity. Um, but they had, had poor reactivity to reduced reactivity, depending on the collaborating center that did the studies with the clade 1A1 viruses. For Florida 57, which is a clade 2B virus, it recognized its group well, but showed reduced recognition of other uh, clade 2 subclades. And similar was true for the Thailand 8 or Massachusetts 18-like viruses, which are these uh, 2A3A1 viruses. They recognized their clade very well, but showed reduced recognition of the other two subclades. For the human serology with serum panels from individuals vaccinated with Darwin 6 or Darwin 9 like viruses, most of the human serum panels reacted well with recent H3N2 viruses that expressed diverse uh, clades and subclade HA genes. We did see that panels from some of the younger age groups showed reduced reactivity with viruses expressing the 2B or the 1A1 HA genes. 
And for the antiviral susceptibility, we're in good shape with the H3N2 viruses. Over 2,600 were analyzed. Uh, and none showed genetic or phenotypic evidence of reduced inhibition to neuraminidase inhibitors. And the same is true for 2,429 viruses uh, when they were analyzed for susceptibility to endonuclease inhibitor baloxavir and marboxyl. So now I'm going to turn our attention to the influenza B viruses. Here we're looking at the B viruses detected in 22 and 23, and you can see it's relatively low circulation of influenza B. We did see an increase around the same time where we started to see uh, H1 and H3, um, and it's kind of continued on, and it hasn't fallen as fast as we've seen for the H3, I would say. But it's just staying at this very low level. So for circulating influenza B virus lineages, we talked about this almost at the outset with some questions. Um, of the viruses where lineages were determined, all of them were B victoria. Um, and so that's uh, a bunch of them where B lineage wasn't able to be determined uh, in, the in the global scene. Again, now looking at the activity from September 2022 to 2023, we did see some countries um, with the percent positive specimens for, of all the tested um, had zero to five percent positivity. So many, many countries had that yellow, which is this kind of light yellow color. Um, and uh, some, some countries, uh, had quite a bit more. So, for example, in South America, in, in North Africa, uh, in Central Africa, and in parts of Europe and Southeast Asia. So, looking at the B. Victoria viruses, here's the genetics. Again, the layout is the same as I described for the H3N2 viruses. Um, the 1A3 viruses, so those are down here at the bottom of this phylogeny. Um, and represented by this like B Kenya 186 here. Um, they are, they've derived from older viruses that were more, uh, have more genetic relationship to the B Washington 2 2019 vaccine virus. Um, and, but they have a few, just a few additional substitutions. Um, and you can see we still have a few of those circulating and they were primarily in uh, South America uh, and a few in North America. But the majority of viruses are these 3A2 viruses. Um, so VA, V1A, 0.3A, 0.2, and I'll call them 3A2 viruses for shorthand. And that's where the B Austria 1359-1359417-2021 vaccine antigens for cell and egg sit. Um, right in the smack middle of that phylogeny. And then we have a couple of uh viruses used that have a, a few changes, such as this D197E, which is an interesting change that we're seeing in Asia and the Americas, um, representing that, that we'll use in serology, as well as this B Maryland and uh, a B virus from China as well. Okay. And so what we're seeing in these 3A2 viruses is a global distribution. You can kind of tell that by the color coding of the tick marks you're seeing here and a lot of that circulation in Europe, which is the green. Um, with uh, They continue to diversify and this H122Q virus is really kind of like this, this virus here. Um, the 182, 197, and, and 221 in North Africa, Europe, and North America. So we're seeing those viruses more often there. And the 197E alone, so we're seeing that parallel evolution at the 197E. So here's the 182, 197, and 221, and here's the 197E alone. And so we have representatives of those that will show up in the human serology. For... Um, the global clade diversity, this bar graph is just looking on based on HA sequence availability solely, um, but you can appreciate pretty easily the, the reduction in the V1A.3 and 3.1 over time in the increase of these 3A2 viruses globally. Okay, so this is from September 21 to January 31, 2022, and then Feb to August 2022, and then September to present 2022. 
Um, what you can see here is the sum total of the antigenic analysis. Remember, B viruses weren't in huge circulation. So there was as many to test, but 99% of them are considered uh, reacting very well within two to fourfold of the cell based vaccine antigen. So fer ferret antisera to that, and ferret antisera to the egg based uh, cultivar of B. austria, um, also reacting really well, 99%, um, less than eightfold. So two to four fold would be another way to say that. Now, looking at the cartography, I've kind of overlaid the serum circle and the cartography for brevity. But what you can see here is the clustering of all of these kind of subclades of the 3A2s um, that have potentially the 122Q or the 197E, really antigenically overlapping with each other and very proximal to the cell and egg-based antigens. Um, and so that's that's showing you the serum circle for the cell base and the serum circle for the egg base on the right. Both of these are from the CC in London. Now, looking at the human post-vaccination serum analysis of the B. Victoria viruses, you can see these are all 3A2. So I didn't put a box on here. I thought I did, but I'll highlight it with my red pointer. All these represent 3A2 viruses, and this Austria vaccine-like virus that's um, been used is inducing uh, antibodies that well recognize all these viruses. We do see reduced recognition of the Washington 2 and V1A3 uh, viruses overall, um, and that's to be expected, and part of the reason uh, the Austria was selected over the Washington was the antigenic distinction between those groups. And we're seeing continual decline of these viruses here. So this shows that the current vaccine antigens elicit antibodies that well inhibited the majority of recent representative BVIC lineage viruses from the 1A3A2 subclade. Um, and this included some that had some additional amino acid substitutions, which are listed above there. So to summarize on the B. Yamagata situation, there have been no confirmed detections of, of, uh, of circulating naturally occurring B. Yamagata 1688 lineage viruses after March 2020, and including this period. Uh, recent reports of B. Yamagata detections could not be confirmed as naturally occurring B. Yamagata lineage viruses or were identified as B. Yamagata lineage component of live attenuated vaccines. And we cannot yet be confident that B. Yamagata lineage influenza viruses are extinct. Um, the GISRIS, the Global Influenza Surveillance and Response System, will continue to actively conduct targeted surveillance for influenza B. Yamagata lineage viruses. So to summarize, really, the B. Victoria situation, we only saw B. Victoria lineage uh, during this period. There was not a huge uh, amount of B. virus detections in general or globally. Um, the phylogenetics of the HA, we still see a few 1A3 viruses, these, uh, these descendants in North and Central America. It really represents 1% of viruses collected since 2022, and um, B. Kenya was a representative. The 3A2 predominated and have global distribution. They share this A127T, P144L, and K203R, and B. Austria, 13 Five nine four one seven twenty twenty one, like virus represents that group. They continue to diversify. Um, the post-infection ferret antisera raised against the B. austria component well inhibited all the 1A3A2 viruses, which predominate, and poorly inhibited the 1A3 uh, viruses, which continue to decrease. For human serology and antiviral susceptibility, um, with the human serology studies, and I just gave you that high level, all the, C, all the CCs and ERLs combined view really illustrate that the recent representative B. Victoria lineage viruses from the 3A.2 subgroup were well inhibited by all the serum panels. Um, we did see significant reductions in the geometric mean titers uh, with most serum panels for viruses from the 1A3 clade. And for antiviral susceptibility, none of the viruses showed reduced susceptibility to neuraminidase or endonuclease inhibitors. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Uh, Wentworth, uh, for your biannual updates uh, on, on a very complicated topic, and you, you, you lay it out so clearly to all of us and to the public. Uh, I invite the committee members to use the raise your hand function uh, to ask questions to Dr. Wentworth, and we begin with Dr. Offit. Right. Uh, thank you, Dr. Wentworth, for a very clear um, presentation. I want to get back to a question that Dr. Portnoy asked and, and that Dr. Grosskopf answered and then deferred to you. Is it so, for example, last year when we picked strains, we thought we did a pretty good job of predicting what would be coming into this country. Nonetheless, we had whatever, 60 plus percent protection against severe disease for, against for hospitalization in the pediatric age group. Dr. Grosskopf, when she answered the question that he asked, alluded to the fact that this may just be that we're looking at a drifting virus. And so is it fair to say then that this virus doesn't just drift, for example, from one year to the next, but drifts more frequently than that so that we can only do so well at, at predicting strains? And so, so we therefore wouldn't expect to do any better than what we've just done. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Offit. Um, yeah, it's an interesting question. And so I, th I think we have to, I'm going to try to be very clear here because there's genetic drift, which we, which flu does almost faster than almost any other virus. And it does it at a population scale. So it's really challenging from that perspective. And I think one of the things we have to understand that, that I think is important is not necessarily always predicting the perfect. And then there's, uh, th let me just finish that first statement. Then there's antigenic drift, which is this more significant, how how many amino acid changes do you need to really push it over the edge and push it farther and make the virus uh, able to evade prior existing immunity from infection or vaccination? Um, and, and that's the more important kind of drift that we're talking about. And when people sometimes use the term match, which which portrays flu as a black and white situation, which is not true at all, it's a lot of shades of gray. And so it oversimplifies the situation. So you're right. We're just, you know, during a season, we can see drift occur during a season. That happens all the time. It's very subtle, like I showed you with the 2B viruses. Those are going from, you know, right at the edge of our ability to recognize drift. So twofold reductions, you can't see more than, you know, Fourfold is a very accurate, oh, I know it's different if it's at least fourfold different from the homologous titer. Um, and then eightfold, you know it's it's clearly different. But eightfold by ferret antisera really only is less than twofold with human sera. And that's why we use this 50% cutoff with the human sera. So we, we're kind of mixing a lot of things here. When you use a naive ferret animal model, they're very exquisitely sensitive to point mutations on the hemagglutinin and really can help us identify drift earlier. And that's why ferrets are important. Um, and then with the human response, we have all that prior infection and we have a broader response, even I think as naive that that needs to be worked out more, but we have a little different response and you can clearly see that with the H1 viruses than ferrets. And so you have that all happening. Now, the other side of the coin is really a high bar of protection from infection with vaccine effectiveness estimates using a test negative study design. Right. So you have there's many factors there besides the the how well the vaccine induces sera that neutralize the virus. Right. That's the thing that that I can look directly at. And I showed you data directly on. So we can look at that data and say, yes, we, we are inducing sera that recognizes the virus. But how high those titers are differ between different people and differ between different vaccine seasons even. And, and so you can get that tighter problem. You can also have what's your negative control group and how much have they been exposed to flu in the recent past or how were they vaccinated in the recent past but not vaccinated this season. And that I think confounds the data a bit. And so I think it's extremely challenging. And I, I think Dr. Groskopf answered, you know, I'm not the VE expert that she is, but there is 
a lot going on in real world vaccine effectiveness estimates and they're not efficacy estimates. And I think even with SARS, this this panel, I think many of this panel is on the VRPAC for SARS, you can see what a high bar it is to protect against respiratory infection. So that is a high bar to meet, to have an immunity that's going to protect you from infection and symptomatic disease. And then to your question about uh, more severe disease, like hospitalization, that question, I it's very difficult because why someone is hospitalized in an older age group uh, can be for a lot of reasons that aren't a, really a severe disease. And so I think we need a, a slightly different, I don't know how to do it. And I, I leave it to our, my colleagues at the CDC to do VE against more severe disease, but it's challenging to do because you can't really use hospital admission because many people will be admitted just just to be precautious because they have flu and they're in a, you know they're in an age group or they have other comorbidities that might be a problem so we don't want that to go the wrong direction so 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 it so it boils down to one of two things sorry just one quick follow up question hannah um it boils down to one of two things. Either one, I guess, is how we define the word drift. I mean, there's drift has a more specific meaning. Maybe there's sort of like drift-like or drift-ish, where there's some somewhat of a, yeah. a evolution, but not not a dramatic evolution. And then the second thing is, I mean, you're alluding to something I hadn't really thought about. Certainly, this is an issue for SARS-CoV-2. Are those hospitalizations and ICU admissions and deaths because really for uh, COVID or or just with COVID? And, and you're saying that's also an issue here. So you think you think both things are going on then? Yeah. Yeah, I think both things are going on. I just, I'll be oversimplistic and state that. And I, I just think that, yeah, I, I think it was a great question by Dr. Portnoy, but I, I also think, and it's great to want to achieve a 90%, but some of the things that you see that high, high VE in are very different. They're not acute, really fast uh, respiratory infections um, like flu is and like SARS is, um, but flu being faster than SARS as far as the, its replication speed. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Offit and Wentworth. Dr. Pergam. Hey, Dr. Wentworth, this is uh, Steve Pergam uh, from Fred Hutch in Seattle. Um, I just want to get back to the Yamagata strain and sort of the elephant in the room here. What is it from WHO and others that are in this committee, what is it going to take to sort of decide that it's done? I mean, there's a sort of worry that it might come back we have had two years without any Yamagata um, really detected. I mean, obviously, it's a different season with, with COVID, but might there be an opportunity to have a maybe a second H3N2 or some other um, component that might be beneficial in terms of providing broader protection against strains that we know are uh, circulating? So I'm curious if maybe you could talk a little bit about, you know, what is going to be the threshold for potentially Yamagata strains being removed from the yeah, I mean, this is a real challenging situation because there's a, a few a, a few things that we need to consider there. Um, there hasn't been a strong influenza B season since SARS emerged. So we really haven't had like a very large influenza B season. Um, and so that's one of the one of the things. So time is is a piece of the factors, you know, I, I, unfortunately, it's going to take time. But as Dr. Um, Jerry Weir pointed out, there's no vaccine that you could put two H3s in that's licensed yet. So, I mean, I think they're two separate questions. I really, I think it's laudatory to think about new vaccines that will improve, you know, the effectiveness of protecting people from in infection and serious disease, et cetera. So that's a good opportunity. But with B. Yamagata, there's that piece of the puzzle. One of the things I pointed out at the last VRPAC when we got into the Yamagata discussion was if you looked at H1s, we didn't detect any 5A1 viruses for quite a while. And then um, once uh, SARS subsided a bit more and we got into later stages of the pandemic, um, we saw that virus come back and it looked a little bit like it was gone. So there has to be a more concerted effort. And, and we've been trying to really support all the GISRIS labs to do more lineage typing. So there's still too many viruses that go um, just as typed as B, but they aren't lineage subtyped because it's an extra test that has to be done. 
Um, and and so we'd like to see a lot more data in that space as well. So it's kind of a combination of time. And then the third element that will be discussed uh, at some point in time with, within at least the WHO community is what is the real risk that B. Yamagata would represent? Even if you can't declare it extinct yet, what's its risk level? And so that that's, I think, a thing that you might be driving at as well. Thank you, Dr. Pergam and Wentworth. Dr. Monto? Well, I may surprise you by not, uh, Dave, by not bringing up uh, why doesn't industry start looking at the possibility of uh, two uh, H3s, let's say, in the vaccine, because uh, unless they do that, uh, we don't have a good alternative for switching out of uh, the B Yamagata quadrivalent. But I wanted to move back towards the question of uh, egg-based versus cell and now recombinant-based selections. It seems to make a difference in what you showed uh, only for H3. Uh, yet we have different strains selected for everything, even for B, uh, which has the same de designation, but is a different, uh, uh, a different uh, isolate or a different cultivar. Uh, where are we now in terms of moving towards uh, something uh, where the uh, uh, recombinant, at least, uh, reflects uh, the best, and is the uh, is, is the cell culture based strain still the best in terms of uh, uh, fit or whatever you want to call it? And uh, where are we now with all the uh, different laboratories working on this towards getting a better cell based? Yeah. Okay. So that's, uh, you always, you're great, Dr. Monto. You always ask me challenging questions. And so this is really, you know, what I'm here to do is present what the data is on antigenic drift and the, and the vaccine selection, but I'll, I'll try to touch on this. So this, this, the, we've moved, I think, in, in good directions, both in the WHO uh, vaccine consultation uh, committee group and the VRPAC in really specifically stating which viruses are for egg and cell. Those used to be a little bit harder to determine. Now we have um, accession numbers for the sequences. If you go to the vaccine recommendation page, so if somebody that's trying to develop a new cell-based vaccine or a new recombinant vaccine, whether that's recombinant protein or nucleic acid, could use those sequences to develop that particular antigen if they so choose to, to go after it. Um, for the egg-based vaccines, what we understand very well is that in each of the viruses that we propagate in eggs, they have to undergo some adaptation to replicate efficiently in eggs. And the efficient replication is critical to make millions and millions of doses of vaccine. So it's the combination of the first egg adaptive changes that happen and then the reassortment often for at least influenza A viruses with high yielding backbones that really allow us to vaccinate so many, many people. And egg-based vaccines still, as you kind of indicated, predominate uh, in the market, both in the US and globally. And so it's a key antigen. And so with, for example, with influenza B, the adaptive change may be quite subtle. One amino acid near the receptor binding site, same is true lately. We, when we are selecting egg-based vaccines, we are looking at those that have the least antigenic impact. So amongst all the egg isolates, we look to see which ones react most like cell isolates. Right. And so that's part of the analysis that down selects various egg prototypes from being nominated. Now, as you clearly identified, H3 is the most challenging. It's very human adapted to the human uh, 2,6 receptors, and it does not grow as well in uh, eggs, which have these sialic acid with a 2,3 uh, linkage to galactose. And so it generally has to undergo two to three substitutions rather than just one in order to replicate efficiently in eggs. And so that's why even with the ferret anisera I showed you with the Darwin 9, which has a pretty good 
uh, phenotype as an egg virus, we do see some more subtle reductions that push it beyond fourfold uh, reduced from the twofold that we would see with the Darwin 6 like system. Um, the various new vaccine platforms can address this issue, and it does to me look like it could potentially help with match, but there's other factors that I think Dr. Groskopf kind of alluded to in the real world setting that, you know, I don't think we fully appreciate when we get down into the real nitty gritty and granular using a ferret, you see one thing and it may not be as reproducible in humans where you get a broader response and, and whatnot. And part of it um, to me also is the magnitude of the response you get. So you, you could have a perfect antigen with a low magnitude response. It still won't protect you very well as an imperfect antigen with a very large magnitude response. And, and I think that I'm not sure how that differs between the different platforms other than with the flu block, it has 45 micrograms of antigen in it. So it's basically similar to a high dose egg based vaccine where that has 45 micrograms instead of 15 that's it, that's required to be in um, the flu cell vax and, and regular inactivated egg based vaccines. So I think it's it's. Like I've said with other things, it's kind of complicated by the different styles of platforms. But the, the true issue for us is when we isolate viruses in eggs, which is required to propagate it and that for that platform, it almost always has to change. And the changes are tend to be more subtle in the H1s and the Bs. Are you still having problems getting uh uh Cell, cell culture based vaccines that are grown in the in acceptable cell lines? Well, not really. I mean, with flu cell vax, they have the qualified manufacturing cell line, which has a very long name and I cannot remember it, but it's derived from MDCK cells. It's like P3O something. Um, and that cell line, so for example, our collaborating center has an agreement to use that cell line for virus isolation. And so that's, that's we use that to isolate viruses that are in each of these clades as they emerge to, as potential vaccine candidates. And, and so does the collaborating center in Melbourne. And so they're doing it as well. Uh, and so that is helping to s provide seeds for the cell-based manufacturing. Thank you, complicated topic. Thank you, uh, Dr. Monto. Uh, Dr. Jaynes. Uh, th thank you. Uh, I have two questions, if that's okay, Hannah. Um, uh, so, so my first question is, um, I, I guess just a, a bit of education. So, so for the human serology analyses, so, uh, so, so the, the, the serum is taken from individuals vaccinated with the previous year's vaccine, um, as I understand it. And, and I'm wondering, you know, what, what do we know about those individuals, um, infection histories? I assume not, not much. And, and if so, I'm, I'm wondering, you know, would one learn something about studying, uh, you know, inhibition, not, not just with vaccinated persons, you know, serum, but, but also with individuals who, who are known to have had previous infection in the previous years, especially, you know, in, in years where, where there's quite a burden of, of infection over the previous year. Yeah, so we don't have a lot of data on those uh, participants. We just we work hard to get participants in eat the, in that represent a variety of vaccine platforms, and uh, we don't have a lot of data on whether or not they were vaccinated the year before, whether they were infected the year before, those kinds of things. I agree with you. A lot could be learned from that. That gets a bit into kind of some more research that could be done on what prior exposure histories would and how they impact um, maybe the optimal vaccine choice. The best we can do at this point in time is the, with the age groups. This is one of the reasons I, we, we have so many age groups now. This is not a, you know, it's an extensive amount of work that has to be conducted in a just-in-time way um, with all those serum panels that come in just, you know, because people are just getting vaccinated in November and December. So we're collecting sera from those folks and getting the data for this uh, meeting. And so um, the younger age groups, they offer at least uh, an inkling of likely no prior infection or prior infection or, or, or no vaccination prior. So like for zero to 36 months old, we all those participants haven't had a prior vaccine. 
So we know we know that, for, for example. We can't guarantee they haven't been infected before. Um, one way, if we're concerned about that and it, uh, biasing our data some in some way, we can see from their pre-immune uh, sera that maybe they're higher, tighter than the other, other people against a particular group of virus, but that's pretty difficult to narrow down. So it's great. Great question, but I, I think it's it, it definitely is in a little bit of a research realm as to trying to understand um, what the benefits of of your first exposure are, what the benefits or 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 negatives of of different exposure histories over time. Thank you, and 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 my second question is is asking I guess for a bit of speculation. I wonder if you or, or Dr. Groskopf could speculate about, you know, the, the early peak in, in, in the flu season this year, what is that, you know, hold for us in, in, in terms of the dynamics, the temporal dynamics for, yeah. for the coming season? Well, I'm happy to speculate on it. I think in general, we had a lower level immunity uh, against H3N2 in particular, but against flu in general, in part because of all the non-pharmaceutical interventions that were associated with SARS and then potentially viral interference associated with SARS-2, which the COVID-19, the agent for COVID-19, right? And so overall, I think all the populations were had a little bit reduction in their amount of prior infections over the last couple of years. And so the other problem with influenza, and it gets into the vaccine effectiveness discussion, is our immunity to the virus from previous infection wanes very fast. Our immunity from vaccination wanes very fast. So it just keeps decreasing as time goes on. And so I, th my feeling there is there's a bit of reduced population immunity, and then the reemergence of the H3 at a time when people were now feeling like, oh, I can go out and I can have dinner and I can, you know, we're coming out of the pandemic and a lot of the non-pharmaceuticals, uh, you know, dropped off, you know, globally uh, in, in around the same time frame as well. So that spurred you know, these viruses, you saw RSV kind of do the same thing, an earlier season with RSV than usual um, and, a, and a more significant peak. I cannot for the life of me even hazard as to why the peak dropped so rapidly. And that did that in multiple countries. So it peaked early and then it also declined rapidly. If all that I just told you was true, you would may expect that it would continue to just stay at a high level for a, quite a while. So I'm clearly not right. Or partially right. I mean, I it, it's not, I wouldn't discount that, but anyway, <laughs> Dr. Berger. Uh, thanks. I actually have two questions as well, and. I think one of my questions is actually for Dr. Weir, so I'll ask that second. But I, I, I was looking back at the data that you presented, and, and thank you very much. This is a really great talk, and it you know, makes the data very easy for us to follow. The, the neutralization uh, uh, slide that you put up for H3N2 specifically showed a difference between three to eight year old pediatric populations. Um, and pediatric populations that are 9 to 17, specifically in relation to 2A1B reactivity, or sorry, neutralization. And I was wondering what, what might explain that difference or what your what kind of hypothesis you might have between the difference there. And I, I apologize, I don't remember what the check with the light blue means compared to a darker blue. Yeah, I, I, I probably neglected to explain it this time. So the check means that it's statistically significant data. If it has a plus, it okay. means that the um, geometric mean titer of the virus that we're comparing to. So for example, in that case, the Darwin 6 or Darwin 9 like homologous titer would be very low. Like if it was 40, then you don't have much linear resolution. And so even if it's like say 30 geometric mean tighter comparison, we would have like a, a plus mark in that blue uh, and orange graph. And so you've got a good eye. What you were picking up on there is some reduction. So in the pediatric six to 35 months, the antigen was quite good in that it, protected against all the 2A subclade viruses. So that clade 2 in all of its subclades. Where it fell off in that age group, and it's still protected to some extent, 
but we had that orange coloring, which means the 90% confidence interval was touching our 50% threshold line. Um, is uh, the 1A1 virus. So that's an antigenically very different virus and almost would be, I would have expected in that age group that it would have been even more distinct, like it would have been burnt orange or closer to the red color because that age group is more similar to a naive animal model age group. Now, then I think you picked up on a couple of other things. In the, in the older pediatric panel, we saw a similar feature and the two older pediatric panels with the Florida 2, that 2B group, they were subtle reductions again from the three-year-olds all the way to the 17-year-olds. So that represents uh, like four panels because there's flu cell vax and IV4 in the three to eight and flu cell vax and IV4 in the nine to 17. And so it's really only in a couple of those panels, but what you're seeing there is again, some touching of that of that uh, 50% threshold but not cross not the point estimate didn't cross it and the other thing that we were happy with is that the 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 raw geometric mean titers were quite high in the hundreds like a couple hundred 300 so um that's even though you're trying to compare it against that that uh, 50 percent threshold that's a pretty good titer and it likely explains why that ve that was presented actually is pretty good ve for h3n2 viruses so i'll just put in context what dr groskoff put in play because that's also in consideration in the vaccine consultation meeting is that the ve against h3s can be much lower and so that wasn't a bad ve and there's other studies, one published in the MMWR by the, um, by the group out of Milwaukee, the Marshfield Clinic group, where it ranged from 60 to 70%. They had a very early and strong season there. Uh, and most of that was H3 um, for that age group, to that same window from like under 18 kind of age group. Uh, so the VE, so the VE in that case, the vaccine estimates with test negative design kind of mirrored a bit with what we're seeing with the serology. We had a lot of 2B viruses in the United States, and we had pretty good VE for H3 in the United States. Thanks. That that, that is actually helpful, and I, I think the the VE for what six months to 17 years old against hospitalization was 68 percent. So. I would suggest that maybe even these numbers are, are still somewhat protective, at least. Um, the, the sec so thank you. That's really helpful for, for understanding the data. The, the second question, like I said, is, is maybe more directed towards Dr. Weir. But, you know, it, it, it was a comment that you made in terms of the ability to actually approve a vaccine right now based on the current licensure. Um, and that right now, all the licensure is actually going to have to be the two A's and two B's with that, you know, B Yamagata strain being the fourth. And, uh, you know, the, I guess the question is, because Dr. Weir had pointed out that we actually need a, a specific recommendation to, to make a change along those lines. But the questions seem to be missing that. I mean, if we, if we have to approve a vaccine today, uh, that is a composite of what's actually in the licensure versus putting out a message that says we, we want to start looking at a potential change to, uh, you know, what, what might be, one might suggest being a third A strain. Uh, you know, are we missing a question that, that should be posed to the committee uh, along those lines? Um, hi, hi, Dr. Berger. I don't, I don't think you're missing anything. Uh, it is sort of a bigger issue than what we're addressing at the committee today. Uh, I think, I, I guess I've said this before, I think any sort of move toward a different composition than what we have now really does need to be globally coordinated somehow. And so it probably should start with, and again, I'm not trying to pass the buck, but I really do think this should probably start with discussions uh, at the WHO for how globally manufacturers would respond to a changing environment where really uh, one does not have a B. Yamagata and where one might could do something else that is more in the interest of public health. 
So, of course, this committee is free to make suggestions and what they think should happen. Uh, we would welcome those. Um, and but I do really think that this is a global uh, a global issue that needs to be addressed, and probably a, a push from the WHO as well as as well as individual countries to encourage manufacturers to generate data that could be considered by the WHO as well as the VERPAC in future in future meetings that would support some different composition that might be advantageous uh, from a public health point of view. I don't know if that answered your question or not, but I, again, I don't think we're missing anything here. I think we, we've noticed this, others have, uh, and my impression is from talking to the, uh, the chair of the uh, VCM of this most recent one is that the WHO does intend to address some of these issues over the next year or so. At least that's what I was told, and I hope that's the case. David, do you want to add anything to that? Over. I don't think I do want to add anything. I mean, we are basically trying to work hard to figure out um, and address more about influenza B and, and make recommendations as a WHO committee. But as Dr. Weir said, even if we made a recommendation, it really matters on what the license is. And this is an area where I don't have expertise and FDA does. Um, that 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 work, as Dr. Monto kind of started us off with, and the questions for me, you know, needs to be accomplished. I think I'll just state scientifically that it's easy to think two H3s would be a good thing. So we'll use H3 as an example. We've got two diverging clades that are both happening. And what I showed you was Darwin 6 Anisera covers both those clades better than either of those clades cover themselves, than the, uh, either of those clades cover the other one, right? So they're diverging from a point and they're closer to that point that they're diverging from than they are to each other anagenically. Okay, so one could consider, let's put both of those in the vaccine. And in some ways that might work at say, for example, position 140, where they have convergent or parallel evolution and they both, have, and that's in site SA, you know, site in A. And so then for that particular epitope, it would almost be a good thing to have double the amount. And then, but a lot of people think, so when there's often we have non-parallel evolution happening, so just diverging evolution, that if you put both those in the vaccine, um, it may not give you the prime against both of those antigens. And that's what needs to be tested in animal models and humans to me, because what it could do is highlight the conserved epitopes between both those that is basically double the amount. And so you create immunodominance, not at the place that's uh, under the strongest evolution. You create immunodominance where there's conservation. And that, that may be fine. That may be a great thing, or it may be a negative. Right. Um, and it kind of gets into, well, in, in some of the questions that like Dr. Jane's asked, you know, in, you know, prior immune history and what that would do. So it's very convoluted. And it's I think it's overly simplistic to say just put two in there um, without data. Yeah, I That's think you're making a strong case for the need for data for decisions like this, of course. <laughs> Which is actually what prompts the question of whether we're missing a question that would enable the manufacturers to start developing that evidence. Because, I, you know, I agree, it'd be nice to be able to see what, what is going to be the most effective combination here. You know, but it raises questions about whether they could actually develop those, you know, those additional vaccine types in order to start testing for the fall, for instance, or be able to have those preclinical models um, running between now and fall when those are, are ready. But I mean, that's part of the reason I was asking the question is, are we missing one that would allow for that prompt? But I, you know, I, I understand where you're coming from in terms of trying to have this be globally coordinated. So thank you. Yes, and can I make one more point about the global coordination? Remember, these manufacturers produce around the world, and that's also part of the reason why I, I stress the global coordination here. But back to your question about are we missing anything, I think that maybe if I can make a suggestion, maybe after the end of the voting when uh, usually there's a, a chance for the committee members to make final comments, uh, maybe that would be a good place for you to make comments like this for the record. Over. Thank you. I think some of these comments also were made on the last meeting, but um, Dr. Wentworth, you will be back after the OPH, right? 
So we have an opportunity yes. to ask questions because I have, and I'm sure many others do, but we have a break scheduled now. 10 minute, it was 10 minute break. We cut into it. So it's now seven minutes. So let's reconvene at 1230 central time. I'm sorry, 1230 Eastern time.
Are we live or not yet? We're live now. We're live. Thank you all. Uh, we will be uh, reconvening now uh, to listen to the presentation by Dr. Anthony Fries, uh, the DOD Influenza Surveillance and Mid-Season Vaccine Effectiveness. Dr. Fries is DOD Global Respiratory Pathogen Surveillance Program Lead at the United States Air Force School of Airspace Medicine. Dr. Fries. Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Good. All right, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Anthony Fries, and I'm here today representing the DOD's Defense Health Agency. I sit in the Defense Centers for Public Health Dayton, which resides at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in Ohio. I'll pre be presenting the results from various uh, DOD influenza public health efforts uh, from multiple partners. Next slide. I'll touch on a number of things today. First, an overall description of DHA surveillance efforts. I'll then present data on the mid-year VE estimates from two distinct studies here within the DOD, uh, one estimating influenza VE and in DOD healthcare system beneficiaries or dependents, uh, excluding active duty members, and a second study examining VE in service member populations. I'll then provide a brief summary of some phylogenetic diversity and antigenic characterization for the isolates we've obtained in the DOD this flu season. Next slide. So influenza surveillance is part of several large public health initiatives throughout the DOD, uh, many of which are led by DHA's Global Emerging Infections Surveillance Branch, or GICE, which sits in the Armed Forces Health Surveillance Division of DHA. These surveillance programs extend to over 400 locations in over 30 countries. In addition to monitoring uh, U.S. military personnel and their dependents, we facilitate public health relationships with foreign entities, as well as local nationals. And this work is essential as we really closely monitor our active duty military personnel for respiratory illnesses like influenza. And in turn, we utilize these health encounters for various reports, studies, and uh, analyses like I'll be sharing today. Next slide, please. As mentioned, the surveillance network is spread across all six uh, what we've termed combatant commands uh, with multiple laboratories within these regions. When organizing these annual activities, we often take into account where we have interests as well as where WHO efforts are located. Uh, next slide. Additionally, our surveillance can significantly contribute uh, to regional WHO surveillance. So you can see some DHA-funded efforts in Ghana, shown here in the top panel, just representing some influenza activity in the country, while in the bottom panel, the WHO uh, flu net data aggregated influenza activity in the region. Just to exemplify how our DOD efforts can provide a significant contribution to regional testing efforts and sometimes can be a considerable source of those data for, for a region. Next slide. So now I'll jump into the uh, actual data with the background covered. Um, we'll transition to our first set of data. We'll go into the mid-season VE estimates from healthcare beneficiaries, excluding our active duty component. Next slide. So this is dependent or beneficiary investigation was conducted by the uh, Air Force's School of Aerospace Medicine here in Dayton, utilizing the DOD's Global Respiratory Pathogen Surveillance Program, which leverages an infrastructure of about 100 Sentinel surveillance sites, heavily concentrated in the United States and Germany. Uh, and, and really in Europe all over. And this program requests systematic sampling of about six to 10 ILI encounters, influenza-like illness encounters weekly from each installation for subsequent laboratory testing. And this is a test negative control design and cases are included uh, specimens testing positive for influenza by PCR and or viral culture. Uh, these data were gathered from between October 2nd through February 18th. And to preempt the impending question of RSV or SARS-CoV-2 testing uh, negative as uh, sort of criteria for inclusion, those were not considered in the case inclusion in this study, nor in the next one. 
Uh, the case definitions for ILI presentations use three different approaches, a fever and cough, or fever and two additional symptoms shown here, or a physician-diagnosed ILI. And the de these details are gathered from questionnaires collected from our partners at each patient encounter. So, uh, and additionally, any vaccination registries and healthcare records are used to confirm vaccination statuses. Um, and so in this study, we are estimating VE against medically attended, symptomatic, laboratory-confirmed influenza infections in an outpatient setting. Next slide. Controls were matched based on age and collection dates, uh, and we conducted four analyses estimating VE against influenza A infections in children, adults, and all of the dependents, so both age groups. And additionally, we estimated a VE estimate for a subtype specific H3N2 for all dependents as well. Next slide. Some things to note about our cases, a uh, little over 50% of our cases and controls originated from encounters in Europe to note, uh, and particularly from the Landstuhl Regional Medical Center in Germany. In all, we had 280, uh, 240 cases and 960 uh, controls with vaccination rates of 47% and 58% in those groups respectively. To be considered vaccinated, an individual needed to present 14 days or more after receiving the 22-23 Northern Hemisphere vaccine. And if you look at the figures on the right here, you can see our subtype distribution for these cases, with the majority of subtyped cases being H3N2. And a large portion of our European cases were not subtyped and remained A unsubtyped uh, to note. But the lower number of H1N1 cases ultimately prevented us from pre uh, calculating a subtype specific VE estimate for V1 here or H1 here. Next slide. A few key demographic features to note, uh, there was no significant difference in cases between males and females, but this population does skew towards younger age groups with about 74% of our cases occurring in children, 17 uh, years or younger, and only 12% uh, or 12 cases actually uh, in the 45 to 64 year old age group. And lastly, 80% of our cases uh, occurred in November and December. Next slide. On this slide, I'll just stop to highlight that we calculated both crude and adjusted with adjusted accounting for age and geographic distribution. Uh, and however, I'll focus on the adjusted VE estimates on the next slide. So next slide, please. As a reminder, we calculated four estimates of VE against medically attended symptomatic influenza infections. Uh, this first is the adjusted VE against all influenza A independents. This estimate was at 49% and was significant. The first, uh, the secondly, the estimate for VE in children was estimated at 45% and was significant. Our adult estimate for VE against all influenza A was 44%, but was not significant. And we did have the power to calculate VE against medically attended symptomatic H3N2 infections with a 65% estimate in our overall dependent population, which was significant. Uh, and so to note, when we included children from six months to two years, we added another 18 cases and our estimates moved up by about five percentage points each in all of these analyses that included children. Um, and to note, after the conversation that Dr. Wentworth uh, had, uh, you know, these H3N2 VE estimates were similar to those values seen in the other North American H3N2 estimates, uh, especially that Marshfield study. Next slide. Now I'll transition to the VE estimates performed by our Armed Forces Health Surveillance Division on our active duty service member component. Next slide. This is also a case test negative control design. This was done using active component personnel from across all military services, including those stationed in the continental and uh, uh, stationed in foreign locations from, it says September here, but it should say October 2nd through February 4th. Um, these cases are the result of service member outpatient encounters. Uh, as in the dependent study, influenza cases were confirmed by PCR or culture. But in this study, we also included rapid test positives for cases, uh, just of note. And controls were those healthcare encounters testing negative for influenza by either PCR or culture, but negative rapid tests were excluded from identifying those controls. And models in this study were adjusted for sex, age, prior vaccinations, and month of uh, diagnosis. Next slide. Uh, in this, quadrivalent IIV4 was the only vaccine type used in these subjects. It's also important to note that our active duty service member component population is very highly vaccinated, as influenza vaccination is compulsory for active duty personnel. Uh, an earlier influenza season this year, 
prior to the typically high 90% vaccination rates in our active duty was probably a factor in allowing us to calculate this VE this year. Uh, but note, nearly every subject here would have been vaccinated against influenza in the prior five years. And regarding cases, we had a total of 5,560 cases uh, overall with the following case distributions across types and subtypes. Many cases were identified via rapid diagnostic testing in this study, which is why we don't have as many subtypes identified. And lastly to note, we had too few inpatient cases in this data, uh, in these data to calculate VE against hospitalization using a case test negative study design, but I'll touch on that a little bit later. Next slide. Here you can see our percentage breakdown by age groups for both cases and test negative controls. This population does not contain children or elderly, and 89% of our cases occur in the 18 to 40 year old age groups. Therefore, as with the dependent VE estimates, these populations skew younger um, and limiting generalization to the broader public, but does focus on that 18 to 40 year old healthy adult population. Next slide. On to our estimates. Here we are showing overall vaccine effectiveness against both influenza A and B, medically attended laboratory confirmed uh, infections, as well as estimates against AH1 and AH3. The adjusted VE for influenza A in active duty service members was 35% and was significant. For subtype specific adjusted VEs, um, VE against AH1 was 14%, but was not significant, and the estimate had pretty wide confidence intervals there. Uh, but for VE against AH3N2 infection, we observed a 64% estimate that was significant. And lastly, we observed VE against B of 21% that was not significant. Next slide. So overall, in our active duty service members, our VE estimates against influenza infections was low at 40, 35% for A and 21% for, uh, percent for B, albeit non-significant for B. One limitation here is that we included rapid test positives in our cases and false positives may influence uh, these estimates. However, of note, due to the nature of the testing, subtype specific estimates do not include these rapid tests for inclusion. And so the moderately high 64% protection provided by uh, against AH3N2 infections in this active duty population with the 2223 Northern Hemisphere vaccine was comparable to our 65% estimate uh, seen in the dependent population. And as mentioned, those Marshfield studies. Uh, one last note, we did calculate a 54% VE against hospitalized influ influenza A using a, a different studies design, the cohort study design, but it was just shy of statistical significance. And like Dr. Groskopf, um, you know, these are early estimates and we're recalculating as we approach uh, the end of the season. Next slide. We'll now tr transition to our phylogenetic analyses conducted by the U.S. Air Force School of Aerospace Medicine. Uh, these data just lend a bit more context to those influenza cases, uh, particularly from the dependent analysis, as these were sequence data from many of those cases. Next slide. Generally, we'll give a brief overview, as you've already had uh, sort of a tour de force from Dr. Wentworth. Next slide. This figure reemphasizes the footprint of where our influenza cases originated from this year with a large representation of around uh, 630 sequences uh, characterized this season from European locations and the United States with AH3N2 predominating in these early cases, mostly seen in November and December, and the relative absence of influenza B in our data set. Next slide. For AH1N1, consistent with what others have seen in North America and Europe, and you heard from Dr. Wentworth, we have seen the predominance of the newly designated subclades 5A2A1 with 76% of our sequ sequences uh, for our H1 cases. The 5A2A subclade represented the other 24% of H1 cases. And again, our H1 cases were observed concurrently with H3N2 infections in our populations, making up about 20% of the total cases characterized. But uh, of note, proportionally here right recently, uh, those cases of H1 have represented about 50% of the total cases when we got into January and February. Next slide. In this tree shown here, the small smidge of red on the, I don't know if I get my little highlighter, but um, uh, the red on the side panel in the tree are the current 5A2 viruses in the 2022-23 Northern Hemisphere vaccines down here. Uh, the 5A2A1 clade is the large purple portion on the top of the tree. 
The WHO recommendations for the 2324 Northern Hemisphere H1 strains include that cell propagated A Wisconsin 67 virus, uh, which falls at the lone black line uh, on the left hand side of that panel um, with within that purple clade in the panel, just to the right of the tree. Uh, the egg propagated recommendation of A. Victoria 4897 falls into the upper portion of this purple clade, showing that threonine 216 uh, alanine uh, substitution, which kind of splits this 5A2A1 clade like Dr. Wentworth had mentioned. Regardless, consistent with global surveillance partners, the green and blue in the panel on the right of the tree is, a high, is just to highlight that geographically, these subclades were prevalent in both our European and North American data sets. Next slide. Moving on to H3, we see a similarly high degree of diversity in our data sets as those shown by the CDC with several competing a clade two subclades fighting it out. Uh, the plot here is showing data all the way back to September 2021, so last season when we had a big US Naval Academy outbreak. Uh, and, and sort of showing it back to 2021, you can see the 2A1A orange and 2A3 yellow subclades predominated last season in our data set and were replaced by 2B in pink, uh, 2A1B in green, and 2A1 in the reddish brown. Uh, in our DOD ILI cases from this season, making up 93% of the cases uh, and 2B representing the largest proportion of those at 69%, as Dr. Wentworth mentioned. As a reminder to all the current and recommended 23-24 uh, compositions of H3N2, and the, uh, are, they're the subclade 2A viruses from the, the recommendations, as well as what the 22-23 vaccinations were. Um, and we really don't see that specific 2A, and we've seen the sort of maturation of those into the 2A1B, uh, sorry the 5A2A1 and 5A2A1A uh, lineages. Next slide. We'll go ahead and glance over that. Oh, I'm sorry. I messed up on the uh, H3N2 subclade 2A viruses, uh, which we just really don't see that much of, and they've sort of matured into the 2A2s, A and B. Sorry. Next slide. And sort of to highlight that, from a phylogenetic perspective, you can see the proportional representation of subclade 2B in pink at the top of the tree and 2A1B towards the bottom in green, with several other sublineages sporadically occurring within those, uh, such as 2A1 in reddish brown, also represented. And I won't spend long here except to mention the panel to the right represents the geographic distribution of cases from September to January. And while the diversity of clade 2B viruses were encountered in both our European and North American DOD populations, uh, in our European cases, they also showed sort of 2A1B predominantly, while our North American cases, other than 2B, were also heavily impacted by 2A1. Uh, so again, just to reemphasize that subclade of uh, 3C2A1B.2A2, 2 2, the A through D, uh, we mostly saw the A's, which were A1B and 1, and then the 2B's also dominating there in pink. Next slide. Um, next slide, actually. Uh, for influenza B, uh, we have a sparsity of or sort of scarcity of data here. We only mention this because we've only genetically characterized six specimens, and of note, they all fell into the V1A, 3A2 lineages. Next slide. So in summary, these data, uh, in these data, we've shown influenza sequence diversity from primarily North American and European DOD ILI cases. Our data are consistent in that H1N1 cases were primarily from newly designated subclades 5A2A and primarily followed, followed by that of those, uh, the 5A2A1 subclade. Uh, and as a reminder, the, the vaccine strains from 22-23 were the 5A2s recommended to be updated to these 5A2A1s. Uh, and for H3N2, we found a broad diversity of competing 3C2A1B, 2A2, or clade 2 subclades. And our cases were primarily 2B, followed by either 2A1B in Europe and 2A1 in the States. And B cases were all V1A3A2, as I mentioned, and it was unsurprising. Next slide. Lastly, we'll transition to a quick overview of our antigenic data from these specific isolates that were genotyped. Uh, these data are collected by our colleagues at the Naval Medical Research Center in Silver Spring, Maryland. 
And here we'll be discussing the results from the high content imaging-based neutralization tests or the HINT assays that were discussed earlier by CDC uh, for H3N2, except here we actually run HINT on both H1N2 and H3N2. And additionally, our samples were passaged through MDCK cells. Uh, and in our analyses, we report the highest dilution of ferret anisera generated against various vaccine or candidate viruses uh, that showed 50% neutralization of each of our isolates. Uh, and thanks to the CDC for providing a lot of those ferret anisera. Next slide. In this figure, you'll see the traditional anagenic map. Uh, annotated points are representative of what ferret anisera were tested in these data. Um, and those ferret anisera relative those anisera's relative ability to neutralize uh, our former vaccine strains, as well as those in our sequence or in our network. The blue and green samples here to highlight are our DOD isolates. Uh, green isolates here represent older pre-2022-23 isolates, while blue ones are in our uh, are more representative of our current season 5A2A and 5A2A1 isolates. And overall, ferret anisera generated against the recent 22-23 northern hemisphere uh, egg and cell and the recent southern hemisphere 2023 Sydney fives uh, all have a similar neutralization titer profile distinct from previous seasons shown here uh, from the green ones on the right. Next slide. And if we just look at the raw titer table for this same map, you can see the corresponding neutralization titers roughly just go off of colors here. Uh, the leftmost columns highlighted in bluish gray are the neutralization titers using ferret anisera generated against the 2223-5A2 vaccine components. Uh, of note, we do not have ferret anisera against the new 5A2A1s, um, but right next to those bluish gray columns are the ferret anisera uh, against the 2023 Southern Hemisphere A Sydneys. Really, the main thing to note here are the high antibody titers neutralizing our DOD current season 5A2A and 5A2A1 isolates in the blue rows at the bottom of this table. Uh, and we note, however, these are only ferret anisera data, and we do not have the 5A2 human anisera pools that have been really influential and shown to poorly recognize the currently circulating 2A and 2A1 viruses. Next slide. Transitioning to H3N2, again, using the HINT assay, you'll see here the annotated samples are representative of ferret anisera uh, neutralized, neutralization titers raised against recent vaccine and candidates. Uh, the large portion of blue, yellow, and green points in the middle of this map are representative of our DOD viruses. Here we do see a slight differentiation of our H3N2 viruses uh, into three distinct profiles or clusters. The reality is that ferret anisera generated against the A Darwins in the 22-23 and the recommendations for the 23-24. Shown on the far left of this plot did a good job of recognizing and neutralizing the predominant uh, two A's in our study, those being 2A1B and 2A1. Uh, which are included in the green and yellow clusters shown here. But the blue cluster is entirely comprised of two B viruses. Uh, next slide. And to be clear, there was generally good neutralization of these two B uh, blue cluster viruses with most neutralizations falling within a fourfold reduction uh, by ferret anisera generated against the uh, the, the Darwin 9 um, shown in the first gray uh, highlighted column here. However, we did observe many actual H eight-fold reductions when we looked at the antibody titers for neutralization of the 2B using ferrets anisera against cell-propagated Darwin-6, which was a little counterintuitive to what we'd expect based on you know, what Dr. Wentworth had said about cell uh, oftentimes having the different reductions. And so uh, we continue to monitor these, and uh, but it still fell within the eight-fold reduction. And why not, for the sake of time, we go ahead and skip the next two. Those are just the other clusters, anagenic tables. And here we go. So in summary, um, our hint data for the H1N1 shown here indicate that ferret anisera raised against 5A2 does well to neutralize circulating 5A2A and 5A2A1. However, to reiterate, we don't have human serum pools like those mentioned earlier. For H3N2, our 2A1B and 2A1 viruses were well neutralized by either cell or egg-based A Darwins in the 2A subclade, but neutralized 2B less well specifically for ferret anisera raised against cell-based A Darwin 6, but uh, still within that eight-fold reduction for the most part. Uh, next slide. 
And so just overall, to put our results in context to those recent recommendations from the recent Northern Hemisphere WHO technical meeting in February for H1N1, while our genetic and antigenic data appear to support the continuance of you know, the 22-23-5A2 virus strains, uh, our lower VE point estimates for A overall in both dependents and service member populations, as well as our poor H1N1 specific VE point estimates for service members, does suggest a slightly lower protection for the uh, by the current 2223-5A2 strains, and especially coupled with the human data presented by Dr. Wentworth, we tend to agree with the recommendation to update to the predominantly circulating 5A2A1s. Um, for H3N2, our consistent subtype specific VE estimates around 65% uh, is really encouraging, uh, especially in light of H3N2 not really having those high numbers typically. These estimates seem to be consistent with other VE estimates that we've seen out of other North American VE networks. And in addition, given the current genetic diversity of clade 3C2A1B, 2A2, or the subclades 2A and 2B predominantly, uh, we've seen here, and the ability of ferret anisera raised against the uh, those viruses to neutralize much of the current subclade diversity leads us to agree with the uh, that current uh, Northern Hemisphere 2324 recommendations. And regarding B recommendations, we really can't, we really can't comment because we really didn't see it that much, and certainly not the B. Um, next slide. And I just want to note that this work is the aggregate result of countless uh, colleagues and public health professionals across the DOD. And I'm uh, honored to have been able to re uh, represent those people here. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Fries. Uh, we have uh, now an opportunity to ask a question to Dr. Fries pertaining to the DOD data, um, although we're really short on time, but uh, question from Dr. Pergam. Thanks, Dr. Fries. That was um, great data to compliment what's been previously um, discussed. I, I want to get back to, to influenza B, and I'm sorry, sorry, I'm kind of stuck on this, but I think you had, in, at least in the data for the, the service, um, those in, in currently in service, about 200 or so influenza B cases, but you're only able to sequence six. Maybe this is just a quick question. Were most of those B positives from the rapid testing or from PCR? That's my, that, so it was probably potentially false positives, potentially. Is that is that what you guys are estimating from them? That's our working thought at the moment. Um, okay. Yeah, we can only get our hands on so many. And to Dr. Wentworth's point earlier, there is a concerted effort by a lot of our labs going forward to lineage type those, at, but it does require that extra typing. Okay, thank you. Dr. Portnoy? Um, yes, thank you. I'm, I'm always pretty much overwhelmed by all of this information, but I do have two questions, two brief ones. Do you, in addition to measuring antibody titers to the influenza vaccines or uh, strains, do you also measure cell mediated immunity? And do you have any information about that, or does anybody measure cell mediated immunity? And my second question is: Is what do you know what the durability of the vac of the response is? How long does this antibody response response last and does it wane over time after the vaccine has been given? Un unfortunately, yeah, to both of those questions, those would probably be best answered by Dr. Wentworth in the human serum data. Uh, you know, we, we rely on the, the ferret anisera data that we see um, and we sort of glean from the CDC. So I would have to defer to CDC on that question. Sorry. Okay, thank you. Hmm. Okay, uh, we will have an opportunity to ask additional questions uh, during the Q&A. One brief question um, I have is, uh, given sort of the homogeneity of, of the population, uh, especially in the active members uh, data, do we see in the, in the, in the individuals who have influenza and have been vaccinated, which is 94% of the population. Um, do we see that the strains are any different between those 6% and those 94%? And I ask this question just because you have sort of a controlled environment here. 
So the first point to emphasize that this year with the early season, we did not see that high rate. Yes, in the last five years, we can estimate that, you know, 94 plus percent uh, had have been vaccinated at least once. Um, to your point about some sort of impact of heavy induced vaccination, those heavy rates, uh, it does create sort of like a natural sieve environment of vac vaccine sort of pressure. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are a number of studies being done throughout the DOD in partnership with CDC and NIH on those exact questions uh, of looking at sort of a sieve effect of that. Um, but I'd hesitate to sort of uh, speculate any kind of real heavy impact because of the ability to just drift on a whim uh, sometimes for these viruses, specifically influenza. All right. Thank you, Dr. Fries. Uh, I see no additional raised hands. I see no additional raised hands. Sorry, I muted by accident. Uh, to discuss the candidate vaccine strains and potency reagents, uh, Dr. Manju Joshi will be joining us now. Uh, she's the lead biologist, Division of Biological Standards and Quality, Office of Compliance and Biologics Quality at CBER. Dr. Joshi. Uh, uh, hope you can hear me. Uh, thank you, Al-Sali, for the kind introduction. As she mentioned, I am the lead biologist in the Laboratory of Biochemistry, Virology, and Immunochemistry in the Division of Biological Standards and Quality Control in Office of Compliance and Biological Quality at CBER. Uh, in today's talk, I'm going to just give you an idea about the candidate vaccine strains and the potency reagents, very important ones which are needed for vaccine testing. Uh, next slide, please. So the, mainly I'll just cover two aspects. One will be what are the WHO recommendations for 23, 24 Northern Hemisphere influenza vaccines. And uh, I will give you an idea about the availability of the potency testing reagents for each of the recommended strains. Next slide, please. So the WHO recommended viruses for uh, influenza A, H1N1 type for 23, 24 Northern Hemisphere vaccine season is different from the 22, 23 Northern Hemisphere season and is also different from what was recommended for 2023 20, Southern Hemisphere season. For egg-based vaccine, WHO recommended that uh, A Victoria 4897 2022 H1N1 PDM09-like virus for egg-derived vaccines, while for cell culture or recombinant-based vaccine, WHO recommendation is for a, a Wisconsin 67 2022 H1N1 PDM 09-like virus, which is MDCK cell-derived. Next slide, please. So, so as far as the availability of the candidate vaccine viruses are there, uh, I mean, this is the was from the most recent list on from the WHO website, and I'm sure more viruses will be added to the list in the due course as big as the candidate viruses become available. But for A Victoria 4897, wild type viruses as well as a candidate a CVV, which is IVR 238, has been made available by Vidral in Australia. Next slide, please. For an H1N1 PDM on nine, so for CVV for cell culture based vaccine, two viruses have been recommended, which are available on the WHO website currently. And again, one is the A West Virginia 30 2022, and the second one is A Georgia 12 2022, which are available from CDC in US. Uh, next slide, please. So we have to always think about the potency reagents. In the event company, uh, this committee approves or goes with the recommendation made by WHO, potency testing reagent will be required for this new strain. As always, CBER will work with essential regulatory ERLs, er essential regulatory laboratories, the ERLs, and with manufacturers to prepare and calibrate the required reference antigen for testing of 
uh, the vaccines produced in egg platform in cell culture and for recombinant vaccine as well. And since the serum production takes some time, we are already planning into uh, the process of making anti-serum for this strain, provided uh, committee will approve of this strain. Coming to the next slide, next please. So as far influenza A of H3N2 type is concerned, WHO recommended virus for 23-24 Northern Hemisphere season vaccine is same as for that recommended for 22-23 Northern Hemisphere season. And it's also same as the, the, which was recommended for 20-23 Southern Hemisphere season. For egg-based vaccine, WHO recommends that A Darwin 9 2021 H3N2 like virus be used in the vaccine and WHO recommendation for cell culture or recombinant based vaccine is an A Darwin 6 2021 like virus. So since these strains have been used for past two season, um, candidate vaccine viruses, many of them are available and have been successfully used in past vaccine production campaigns and they are all listed on WHO website. Next slide, please. So if, again, every time I have to reiterate that, if committee approves of uh, this strain to be included for um, in the vaccine for US campaigns, uh, I'd like to give you an idea about the potency testing reagents which are available for testing of vaccines. Uh, as always, we work in collaboration with essential regulatory laboratories all over and to ensure that reagents are available for testing. Here in the table, I have listed all the reagents which are required for testing of vaccines made in different platform. Just want to highlight what we have available in our stocks is for the A Darwin 9 cell based uh, reagents for A Darwin 9 scented uh, CVV. At the same time, we have the reagents, both reference antigen as well as antiserum available for A Darwin 11 2021 cell platform, as well as A Darwin 6 2021 uh, for the recombinant platform. Uh, additional reagents are also available for various different uh, reassertants or viruses from our uh, ERL partners as well. Next slide, please. Coming to the influenza B for the, from the Victoria lineage, WHO recommended virus for 23-24 Northern Hemisphere season for both trivalent and quadrivalent vaccine is same as the one for 22-23 Northern Hemisphere and, the, and what was for 20-23 Southern Hemisphere season. WHO recommends that for egg-based vaccine, uh, B Austria 1359417-2021, like virus be used for cell culture or recombinant vaccine is the same virus, same virus which is MDCK cell derived. Again, uh, candidate vaccine viruses, many are available and uh, as for H3N2, these have been uh, used in past vaccine production campaigns. Next slide, please. Just to give an idea about that if this strain was included in how are we going to be dealing with and what are the reagents available for it, these strains. Again, I would like to point out that for past campaigns, uh, we have produced re reagents for for the egg platform, I'm not in the interest of time. I'm not going to read all the uh, details of it, but yes, B Michigan 01 2021, which is a B Austria like antigen and was used in vaccine. CBER had may provided uh, reagents for testing of those vaccines. At the same time, we had prepared uh, reference antigen reagents for B Singapore WUH4618 2021, which is a B Austria-like antigen and was used in cell platform, and as well as for B Austria reference antigen that okay, strain, which was used in recombinant platform. So all these reagents are available from CBER currently. 
There are other reagents as well available as well, which are listed on the table from our ERL partners as well. Next slide, please. So coming to the second B strain, which is from the B Yamagata lineage, uh, WHO recommended virus for 2023-24, now that here we have season is same as the one which was for uh, Northern Hemisphere campaign last year and as well as for the ongoing Southern Hemisphere season. And as all of us, we know that uh, this has been a part of vaccine for several many years. So it's a BPUKET like virus 307, B Puket 3073-2013 like virus for egg vac vaccine and same is true for the recommendation for cell and recomb recombinant vaccine. Next, please. Again, I'm listed here. If the committee approves of this inclusion in the vaccine, the reagents that will be needed for the testing of vaccines are uh, available as listed up here, reagents for egg platform testing as well as for cell and recombinant platforms are available from CBER as well as from other essential regulatory laboratories as well. So next slide, please. So I would just like to uh, conclude in saying that I've provided you the situation about the vaccine testing reagents. If the recommended WHO recommended strains are uh, approved by today's committee and are included in vaccine. Uh, just not so much for committee, but for the general audience who are listening to this uh, meeting, I just wanted to say is they can, as far as CBA reference standards and reagent availability and shipping is concerned, they can contact us at this uh, email address I have provided here. And if you have any questions regarding or you have any feedbacks or comments or any general inquiries regarding reagents or, or testing of the uh, influenza vaccine, we have our CBER influenza feedback ma mailbox and the email address is provided here. So we can be contacted and we will be happy to help it out. So all our efforts, of, we are going to direct all of our efforts to make sure that all the reagents are available in timely manner and the vaccine testing and release goes on in, 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 for the public, the vaccine testing goes on in a smooth manner. Uh, thank you, and I can take any questions. Hmm. Thank you, Dr. Joshi. Hmm. Uh, any of the committee members with questions for Dr. Joshi? Please use the raise your hand function. I do not see any raised hands. Uh, thank you, Dr. Joshi. To hear, uh, to thank provide, you. thank you. To provide comments from manufacturer uh, representatives, uh, we have Dr. Elizabeth Neumeyer. She's the director of the Technical Life Cycle Management Influenza Global Vaccine Manufacturing Science and Technology at GSK. Dr. Neumeyer. Yes, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ansali. I'm having trouble to start my video. I apologize for that. Uh, so I would first like to thank the VERPAC committee and the FDA for the opportunity uh, to share the industry perspective on influenza vaccine manufacturing. I am making this presentation on behalf of all manufacturers who supply influenza vaccine to the US market. Specifically, these are Sanofi, AstraZeneca, Securus, and GSK. Each of these manufacturers has contributed to this presentation. Next slide, please. So here is my disclosure statement. I am an employee of GlaxoSmithKline and I own shares in the company. Next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, to summarize some of the uh, key messages and uh, to give an overview of my presentation, um, I will give an overview of our vaccine production, release and distribution timelines, 
the preparations that we make together with the public health service organizations throughout the year and some insight into some of the challenges that we face as vaccine manufacturers. Next slide, please. So a successful influenza vaccination campaign is a team effort. Uh, the goal is clearly to provide an influenza vaccine that is well matched to the circulating influenza viruses in sufficient quantities and well before the start of the influenza season so that everybody uh, for whom vaccination is recommended can be protected in time. If we start from the top uh, and move around clockwise, uh, the first key success factor is to have a vaccine that is well matched to circulating strains. And we heard some uh, allusions to that already today, that the H3 virus seemed to be a good match, and, and this is visible in, in the good protection. Uh, this is, this uh, selection of well-matched strains is based on ongoing and robust surveillance of circulating influenza viruses. And this data provides the WHO and this committee with the required information to make that decision. Uh, the next circle uh, shows that the time needed to select the best strain must be balanced with the time that is needed by manufacturers to produce and distribute the vaccine before the start of the influenza season. So here it is uh, critical that strain selection and supply of candidate vaccine viruses and potency assay reagents is in time for manufacturers to evaluate the available CVVs and to select the ones that work best in our respective manufacturing processes so that sufficient quantities can be produced. All these elements play together to produce a well-matched vaccine that is available before the start of the influenza season in sufficient quantities to protect all those who need it. Next slide, please. This slide uh, gives an overview of the influenza detections uh, reported to FluNet in the United States. Uh, since 2019, meaning before the start of the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. The pattern clearly shows the impact uh, that the COVID-19 pandemic had on flu circulation. After the onset uh, in 2019-20, there were very few cases during the 2020-21 season. However, there were isolated pockets of influenza activity and uh, antigenic drift continued uh, so that antigenically distinct variants uh, evolved even though influenza circulation was very low. Influenza activity resumed then late in the 2021-22 influenza season, but went on far into the first half of 2022 in an unusual biphasic curve. Now in, the, in this influenza season, the 22-23 season, we saw an early onset of influenza circulation with a very high peak that uh, for the influenza detections exceeded the pre-COVID uh, level, but dropped off early rapidly in January. And we heard all about it from Dr. Groskopf and, and Dr. Wentworth. Uh, influenza uh, circulation appears not to have returned to the pattern that we were used to seeing before COVID-19. But although circulation has been low and irregular in some seasons, the evolution has continued and required updates uh, to, the to the vaccine composition. <clears throat> Next slide, please. So if we look back at the uh, Northern Hemisphere 22-23 season, uh, there were two strain changes recommended uh, by the WHO and confirmed by this committee. Uh, both components had already been a component of the preceding 2022 Southern Hemisphere vaccine. 
That means that uh, candidate vaccine viruses and potency reagents for the new strains were readily available at the time of the vaccine recommendation and their availability was not a limiting factor in the production campaign. So the 2021-22 season was not one of the more challenging ones uh, because virus and reagents were available early and also an important factor, the, the new viruses had acceptable yield in, in the manufacturing processes. Next slide, please. This slide gives a, a snapshot of the main activities that occur each season uh, that have to be done uh, to achieve the US supply timeline. Many of you may recognize this slide. We have used it in, in previous years already. So in order to meet the vaccine demand, manufacturers begin to produce at least one of the three or four vaccine components at risk before the vaccine strain selection meetings. And uh, to mitigate that risk, we use surveillance data that is available at the time. Uh, this is shown in the yellow bar. And uh, just a general comment, the, the slide is broken down into the upper panel, which shows the activities that go on in public health sector. And the lower uh, part of the graph shows the activities that are part of influenza vaccine manufacturing. So once the annual strain selection meeting occurs, and it is shown as the blue triangle on top of the graph, once uh, that meeting occurs, production of all vaccine component begins. And of course, if there is a strain change, we have to start with producing new working, vi uh, vac working virus seeds. And uh, in parallel, uh, potency assay reagents are produced uh, by our public health partners. So uh, since we can only produce, or since we start to produce these working seed viruses, once the vaccine composition is confirmed, uh, this already emphasizes how important it is to have these uh, viruses available early. Um, production continues then with all four components. Not all four components may have the same yield, so different uh, amounts of um, uh, of batches may be needed. Towards the end of the campaign, balancing uh, of manufacturing is done to ensure that we have equal amounts of each vaccine component produced. And the antigen yield of the, of the least productive vaccine strain is actually the rate limiting factor and determines the number of vaccine doses that are supplied and also the supply timelines. In order to formulate the vaccine, uh, which is shown by the blue triangle uh, just between May and June, and, and the arrow that is pointing down from the, from the public to the uh, manufacturing section. Um, so in order to start blending the vaccine components, we need potency reagents, and we start immediately once those are available. Um, but of course, we need to wait until these are available from the health authorities. So again, a very critical uh, time point in the manufacturing campaign. Uh, when after secondary manufacturing has started, formulation, filling, packaging and distribution can start. And this process extends into the fall uh, when vaccination is recommended. Uh, you can see from the slide that it takes about six months to manufacture, release, and start distribution of the, of the volumes of vaccine doses that are required for the season. The timelines are very compressed. In a period of eight months, we have to supply, so all the, all the manufacturers have to supply a total of up to 200 million doses to the U.S. market. And... Uh, most manufacturers uh, also supply other countries uh, and the total volume that is produced and distributed globally is more than 500 million doses. 
Early demand planning is very critical to ensure sufficient supply of vaccine because uh, once the campaign is, is planned and ongoing, it is next to impossible uh, to produce more volumes than have been planned well before the season. If any of the components in these timelines start to slip, it will impact vaccine delivery for the annual vaccination campaign um, and, uh, and will delay uh, the volumes that are available to the patients. So in summary, influenza vaccine manufacturing is determined by the need to distribute and administer vaccine well before the season peak, the availability of the candidate viruses and critical potency reagents for the vaccine suppliers. Next slide, please. The seasonal influenza vaccine supply requires a well-coordinated uh, timing uh, among a, a number of key players. And some time ago, uh, we came up with this analogy of a relay race, um, where members of the team take turns performing their roles. So the race starts with the strain selection process uh, by WHO collaborating centers, the essential regulatory laboratories, and the high yield reassorting laboratories who then hand off the baton to the manufacturers. At the time of the strain selection, manufacturers, as I said, have already started to produce vaccine at risk and we are at full speed when the handoff occurs of the new strains and the new formulation. There are some special challenging for influenza production in this relay race, and this includes multiple candidate vaccine viruses, production of multiple reagents, and also multiple vaccine types multiple providers such as WHO collaborating centers, essential regulatory laboratories and high yield reassorting laboratories. For each season, we are also facing hurdles that can be specific for that season. For example, in the 2022-23 season, we had two strain changes for H1N1 and H3N2. However, as I said, uh, CVVs and reagents were readily available, so there were no delays uh, due to the availability of these critical components. The Nagoya Protocol, which I will discuss in some more detail in a couple of slides, can also impact timely availability of the best matched vaccine virus or DNA sequence. In the 22-23 season, the CBVs were not impacted by the Nagoya Protocol. For the 2023-24 season, if we take an outlook, the WHO recommended to change the H1 and 1 component. If this committee uh, follows the WHO recommendation, new CVVs and reagents will be needed for the H1 and 1 vaccine component. And D Dr. Joshi, uh, just before my talk, uh, already uh, laid out some of the details for this process. For the currently available CVVs for the new H1 and 1 component, we also do not expect issues uh, coming from the Nagoya protocol. I think this is a good time point to take the opportunity to really thank our collaborators in the public health sector and to acknowledge the successful collaboration we had over many years, which enables manufacturers to provide the required number of doses at the time when they're needed. So thank you very much on behalf of all the manufacturers that supply the US market. Next thank slide, you. please. <laughs> So here uh, I'm showing the cumulative number of doses distributed in the United States over the last three influenza season. Uh, we can see at the, uh, at the first data point 
that a relatively high volume was available early in the season. And uh, if we move on uh, through the timeline, the most of the required doses have been largely distributed by November. To date, in the current season, approximately 175 million doses have been distributed. This is comparable to the 2021-22 season, but it falls short of the flu season of 2020-21. On the next slide, this is even more visible. If we can move to the next slide, please. Thank you. So here we see two graphs that show the uh, cumulated dis uh, number of doses distributed to the US market over time. And if we start with the bottom right graph, it shows the evolution of the vaccine demand over the last 40 years. So there has been a steady increase uh, and an, uh, an overall rise in the total doses over time. However, it also shows what I just said, the drop after the 2020-21 season. And uh, you will notice that the graph stops with the 21-22 season. So we expect either the same level or potentially even lower for the current season. Apparently, the influenza vaccination uptake has also been slower and lower than in previous seasons, and I cannot speculate what the reasons are for that. But it is critical to understand that the supply of vaccine doses is driven by demand, and it is very critical to emphasize the importance of vaccination for all groups for which vaccination is recommended. Um, I mentioned it earlier that planning of production volumes occurs well before the influenza season and higher volumes cannot be produced at short notice, for example, if a severe influenza season is expected. Next slide, please. So to summarize uh, our review of the 22-23 season, um, we had a very high influenza peak early in the season. Influenza vaccine was available early. The vaccine demand was lower compared to previous years. And uh, as we also heard uh, the good news that in this season, the flu vaccine provided substantial protection, which is what we're all working towards. Next slide, please. So I'm now switching gears and I will present a few slides on the Nagoya protocol and the impact of the Nagoya protocol on seasonal influenza. Just to provide uh, a little bit of background, the Nagoya protocol on access and benefit sharing is an international treaty supplementary to the Convention on Biological Diversity, CBD, which was adopted in 2010 with the objective of fair and equitable sharing of benefits arising from the utilization of genetic resources, thereby contributing to the conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. An increasing number of countries have enacted Nagoya Protocol and or national ABS, uh, so access and benefit uh, sharing legislation. And in many cases, genetic sequence data are now included within scope. Next slide, please. In, uh, for the influenza surveillance in the influenza surveillance network, most national influenza centers continue to supply influenza viruses under the agreed terms of reference as part of the global influenza surveillance and response um, system, GISRs. However, there is often a lack of legal clarity if the viruses can be used for vaccine manufacturing and research. If we look uh, at, the at the two world maps and compare the locations of the national influenza centers in the WHO GISRs and the country
countries uh, that are party to the Nagoya Protocol. Uh, that's the map on the right hand. It is very clear that there are already significant overlaps. And as more countries become party to the Nagoya Protocol, this um, may have an, uh, an impact on increasing number of national influenza centers that supply viruses to the, uh, to the WHO network. Next slide, please. If we take a step back uh, and look at the glo more global impact of the Nagoya Protocol, it is uh, important to realize that the sharing of pathogens and their associated information must be fast, easy, and legally certain. In recent years, national uh, Nagoya and other access and benefit sharing legislation requiring bilateral negotiations has created significant bureaucratic hurdles, which make it increasingly difficult to achieve. There are already more than 100 distinct ABS laws around the world, which uh, potentially impose legal requirements for benefit sharing that companies must navigate in return for access to pathogens. Although Nag the Nagoya Protocol recognizes the importance of public health, only 12 countries out of 137 um, have ABS rules uh, that include a public health emergency provision, which is critical for rapid and unimpeded sharing of pathogens. This has weakened legal certainty in access to pathogen samples and sequences with negative consequences seen already in the sharing of a number of viruses, including seasonal influenza. In the case of influenza viruses since 2018, vaccine manufacturers have seen delays ranging from three weeks to nine months before being able to access around 40 important influenza samples. And if you remember the timelines I have shown previously, a delay of nine months makes a virus unusable for the current, for a given influenza season. Next slide, please. So the timely sharing of pathogen samples and information is critical and essential for responding to potential epidemics and pandemics. The inclusion of pathogens, including influenza under national ABS legislation, continues to cause delays and disruptions. Approximately 40 influenza viruses have already been impacted by national uh, Nagoya protocol or ABS legislation. Um, incurring significant delays before legal clarity could be obtained. And the legal certainty regarding the number of uh, the status of pathogens sharing is essential um, in the context of vaccine manufacturing. Next slide, please. So I'm including, or we manufacturers are including one slide on the circulation of avian influenza viruses in wild birds and poultry. Uh, this is a topic that uh, has very high attention at the moment, because since October 2021, uh, an increasing number of outbreaks of avian influenza has been reported in wild birds and poultry worldwide with uh, expanding geographic regions being impacted. Another important point is that infections of mammalian species have been reported with higher frequency. Despite all that, the risk of human health is currently still considered to be low. And uh, of course, uh, this is continuously monitored carefully. If new antigenic variants emerge, new CVVs that match these variants are prepared by the WHO network and are made available to industry. The response to a potential pandemic threat requires coordination among all stakeholders in the public and private sector and a continuous dialogue uh, to, to guide uh, the efforts of industry uh, so that we reach the best possible level of preparedness. Next slide, please. 
So to summarize, two components of the 2022-23 influenza vaccine were updated to match circulating viruses. CVVs and potency assay reagents were available early. To date, approximately 173 million influenza vaccine doses were supplied to the US market. However, it has to be noted that vaccine demand was lower compared to previous years. Influenza vaccine provided substantial protection this season. Uh, the Nagoya protocol and ABS legislation is posing an increasing challenge and impacts the ability to select and manufacture the best uh, vaccine strains. Confidence in influenza vaccination continues to be of great importance as flu circulation returns to pre-COVID-19 levels. Next slide, please. So I would like to thank you for your attention and I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you, Dr. Neumeyer. Uh, please use the raise your hand function to ask questions to Dr. Neumeyer. So I have a clarifying question. Um, the flu distribution, is the, it's also the uptake, right? Not just what went into the market, it's what went into the arms. My understanding is it's the doses distributed to the market, not necessarily what uh, has been used uh, to vaccinate. Okay. Okay, so to that I may, we may, I may have a question then to Dr. Groskov. Did we see uh, that trend, uh, you know, the distribution going year by year? Also, the uptake, has it been going year by year in the last two, three years? Do you mean, um, sorry, Dr. Rosselli, has it been increased? Has the has coverage been increasing or changing the last two, three years? Yes, uh, the distribution has mm -hmm. been decreasing according to Dr. Neumeyer's data. But that is distribution. Has the uptake also been decreasing or is it more steady in our country? Um, it depends on the group that you're talking about. There have been drops in coverage over the last two seasons, particularly in some groups, and they're, they're, they're more in some racial and ethnicity groups than others. Coverage among pregnant women has been a bit lower the last two years. So there has been some concern about drop in coverage. What about uh, individuals older than 50 or 60? Are, are we still, they used to have the best coverage. Are they still good there? In general, theirs tends to be more stable. Thank you. And then I have a question about the Nagoya protocol. I know we hear about it every year and, um, but I wonder if it has more of an impact on avian pandemic influenza than seasonal influenza, I guess in my, I guess, simplistic interpretation of what I see, that may be the case, but what, what are your thoughts on that? The, the impact is primarily on seasonal influenza uh, vaccine manufacturing and strains. Uh, at the moment for pandemic viruses, they are also in scope. However, we do have uh, uh, a framework already for the availability and distribution of zoonotic influenza viruses, the PIP framework. Um, it is still under discussion whether pandemic viruses, whether there's also obligations for pandemic viruses under the Nagoya protocol or whether that is covered by uh, the PIP framework. Okay, all right. Thank you. A couple of questions. First, Dr. Perlman. Yeah, I just had uh, t two almost technical questions. So the first with the uh, problem about getting some of the viruses shared, uh, does, do the manufacturers have the ability to use recombinant technology to just make the viruses instead of having to get them shared? Or is there something more to sharing than that? Um, to a degree that depends on the license of the manufacturers. Um, at the moment, I'm not aware that any manufacturer uses recombinant viruses, so genetically engineered viruses. And even if that were the case, um, 
uh, the sequence information is also covered by the Nagoya protocol. So even recombinant viruses uh, would fall under the Nagoya protocol potentially. That depends a little bit on the on the national legislation in the respective countries. And, and does the last statement that you made mean that if one manufacturer has a virus that the manufacturer cannot share it with other manufacturers or uh, how does that work? Um, generally speaking, the all reassortants that are prepared for seasonal influenza vaccine are available to all manufacturers. Uh, it is true that uh, genetically engineered viruses uh, have intellectual property, uh, so fall under an intellectual property rules. Uh, that would create a precedent and uh, would have to be discussed and, and agreed with the license holders the use of such viruses. In, in some countries, uh, for example, in the EU, uh, recombinant viruses uh, also fall under, would require a different uh, licensing procedure than uh, the, uh, the procedure that the current seasonal influenza vaccines are licensed under. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Monto? Uh, just a comment. Uh, uh, you beat me to it in terms of the Nagoya Protocol. It's something that comes up uh, periodically, is viewed in some ways as a potential showstopper in terms of getting vaccines, including pandemic vaccines. I remember the first time uh, I heard about it was about getting uh, H5 viruses uh, out of Indonesia some time ago. And if it truly is a problem, then it would be appropriate that we do this not in the context of just flu, but in, in the context of uh, vaccines, vaccines in general. Just a, an overall comment. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Dr. James. Thank you. Uh, uh, another point for clarification. Um, I believe that the Nagoya Protocol, as discussed, only impacts um, or, or, or should only potentially impact, um, you know, manufacturer vaccines. But I just wanted to clarify, is there any concern or potential for the Nagoya Protocol to impact um, sharing and, and characterization of viruses that are circulating in the population and, and thereby, you know, characterization of um, you know, uh, you know, circulating sequences and immunogenicity uh, associated with uh, vaccines against those sequences. Mm -hmm. Perhaps Dr. Wentworth would be best to answer that question. <laughs> yes. <Hand> raised, <laughs> Dr. Wentworth. Thanks, Elizabeth. And yeah, so there really is very little impact on the sharing of the reagents for characterization and surveillance because all of the NICs, their terms of reference really involve sharing. And we're really working, uh, the WHO Global Influenza Program is also really working with the National Influenza Centers to even update their terms of reference so they have a better understanding of the Nagoya Protocol if a uh, virus of theirs were to be selected to be manufactured as a vaccine so that we could potentially alleviate some of the process. I mean, just because you're a signatory doesn't mean it couldn't end up as a vaccine, but they have to give permission. The, the, the right authority within that country has to give permission to use it as a vaccine free and clear to the manufacturers. And so that's where the uncertainty, and it causes a lot of uncertainty. And I, I really do uh, you know, understand what the manufacturers are saying, but I really want to distinguish those two things. That's why I raised my hand, because when it comes to the um, sharing of viruses, it has very, very little impact on that. Um, it's more in the vaccine development phase. That's reassuring. Thank you, Dr. Wentworth. Um, I do not see raised hands. Any final questions to Dr. Neumeyer before break? Okay, hearing none, and I'm gonna get the time right this time. 
we have to start at 1.30 on the dot because that's the open public hearing. Uh, and it has a specified time we have to follow. So at 1.30 p.m. Eastern, uh, we... Central. Excuse me? Go ahead. 1.30 p.m. Eastern time, we reconvene for the OPH session.
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you all for joining uh, in the afternoon. Uh, next on our agenda is the open public hearing session. Uh, I will be uh, going over the open public hearing announcement uh, for particular matters involving specific parties. Welcome to the open public hearing session. Please note that both the FDA and the public believe in a transparent process for information gathering and decision making to ensure <clears throat> such transparency at the open public hearing session of the advisory committee meeting. FDA believes that it is important to understand the context of an individual's presentation. For this reason, FDA encourages you, the open public hearing speaker, at the beginning of your written or oral statement, to advise the committee of any financial relationship that you may have with the sponsor, its product, and if known, its direct competitors. For example, this financial information may include the sponsor's payment of expenses in connection with your participation in this meeting. Likewise, FDA encourages you at the beginning of your statement to advise the committee if you do not have any such financial relationship. If you choose not to address this issue of financial relationships at the beginning of your statement, it will not preclude you from speaking. I turn the meeting now to Dr. Susan Paydar. Dr. Paydar. It goes to um, Ms. Valerie Vashi. Oh, Dr. Ms. Vashi she, today. Is our, oh, she's my alternate DFO. Okay, Ms. Vashi. Thank you, Dr. Al Sally. Before I begin calling the registered speakers, I would like to add the following guidance. FDA encourages participation from all public stakeholders in its decision-making processes. Every advisory committee meeting includes an open public hearing, OPH session, during which interested persons may present relevant information or views. Participants during the OPH session are not FDA employees or members of this advisory committee. FDA recognizes that the speakers may present a range of viewpoints. The statements made during this open public hearing session reflect the viewpoints of the individual speakers or their organizations and are not meant to indicate agency agreement with the statements made. With that guidance, I would like to begin with our one OPH speaker who pre-registered for speaking today. You will only have four minutes to make your remarks, Sarah Berry. Hello, am I okay to start speaking now, I assume? Yes, Sarah. Okay, thank you very much. Um, uh, yes, my name is Sarah Berry. I'm the Volunteer Director of Research and Media Relations for Safe Communities Coalition, and I have no known con conflicts. Um, next. Uh, Dear committee, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Um, I want to note that I am the volunteer director of research and media relations for SAFE. And I think that that's important context for later in this presentation. Next. Safe Communities Coalition is still a relatively new organization that was started by grassroots vaccine advocates who, like myself, saw the influence of anti-vaccine and anti-science rhetoric taking over. As a nonpartisan organization, we support any common sense public health legislation and candidates who will fight to pass it. Next. I had previously given a presentation to this committee regarding anti-vaccine lobbying, and today is simply an update to that information. Next. Uh, next. Anti-vaxxers represent a cultural force that goes beyond questions about vaccines. As we shared last time, there are numerous anti-vaccine 501c3s, c4s, LLCs, and PACs that work often in tandem with one another to accomplish an overall anti-public health agenda. Next. However, these groups are also the source and funding behind numerous petty lawsuits, and that's a trend we've seen growing. As the director of research for SAFE, I see firsthand how many active lawsuits are a direct result of anti-vaccine efforts. Um, next. Um, 
these these lawsuits, again, the anti-vaxxers themselves are quite candid about the origin and purpose of these lawsuits. And these lawsuits often target public health employee uh, and, and, uh, agencies and their employees. And regardless of whether a lawsuit is successful, the mental strain and financial burden is real. Those are resources and time that could be spent on other more legitimate efforts. Um, the most alarming example I have found of this involves an attorney general who is working directly with local anti-vaxxers and openly displayed anti-vaccine propaganda while deposing Dr. Fauci. Next. Now, I know that sounded kind of scary, but the good news is that SAFE is working in partnership with other grassroots groups, such as Louisiana Families for Vaccines. Louisiana Families pushed back against the rising tide of anti-vaccine legislation in their state by showing up with friendly faces and important information. And because of their efforts, all of the anti-vaccine legislation in Louisiana was successfully killed in 2022. We're obviously hoping for a repeat of that in 2023. Next. The bad news is that anti-vaccine extreme extremism is growing, and we've seen that we've seen with that a rise in the total number of vaccine-related legislation introduced all over the United States. Montana is in particularly bad shape as they are currently debating a bill that would prohibit COVID vaccinated persons from donating blood, and they are the first state poised to expand non-medical exemptions to routine school immunizations in over 20 years. I can confirm that not only are the anti-vaccine groups working hard to get these bills on Montana passed, but they're also doing so with direct assistance of the legislators in that state. Next. Without naming names, I think it's important to put into perspective how much the largest anti-vaccine organization is spending on their efforts to roll back public health. Next. After going through publicly available job listings, I estimate that the largest anti-vaccine organization is at an absolute minimum, spending 1.3 million a year just on payroll. All of these job listings offered insurance and 401k, but without knowing the quality of those benefits, I simply excluded them from this estimate. If we were to include benefits, travel, events, and the copious amounts of money they are spending on lawyers, my best guess for their yearly operating budget is no less than 10 million. Next. Yes, one anti-vaccine organization, just one, is almost certainly spending at minimum $10 million a year. And that might seem like a scary number. And truth be told, I hope it scares you just a little bit. Some of you are probably wondering how they can afford such a large budget. budget. And I can confidently tell you it's because this same organization, by my estimate, has raked in well over $20 million in the past few years. And uh, some of those uh, pieces of information, it's hard to quantify that because certain financial documents, uh, 990s, have not become public knowledge yet. But I imagine that our understanding of exactly what this anti-vaccine ecosystem looks like will change as more of this information comes out next. Um, so Safe Communities Coalition is a team of three and one volunteer, and that is me. Um, and as I said, I do not get paid. I, I you know, have no conflicts of interest. I am a volunteer. I do this out of my own time and, and passion for this issue and for how much I care about it. And I see how much more resources the anti-vaxxers have versus all vaccine advocates. And I'm not just talking about Safe Communities Coalition. I do not think, but this is just the estimates I gave you were from one organization. If we were to take the totality of all of the anti-vaccine organizations that are working together, I mean, that that number, I, I, I wouldn't even know where to start. Um, so I just want to emphasize the importance of promoting vaccine, uh, pro-vaccine legislation, promoting pro-science candidates. Um, and uh, obviously, Safe Communities Coalition is here as a resource for anybody, whether it's the people on this call or anybody listening now in the future. Um, you know, please reach out to Safe Communities Coalition. We have excellent information. I can attest to that um, from firsthand knowledge. Excellent information on um, the anti-vaccine movement and uh, where the pro-vaccine movement is going as far as um, legislation and lobbying. So I really thank you all for your time. And if you have any questions, uh, please email them to us at info at safecommunitiescoalition.org. Thank you very much. 
Thank you, Sarah, for your comments today and your presentation. We appreciate it. This concludes the open public hearing session for today. And now I hand over the meeting back to our chair, Dr. Al Sali. Could you please start the next session? Thank you, Ms. Vashio. <clears throat> so during the next portion of our meeting for which we have dedicated one hour, um, we will be discussing the four questions uh, that uh, we will be voting on. Um, Dr. Paydar, should we display them or just begin the discussions first? Uh, we need to display the four questions and discuss them. All right, let's display. Okay, so um, here are the four questions to be discussed today. I'm gonna go over them uh, first. Um, question one, for the influenza AH1N1 component of the 2324 influenza virus vaccines in the US, does the committee recommend an A Victoria 4897 2022 H1N1 PDM09 like virus for egg-based vaccine? Uh, and A, Wisconsin, 67-2019-H1N1-PDM09 like virus for cell re or recombinant-based vaccine. And that is a change for the influenza AH3N2 component of the 2023-2024 influenza virus vaccine in the U.S. Does the committee recommend an A, Darwin, 9-2021-H3N2 like virus, egg-based vaccine, an A, Darwin, 6 2021 H3N2 like virus cell or recombinant based vaccine. Um, for the influenza B component of the 23 24 trivalent and quadrivalent influenza virus vaccines in the US, does the committee recommend the inclusion of, an, of a B Austria 1359417 2021 like virus B Victoria lineage? And for the quadrivalent 2324 influenza vaccines in the US, does the does the committee recommend inclusion of a B few cat 3073 2013 like virus B Yamagata lineage as the second influenza B strain in the vaccine? So I invite uh, our committee members to uh, raise the use the raise your hand function so I can see who has a question. And I think all of our uh, presenters from this morning and the FDA uh, are present to help uh, answer questions uh, uh, or, or listen to our comments. I see the first hand uh, by Dr. Gans. Thank you so much, um, Hannah. I'm gonna leave my camera off if that's okay. Um, I um, really appreciated all of the really um, in-depth um, presentations that we had this morning and usually have during this meeting and really gets us to um, be able to review the data that actually would obviously contribute to these um, questions. So I am in support of the re recommendations that come forth from the thorough work that the WHO and um, CDC and our other um, colleagues um, put forth. I do want, just because we seem to always be in the same um, situation, these are highly effective um, mechanisms for helping public health, obviously, and vaccination is the way to go. And we have these um, vaccines that are helpful in really contributing to the um, particularly severe outcomes, as we've heard. I just want to put in the record some of the things that have been discussed previously, but uh, apparently we need to get them into the public record that um, we really do need to um, move the conversation forward. And that includes from the epi side, more sub subtype testing. And a lot of that was already raised that that is being done, but we really need to be able to 
understand the strains and clades that are moving this forward and how we um, choose these. We need more nuanced information in terms of what, how to break down some of the epi data, not just taking a, a hammer to it. Um, and that includes different um, populations who may be at more risk and more value of these vaccines and some of the more nuanced outcomes in terms of ICU and mortality. We also need information has been raised that influenza doesn't circulate alone and what are some of the co-viral infections or other co-infections. Um, we also obviously from the immunology standpoint, which we've been talking about for a long time, even though we call um, the humoral immunity, these correlates of infection, we need more nuanced information about immunology and T cells. We've been asking for a very long time. And we also need the studies that would allow us to move the um, components of the vaccine forward, as we've discussed with the H3N2. Um, it seems that our inability to get, um, you know, that information maybe has allowed the H3N2, which now we see is predominating. Um, we really maybe allowed that to happen because we've done such a good job with the other ones. And obviously there's other environmental um, stre uh, stressors that are going or impacts that are going along with that. And lastly, I think what I um, would love to see, and I'm sure other people on the committee, but I won't speak for them, is to really bring forward um, also the continued and great work that's being done looking at the safety of these vaccines, which we know are incredibly safe. And it would be lovely to have those that data um, that we know um, is collected globally as well, really come forward and discussed when we're looking at um, these vaccines so that we could look at all the data together. So I appreciate the work that has been done. I appreciate the conversations um, that we've been having to move this discussion forward. And I just want to put that into record. Thank you, Dr. Gans, for, for, for the summary and the comments. Uh, I have a question uh, from the morning uh, to Dr. Wentworth. It's more of a, a clarification uh, regarding the, the process. So what we saw that for the H1N1, the ferret sera, uh, there was, wasn't much of a distinction between uh, the, the Victoria of last year. Is it Victoria? Yes, the Victoria of last year and the currently circulating strains. However, when we used human sera, we did detect a divergence in the antigenicity uh, between the vaccine that was used last year and the circulating strains. And, uh, and, and, and I think as I understand it, it has to do with the recognition of the epitope kind of in the Northeast of the, of the HA as you displayed it for us. Uh, but what if the reverse is true? Let's say, the ferret data would show divergence, significant divergence between the strain used previously in the vaccine and what's uh, beginning to circulate. Yet the human data don't show that divergence by virtue of recognizing other epitopes. Would, would, what, how would that have changed recommendations or would it? Yeah, that's an interesting hypothetical question. Oh, so and it doesn't what, happen? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, it is. It doesn't really happen. So the ferret is a model, an animal model, and it, like all animal models, is imperfect. And what we've grown to understand is with the H1N1 PDM09 viruses in particular, um, it tends to be quite immunodominant to that site SA side of life and not as immunodominant to the SB side. So you were dead on in your in your question. So now let's imagine that that inverse happened. We're seeing distinction in the ferret, but we're not seeing it in uh, humans. So there, there would be the triangulation of multiple types of data. So you have the genetic data of all the viruses that are circulating and the evolution that you're seeing there, which is kind of a reflection of 
generally immune escape. I mean, that's the biggest fitness driver in humans for influenza drive influenza viruses is immune escape. And so sometimes you might see parallel evolution that's happening that's in agreement with the ferret data or in disagreement with the ferret data. So you would have you would have that aspect of it. Then we would take the human sera and we would break it down, right? So if you were to look at the zero the the six month to 36 month old age group in humans, and you're not seeing something that the ferrets are seeing, that would suggest that the ferret model is actually incorrect in that scenario. Mm. Um, and to top it off, if you had um, VE that was consistent with H1VE, and you had those viruses co-circulating at the time. So that's a there's kind of a ifs there. Sometimes you don't have enough of the variant that's co-circulating for VE to be an estimate. But if VE wasn't changing, then you would believe the human side of the equation. But if the opposite was true, we're seeing it in naive naive kids. There is uh, evolution happening that's really really looking like this is an, an, a fitness advantage. And we use a lot of different tools there in the genetic space, local branching index. So how many changes are happening in that site? Known epitopes and crystallography with human monoclonal antibodies, understanding that they're in known epitopes is very important. That's why I show the molecular structures and point out certain amino acids. And so it would really be it's never just one piece of data. It's the triangulation of multiple pieces of data. And then finally, kind of getting to some of our discussions here, which population would be at greatest risk? And does that population you know, suffer severe disease from that particular subtype? And so that might also influence where you'd want to de-risk you know, you'd want to err on the side of caution for a, an age group, like over 65 or under three or something like that. Hmm. Did that Okay, I guess we'll, we'll, we'll wait on some committee meeting in the future for that. Yeah, I mean, there. <laughs> I think basically there's going to always be times where the ferrets don't quite pull something apart uh, or more often humans are are just very fuzzy because we have so much prior history in our immune response and very few antigens are given to humans, right? So we can give ferrets every new emerging virus, whereas we can't do that with humans. Okay. All right. Thank you. Dr. Portnoy. Great. Thank you. Um, I, I have a comment and then a question for Dr. Wentworth. My comment is that uh, we, we've been meeting I've been meeting with this committee for a number of years now. And at the end of the last vaccine committee meeting for the Southern Hemisphere, we sent very strong recommendations to the pharmaceutical companies that they should consider uh, looking at other strains, maybe trying to get a, a new licensure or a modification of the licensure that they have. And it doesn't seem to me like any progress has been made on that. We're still basically allowed to vote on these same four types of questions that we've been voting on all along. Um, my, I guess one, one concern I have is that if we decide to vote no on one of these, let's say number two, we say no. Well, what, what's the option then? Is there another option that we could vote for? I thought that we have to kind of be in harmony with the whole planet, with the WHO. And so if we say no, there's not really an alternative. We, we kind of have to vote yes. Yeah, so I'm not sure that that we even are given an option for that. I, I would kind of like to hear a comment about that. My question for Dr. Wentworth is, um, uh, kind of I asked it before, do you have any information about cell-mediated immunity and um, human responses to influenza? How durable is an immune response to influenza vaccine? Is that dependent on the strain or the individual or what determines that? Uh, how long before the flu season should someone get the vaccine and not, and not worry about it wearing off before they actually get, get the influenza. Do, do we have information about that? Dr. Wentworth, this is Lisa. I can take that if you like. That would be great. Is your, is well, okay? actually, I think the first part is for FDA and the second part is for us, but it'd be great if you start on on the second one too. Re referring to the waning immunity question. Yeah, yeah. Um, 
There are there are a lot of studies on that currently, and while there does seem to be some waning of immunity, the the results sort of depend on um, a number of things. One is seems to be more common among older adults. Um, there aren't as many studies of people at the extreme the other extreme of age, children, um, and the results are kind of mixed with kids. It seems like it might be more common with H3N2 than with H1N1. It does raise some complications with regard to policy recommendations for timing of vaccination, because as we've seen, sometimes we have early seasons. Um, we did have an early season this season, but we've it wasn't the first time that that's happened um, over the last 40 seasons or so, roughly between 1982 and, and 2021. Um, there were there was one that peaked in October and one that peaked in November and others that peaked in December. So it's it's not unheard of. Um, so recommendations for timing the vaccination are somewhat made a little tricky by those things. Um, but there, there is general acceptance, I think, that there is waning, but it's not seen in every study consistently and it's not seen across populations consistently. Do these vaccines and, create cell-mediated immunity? Do you know? Yeah, maybe I can I can chime in there on the cell mediated piece, unless Lisa wants to. Okay, so um, yes, they do, and the uh, natural infection creates cell mediated immunity, and as you're clearly aware, cell mediated immunity is is kind of a much trickier thing to analyze in high throughput fashion. There's a number of uh, extramurally funded investigators from the U.S. government, primarily through NIH, as well as many other investigators globally that study T-cell recognition of influenza viruses. And so, you know, cell-mediated recognition, but by primarily through T-cell recognition. And when the way that's working is, you know, many small peptides of every protein of the virus are really uh, generated to make TCR, you know, recognition epitopes and some more prevalent than others. And flu does actually slowly mutate to evade those, uh, you know, some of the primary ones. But really, when you consider cell mediated immunity, uh, you know, most of what flu is doing and the annual level is in response to antibody mediated immunity. And so that the cell mediated piece is, imp I'm not trying to discount it because obviously it's an important arm of our immune system and likely pays a big role in protection from severe disease and clearance of infection. So after the acute phase of infection, you know, uh, cytotoxic T lymphocytes and, and T helper cells are really important in generating new, you know, killing off virus infected cells and general generating new uh, antibodies um, through T cell help and things. But anyway, um, when it comes to the vaccine part, you know, selecting uh, antigens, what I showed you is that HA molecule, 566 amino acids, three or four are different, six are different, right? This is not going to kill off a T cell response, right? You see what I mean? So this is why, you know, the updates are primarily driven because what we're, what we're trying to do is protect people from infection and then symptomatic disease and then, of course, severe disease. Um, and so the, the, the short of it is a lot of the T cells will work regardless of which antigen we select. Okay. You know, they'll get stimulated and boosted by almost any antigen we pick. There might be one new prime to something like Darwin, where um, the linear part of that epitope, which you're seeing in three dimensions, is actually quite different and, and spurs new T cell recognition, for example. Thank you. And what, what happens if we vote no on one of these? Oh, yeah. So that, I think, is really a question for uh, FDA. And my, my interpretation would be it's a question of, are you saying vote no on a strain antigen yeah, what selection? If, what, if we, what if I don't think that the A Darwin 92021 okay. Should be used this year. What's okay. I mean, why are we being I, I, asked? To, why are we being asked these right. questions? I'll I'll turn it over to Dr. Weir, and then I may I may follow up, Dr. Weir, because I could add to something maybe. Okay, so yes, we we have maybe I didn't say this at the start. I, I think I usually do. Uh, generally, we put these out as a starting point, and if 
uh, the committee should vote no, then I think the committee would have to come up with an option, a proposal for something else to vote on. Uh, might not be that easy, but I think that would be how it would have to work because, again, these are licensed vaccines with four components, and it's our job to select something. So I think it would be incumbent upon you, the rest of the committee, that voted no to offer an alternative. Uh, I Like I said, we usually do this, and we just assume we would deal with it if, if that happens. Uh, can I make one comment about the T-cell recognition, though, uh, just to throw something out? Um, one of the things that was noted many, many years ago is that particularly a CD8 response to influenza was mostly directed, if not all, directed against uh, internal proteins, which, of course, are not in any sort of uh, are not really included in the current vaccines. And in fact, vaccines that are subunits that are proteins like this don't actually induce a very good uh, CD8 T cell response anyway. So it's not that it's not important, it's not, but it's probably a fairly minor component um, of this type of vaccines. Over. Thank you. Dr. Bernstein. Uh, thank you. I, I had a question for Dr. Wentworth and one for Dr. Fries. Um, I, re I recall, I think, last year, I, I mean, you present such detail and so extensively, it's incredibly impressive. And I remember, I believe, last year and then again this year that the 5A1 is lower in the pediatric population, again, the response uh, particularly children six months through 35 months of age. And I was wondering, how does that relate, if at all, to the fact that there's a higher than average number of pediatric deaths, for example? And how should that be considered, if at all? Okay, thank you for that question. Really uh, insightful. So the 5A1s, the vaccine, of course, which we ruminated more on last last time around was 5A1 versus 5A2 because the 5A1s had made a kind of a rebounding effect. But the, the likelihood from the committee's perspective uh, and the, the WHO committee's perspective was that it was going to decline and it, it has declined tremendously. Um, the... The reason you see that in that age group is because and this is this is the case where that age group is a little more like a naive animal model in that the 5A1s and 5A2s are very antigenically distinct to a naive host, but they both come from a 5A background. So they, they both have the same kind of progenitor viruses and the 5A1 circulated prior to the 5A2s. And so as you get into the older age groups, they've been, they've been either vaccinated and or infected by 5A and 5A1 viruses. And that's why when we um, boost with a 5A2, a lot of those conserved epitopes across them are are likely being reactivated. And so we do see neutralization. So that the gist of it is exactly why we see neutralization. Maybe I'm I'm uh, reaching a little bit into immunological memory. That's the most likely scenario. But we see that any of those older age groups now neutralize the 5A1 viruses as well. And so then with the pediatric deaths, I don't, we don't I actually don't have the numbers for H3 caused pediatric deaths and H1 caused pediatric deaths this year. I uh, maybe Dr. Groskopf does, but we had pretty even co circulation of those two. That's being monitored. What, what Dr. Groskopf showed was from the United States, where we had an overwhelming amount of 5A2 viruses. So those pediatric deaths are likely actually not vaccinated um, generally, and we don't get that information, I think, until later in the season, but generally about 80% of the pediatric deaths are non-vaccinated uh, individuals. Um, and so I don't think that the 5A, the loss of recognition in the 5A1 group was the re reason we saw those pediatric deaths. I know they were a mixture of H3 and H1 because we had so much H3 circulating early. Um, and there were some pediatric deaths then. 
And we didn't have that much in the way of 5A1 viruses in the United States. Thank you. And then I had a question for Dr. Uh, freeze. It's not directly related to strain selection, but I. But uh, the question that I had is: you mentioned that in the military that there um, that flu vaccine is compulsory, and I was wondering whether that included their dependents and children uh, from six months of age on up, and also for those that are. Um, the six percent that are not vaccinated, what exemptions are accepted? Uh, thanks for the question. I can for the first point, no, it is only the active duty component that is required. So the kids and other dependents um, are not required. As to the distribution of those six percent, I know there are religious exemptions. I know that there are other people on this call, perhaps a uh, Dr. Badsick may be able to speak more directly to other uh, exemption components of that. But um, yeah, I don't know exactly that distribution. I do know that religious and or uh, well, yeah, I guess the only one I can say for a certainty is the religious uh, and 94% is typically, I've seen higher numbers. I've seen 97% in some of the services. So I'll just state that as well, that they're not always uh, that 6% each year. I hope that helps, sir. Yeah, thank you. And do you um, use, uh, we periodically talk about exploring vaccination history over a number of years, uh, looking at different issues. Has the military, the group that since they're getting vaccinated, annually and being part of the military? Have they been explored as far as the impact of uh, vaccination history? Yeah, now I do know that that is an active uh, research avenue. And I'll confirm that uh, one of my colleagues just texted and said that it was it is primarily religious and medical exemptions uh, for the, the avoidance of um, those the, that for that 6%. As to the active research towards uh, vaccination history, as I think I alluded to in the end of my talk, is that, yeah, this is an extremely heavily vaccinated. We know all of the, you know, a, a good portion of the vaccination record uh, that does, you know, offer some insight into, especially in congregate settings, like a Naval Academy situation where an H3N2 outbreak occurred at the beginning of the 21-22 season, uh, it does offer some unique perspective as to, you know, what protection is provided by the vaccines. But um, as to specific efforts, those are in collaboration with folks at NIH uh, and the CDC in terms of, you um, you know, how, how those heavily vaccinated rates might impact vaccine or, you know, sort of antibody generation. I will say that there have been discussions, you know, about, you know, and I don't want to overspeak, and this is purely me just uh, anecdotally saying that there have been discussions about not vaccinating every year in certain populations to see whether it gets a better response. Um, but there would have to be a tremendous amount of data to support that uh, policy. And I'll just say that people are examining that and our colleagues at CDC and NIH are helping over. Thank you. Dr. Berger. Thanks. This is a question for Dr. Neumeyer, actually. Uh, so, you know, Dr. Neumeyer, you, you laid out a, a, a really tight timeline for being able to deliver the influenza doses that are going to be manufactured. Um, and you also mentioned that there's a total of around 500 million total doses that are being delivered worldwide. I, I guess what I'm trying to think about is if, you know, what, what's the capacity for developing uh, discordance uh, vaccines with whatever is going to be eventually you know, the, the licensed vaccine and used in order to facilitate some of the research that's needed here to understand the, the you know, to generate the evidence base to be able to make a change to the existing licensure. 
So, uh, you know, what is the capacity to be able to generate those additional doses that would be needed for that? Is is the 500 you know million currently the the maximum that you're already at? You know, is there additional capacity that's needed to be able to facilitate this? I'm just curious what kind of um, capabilities that industry would have to be uh, able to conduct the clinical research that's necessary here. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question. Uh, so the development of a, of a quadrivalent vaccine with a different composition than the licensed one is a development project, uh, similar to the move from trivalent to quadrivalent. Um, so I, I think I can say that the development will not interfere with commercial production and provision of the volumes that are required uh, in the US market and globally. <clears throat> Um, if we speak about, if I understood your question right, it was primarily about development, but potentially also about different vaccine compositions in the market. That would be a real challenge um, because in, in that case, we would have to produce not only four, but potentially five or more components. So I, I, can't, I cannot speculate on those scenarios, but that would be a real challenge, if not impossible. Thanks, and, and that's kind of what I'm trying to figure out is, you know, right now the licensure seems to be that it has to be one A H1 N1, one H3N2, uh, a B Victoria and a B Yamagata lineage. And so what we heard earlier when we were speaking with Dr. Wentworth was we don't really know what the proper um, composition is going to be at the end of the day. And so there might be the need to generate different types of vaccine compositions to be able to have, you know, at least in my mind, a licensure that could allow for greater flexibility uh, in being responsive to whatever vac uh, whatever virus happens to be circulating and is likely going to be the most, uh, most impactful for any given season. So I, I'm trying to understand, like, what's the, what's the clinical research side of this look like and how much can you actually, you know, are you able to respond to be able to develop that? So thank you. Well, as I said, the development would be comparable to uh, the development of the quadrivalent after the trivalent vaccine. So we would have to generate, first of all, the analytical tools to analyze two closely related, antigenically distinct, but still closely related H3 components, for example. Uh, then uh, preclinical and clinic, uh, clinical data would be needed to uh, to find out whether there is any type of interference uh, between the different components to make sure that the immune response to all the components is, is there. Um, it was mentioned earlier today already that it is conceivable that uh, if two H3 components are included in the vaccine, the, uh, the immune response would be predominantly directed to the uh, conserved epitopes and not to the epitopes that have uh, changed during antigenic drift. So all these things, we don't know them today, and they would have to be part of the research program to develop a, a vaccine with a different composition than the one we have today. Thank you. Dr. Perman? Yeah, I had a, a couple of questions for Dr. Wentworth. Um, one of these may be uh, one that was answered many, many years ago. But when one changes the uh, composition of the vaccine and puts in a new antigen that's uh, slightly different, so recognizing the changes, do you have a sense in how, how much of the immune response actually responds to the new antigens as opposed to the conserved ones, which uh, we've talked about extensively? Yeah, that's a good, great question. Um, no, I don't have a direct answer. I mean, I, I think what I would say is you don't get a huge prime to the new epitope. You get a prime to the new epitope, but you do get a good boost to um, epitopes that are cross-neutralizing between the new antigen and what you've seen previously. And that's evident when you look at those 
um, serology panels, you do see when we change antigens. So like when we changed to Darwin six, the first time though, there was a good prime against Darwin six, it was the highest titer uh, response. So uh, you're more of an immunologist than I am, frankly. And so I, I would say that that's telling you that you are seeing some priming effect. I, I think it it's different. It's not always the same. Like some years, we may not get as much prime as we would like to the new antigen. And it's likely dependent upon kind of your exposure history. So certain age groups and what they've seen in the past and things like that. The other question I had is when you have, you have such a huge database now, which is really great. It, do you, with the new mutations that arise in either the H3N2 or the H1N1, can you go back uh, like 10 years or 20 years? Do those same mutations, were they there and then disappeared? Or are these all new mutations all the time? Yeah, yeah, this is a a great question, and and yeah, um, you can you can actually do this yourself now, as as uh, a lot of the data is existing and uh, from the database can be displayed uh, in GIS eight or in Next Strain uh, up to about twelve years. And what you'll see is if you start really looking at certain positions, you'll see the same position changing. Uh, and rolling what I call rolling forward. So it will go from an isoleucine to a phenylalanine to a serine or something, you know, so you'll see it change forward. You won't, you'll rarely see it ever go backwards unless, you know, it kind of did when we went from seasonal H1N1 to PDM09 H1N1. But, um, and that's, I think, really a testament to what population immunity always drives, you know, even though that's a very hot spot, a hot, position for mutation that is impactful, um, it, it will change to something new rather than flip back. Um, and so that's that's just a general thing. Other times, it's the context of the current hemagglutinin, so it's not always the same position. So there's seven positions that um, Smith et al., Derek Smith's team, actually published quite a while back now that really we know are important in, in the various epitopes, primarily uh, A and B. Um, but there's also the context of the current hemagglutinin sometimes puts a, a position uh, to have a huge antigenic impact when in the past it really hasn't ever been used and it hasn't had much of an impact or it's it's been there and then just kind of died off like just in a small number of virus and never gained traction and so either that mutation while it's causing antigenic escape it causes fitness loss in receptor binding or some other feature or it's the new context of all the other mutations that are surrounding the area that's allowing that change to, to make a difference. Okay, thanks, David. Dr. Chatterjee? Thanks, Anna. Um, my um, question is for uh, Dr. Neumar as well. Um, I am curious about those uh, 300 million doses that go elsewhere besides the United States. Are you able to share that information with us? Um, in a general way, certainly. So most uh, manufacturers that, that supply or all manufacturers that supply the US also supply other markets in the world. And that is that may be different from manufacturer to manufacturer. <clears throat> so I, I think that's that's all I can say. Okay, Unless thank you. Have you. A, a specific question. No, I was I was just wondering um, because it seems like a pretty. Uh, significant proportion of the total number of doses that are um, that are made available. And while the U.S. population is is definitely uh, pretty significant, there are other large population centers um, in in other countries. And I was curious whether these manufacturers supply, uh, for example, the Russian market or the Chinese market and things like that. Yeah, I'm afraid I cannot comment on that. Thank you. But uh, in in Russia or China, because you mentioned these examples, there are also. Uh, several local manufacturers that supply these markets. 
that's that's what I thought would be the likely answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so quick question, I guess, to the FDA. Um, and to a degree to Dr. Wentworth. Uh, so the, the, the complications of having two H3s, two H1s, et cetera, I mean, the moment I start thinking about all the permutations and what potentially can go wrong in terms of interference, et cetera, it's a complicated process. But we do have evidence that A Yamagata, I'm sorry, B Yamagata is uh, no longer posing a health threat uh, to the public and that we also have a reassurance in the back of our mind that to a degree the B Victoria does cross-react with the B Yamagata. So not all would be lost should Yamagata rear its head again. Uh, the amount of uh, de developmental research that needs to go in removing Yamagata, I presume is not there. We, it's, not a, it's not a high lift kind of thing. So what, in your opinion, would be the downside of removing Yamagata now uh, from the vaccine? Was that to me or to David or both of us? Let's ours? begin with you. <laughs> <laughs> I, love, I love David a breather. <laughs> um. Okay, I'll start. I, but I think some of it's been covered. Uh, the downside, of course, is that the lack of certainty that that strain of the Yamagata has really no longer exist. And, you know, you just saw some of the slides that said that only a very small proportion of the B isolates were really tight. So there is some downside to taking it out too early. Um, I think that was your primary question. Um, the other downside of taking it out is that, and I, I kind of stressed this earlier, I think if it's going to be, okay, so from a regulatory point of view, it can be taken out. Mm -hmm. That part is actually hard because manufacturers are licensed to produce trivalence or quadrivalence. Yeah. The, the, the real issue is coordination, though. I don't think you're going to see one manufacturer just decide to take it out by themselves because then they will say, well, how does this play in the public? How is this going to be marketed when everybody else keeps four? So that's back to the whole issue of if it's going to be taken out, it probably needs to be coordinated globally just for otherwise it's just not going to happen. Uh, regulatory wise, yes, we can deal with it. That's not a problem. I think we've already discussed, though, besides the issue of taking it out, there is the issue of coming up with a different composition, and that's the one we've mentioned several times, that there's just got to be some more data generated so that we don't basically do something wrong with a vaccine and actually have something that doesn't work as well. And I think Elizabeth mentioned the fact, some of the details about in the development work, uh, there are some issues that, that, that can only be solved by developmental uh, research, and that's, you know, coming up with potency reagents for two things that are very closely related, coming up with serology reagents for two things that are closely related. Uh, it's not that those are insurmountable. That just takes some work. Yeah. I may have covered most of it, but looks like David can also chime in here. So, so I, I, I could not agree more with you on the issue of if we are to choose 2H1s or 2H, et cetera, or if we advocate for that, that the amount of research that has to go through before this even begins to become a reality is huge. But uh, the, the Yamagata question, I feel, is separate, that it's been uh, even pre-pandemic, there was a decline. In the pandemic, there was nothing. In our previous meeting, we indicated, well, let's have another cycle of a robust influenza circulation before we can, you know, make up our mind. So would it be another season of a similar Yamagata zero, close to zero circulation before we are confident that we probably yeah, I, I, I think you're probably right. Uh, and when I talk to 
uh, Dr. Subaral, who's also was, I think, the chairman of the VCM this particular time. I talked to her last week. She indicated pretty strongly to me that the WHO intended over the next year to have meetings both uh, with interested stakeholders that included manufacturers to just address these 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 type of issues around the the B Yamagata. When is it going to be? When is everyone going to be comfortable that it no longer exists? Is, is there more data that we need to, be, to to get to that point? So I did get the strong impression from her that there were going to be follow-ups this year by WHO to address this issue. David, you were at the meeting. You can. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, so there's a goal to do some follow-ups. There's a goal to do some targeted work in the younger age group in particular. Um because they would be likely the most susceptible based on uh, population serology type work. Um, but that is also the risk. It's to that that age group wouldn't have any prior infection history with Yamagata-like viruses. They wouldn't be. So, for example, you know, if we went to a trivalent for that had a B Victoria, you do get some boosting of the Yamagata um, responses in, in older people, but you wouldn't see that in that very young population. It would be just like my answer about the 5A1s and 5A2s with the H1, but it would be more striking because there's many, many amino acid differences between those two lineages. And so that that's one of the risks. Um, what's the benefit is another question that maybe the committee wants to ask themselves. You know, what's the benefit of removing it if you don't have something else to switch to? And then I think in the trivalent scenario, probably in the US, we're okay, but I think there may be some challenges to moving to trivalent in Europe um, because I'm not sure their licenses are maintained if they're not continually used. And that would be a question for Dr. Neumeyer. Um, Okay. And, and can I add one more thing while I'm thinking about it? Uh, you mentioned that, and you and David both touched on the cross reactivity. Just remember back before there were quadrivalents, uh, it was often a real struggle to pick which one of the B lineages to include. And we were essentially wrong about half the time, certainly at least a third of the time. And you could see clinical consequences when that when that uh, choice was not uh, not well matched. So it's the cross reactivity doesn't save you over. Okay. Yeah, thanks for thanks for pointing that out, Jerry. I didn't mean it in a way that you would be completely safe by having Victoria in there. I was trying to get at the age uh, difference. Uh, my recollection is some of those times the VE would go down in the 20s when you when uh, when the tri yeah, this was before my time, but when the trivalent was used, and say for example, a B Victoria was selected, and we had a B Yamagata season, or vice versa. Um, so I wasn't trying to say everything would be fine uh, in that respect. All right. Well, thank you both for uh, sharing this viewpoint, Dr. Pergam. Yeah. So I had sort of a different question. Um, you know, we've been talking a lot about sort of the vaccines and targeting specific, um, you know, those specific subtypes, et cetera. But, you know, one advantage of influenza is we have therapies that actually are effective. And I've been curious um, that we haven't really seen much um, transition to oseltamivir-resistant strains or veloxidor-resistant strains um, in these seasons, last two at least, um, considering, you know, for veloxidor, it's very little um, genetic um, the differences between um, those that develop resistance, um, it's a maybe a mutation or two that can lead to it. So one of the questions I'm curious, maybe um, Dr. Uh, Groshkopf can talk about this from the CDC or others is, you know, have we seen differences in treatment of those who are influenza positive? Um, and I, I wonder, as we have more COVID testing and more combination um, testing strategies available for both COVID and flu and RSV for that matter. Um, is that potentially a, 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 a change that we need to be sort of on the lookout for? And then as a follow-up to that, um, Dr. Wentworth, can you just clarify, you know, sort of how, um, since there are all of these genetic tests that are done on different strains and there's, you know, subtests that are done, but can you just clarify, you know, how the decisions are made to look for resistance and what percentage, if at all possible, these are done to look for resistance within the strains of, 
uh, particularly influenza A that we have. Um, for the, the first part of the question, I, I'm not aware that we have any any particular insight or, or surveillance on use patterns um, of the anti-influenza uh, antivirals that are currently in use. Um, we do have guidance for their use, but I'm, I'm not aware of any mechanism that we have to monitor changes in practice patterns. Thank you. And then so towards your second question, so uh, there's a combination of things, Don. We, like we uh, do for antigenic phenotyping, we now use a genotype to phenotype kind of systematic approach where we're using genetics first and then uh, do, selecting viruses for phenotyping. And that's true for antigenic analysis as well as um, antiviral susceptibility analysis. And so with the neuraminidase, we can look around the active site for mutations that could impact, um, you know, sensitivity or resistance to like, say, for example, oseltamivir like compounds neuraminidase inhibitors, most of them are targeting the active site of the enzyme. And so then we would take those and we can test them phenotypically. Now often, so for example, in H1s, there's an H275Y substitution. So that's a very specific substitution and it leads to high, highly resistant phenotype uh, or not sensitive phenotype to that particular, to osetamivir or, or other drugs like that are neuraminidase inhibitors. And so that's a very kind of genetic signature that we almost always know the phenotypic outcome. But in the H3N2, for example, there can be many substitutions in and around the active site. We're not sure if it's really impacting in this particular context, and then we'll test it phenotypically to see if it's um, considered sensitive or resistant to, to the compound. And the same is true for severe. We look around where the region uh, where the compound interacts and our that one we have a lot less experience because it's a newer uh, drug, but um, and we then we go into a phenotypic assay and for that one um, rather than doing an uh, an ELA based neuraminidase type assay we use uh, the hint assay again which is really looking for the virus replication in the presence or absence of drug. Thank you, Dr. Monto. I'm going to take us back to the Yamagata situation. And I just want to remind us all that in terms of COVID strain selection, because things were not moving quickly at WHO, uh, the U.S. took the decision to make a different recommendation from the one that was made uh, by uh, the WHO advisory group. I don't think we should do that here. I think the flu vaccine is a global, some people would say, commodity. And that's part of the problem. I think without moving towards identifying our discomfort with the fact that we've gone for several years. Granted, we, have, we had the pandemic and everybody has been busy with other things that we really haven't looked towards some of the solutions to increase uh, VE uh, by including additional strains or even more of the H3N2 in a trivalent vaccine. And I feel very uncomfortable at this point in continuing to recommend a B. Yamagata strain. I'm not going to go as far, but I will abstain because I don't feel comfortable in continuing to ignore what looks like a situation where B. Yamagata is no longer circulating, and we're not really trying to figure out what we should do 
to at least use the same antigen, antigen, uh, antigenic weight that we have in the current vaccine of uh, 15 micrograms times four to improve, uh, to improve vaccine effectiveness. Uh, we really need to send a message and uh, I'm not so sure that's done if it's only private conversations that indicate that something may be brewing because it needs to uh, include the manufacturers as well. Over. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Um, okay. <clears throat> I don't see any raised hand. Please uh, use the raise your hand function if you have any final thoughts or comments about flu vaccine strain selection. Okay. Um, well, question to Dr. Wentworth. Um, so we didn't have Yamagata for, well, it started going away a little before the pandemic and then it went away during the pandemic and uh, during a really heavy flu season, it didn't rear its head yet. Sh I'm gonna ask you to use your crystal ball, which we always ask you to use. If it were to come back, would it like all of a sudden take over? Do it, should we expect it to take over or maybe allow us time to recalibrate uh, in a subsequent season? I mean, um, I, 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 it's, it's only one out of four. Uh, H3 is always the one that trumps us with, with morbidity and mortality anyways. Um, I'm not dismissing the others, but I'm trying to, to put it in context. And in light of what Dr. Monto said that, you know, we should start moving in different directions at one point. Well, okay. So uh, I think number one, I would comment to Dr. Monto. I, I actually agree that we really need to be moving forward and to see what we can do because it takes a long time to license something new. And so I'm in complete agreement with that. I would say that I think the question here is which it's, you know, it's a licensed product for a quadrivalent vaccine that has a B. Yamagata component. So the question is really, do you put Phuket in it or what else do you put in it? So to me, that that's more of an FDA point, but to me, that's the way I read these questions. And then to the crystal ball piece, it entirely depends upon what kind of Yamagata reemerges if one does. So there was some very odd looking uh, B Yamagata viruses in the Netherlands prior to its uh, not being isolated anymore, really anagenically distinct. Um, and so if something like that were to reemerge and be fairly fit, it could move through our population in the same, uh, I would guess, the same speed with which the triple deletion B. Victoria viruses moved through our population, which was within about six months, it was a sweep to that whole strain. So that's kind of one vaccine cycle. Now, depending on when that catches us in the vaccine cycle, that could be very bad or it could be you know, not very bad at all, right? Um, if it's if it looks a lot like the viruses that we saw in 2019 that were kind of the run of the mill, uh, they were very B. Fouquet like anagenically, even though they were uh, quite a, a few years since that virus was isolated. Uh, then I think they would move relatively slowly and you would have this kind of petering, uh, you know, with years time. And so I think it really depends on what emerges, but I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility that something antigenically quite distinct could emerge. I mean, that's really what you saw with H3 uh, through the COVID bottleneck. Um, you know, something quite distinct eventually kind of really took hold. Um, and so the, the, it's not a very much of an answer. It probably doesn't make you feel very better, but uh, yeah. you know, I, I think that's really the case. I mean, you, you look at B Victoria, it's swept in about six months. Okay. Dr. Monto again. Does that mean Dave that uh, whatever we vote for, which was an, which is a very old strain would pr likely be a mismatch anyway. 
Yeah. Well, if something reemerges, it would be a mismatch, you know, given that scenario, it could be, uh, you know, I think the last virus isolated in, in March of 2020 was kind of antigenically like, you know, B. Phuket here, but it could be if it's something very different that it is, it is a drifted variant. Um, I think I would still argue that you would be better off with Yamagata. If that did happen, you'd be better off with Phuket in there than with nothing. Um, because as you know, it's still, it's still an, a boost to all your previous Yamagata and some priming to some aspects of it. So, uh, that that's a great question. Uh, it's something for the committee to, to think about. One last question from me, David. I, I don't see any raised hands yet. Um, so we have, a, I guess, uh, a cohort of, of, of our population that's been vaccinated against Yamagata for the last few years um, with not much exposure and definitely not much virus or, or drifting or you know, new antigenic uh, sites to, to, to react to. Um, are we responding well? I mean, are we still seeing uh, some of those cohorts you are uh, following? Are they yeah. repeated Yamagata? Uh... Yeah, we're seeing pretty good response to Yamagata. We didn't, I didn't show you human serology data because we did not do a panel of human serology. We did do a screen of the vaccinees to see that they responded to the Yamagata component. Okay. Um, but there's no new emerging variants to test against. So it's kind of pointless to, to, mm -hmm. to do but that. responding to the antigen. Yeah, but they're the responding to the antigen that's in the vaccine. Yes, they're responding to the antigen that's in the vaccine. Okay. In, in our quadrivalent vaccines. And that's really the only um, vaccines we have in our serology testing. So I don't, we don't have a trivalent. Okay. Uh... Final opportunity for committee members to ask questions, provide comments before the vote. Okay. All right. Thank you all. Uh, Dr. Paydar, uh, so do I read, do, do we display the questions? Do I read the questions again? I'm sorry, or how should we proceed? Oh, um, thanks for asking. Um, I'll just go ahead and read the, um, the, um, uh, voting um, script, and then from there, I'll have you um, read the questions one by one. We do it consecutively, and then we will have the final voting uh, explanations all the way at the end. So, okay. um, all right, so let me uh, read the script first. Um, only our 12 regular members and one temporary voting member, a total of 13, will be voting in today's meeting. With regards to the voting process, Dr. El Sali will read the voting questions for the record, and afterwards, all voting members and temporary voting member will cast their vote by selecting one of the following options, which include yes, no, or abstain. You'll have one minute to cast your vote after the question is read. Please note that once you've cast your vote, um, you may change your vote within the one minute time frame. However, once the poll has closed, all votes will be considered final. Once all the votes have been placed, we will broadcast the results and read the individual uh, votes allowed for the public record. Um, I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions regarding the voting process before I begin. If no, okay, Dr. El Sali, if you would be kind to please go ahead and read the voting question number one for the record. Voting question one, for the influenza A H1N1 component of the 2023-2024 influenza virus vaccines in the U.S., does the committee recommend an A Victoria 4897 H1N1 PDM09 like virus egg-based vaccines, an A Wisconsin 672019 H1N1 PDM09 like virus cell or recombinant based vaccines. Great, thank you. At this point, um, Joseph will move um, all non-voting members out of the main room. For those of you who are non-voting, please stay tuned. Uh, please don't log out of the Zoom. We'll be back in a few minutes. Joseph, let me know um, when all the voting members are present. Thank you. All right. 
Opening up breakout room now. Joseph, whenever you get a chance to display the Excel, that would be fantastic. Yes. Share my screen now. Great, thank you. Okay, great, thanks. Um, Dr. Um, Haley Gans, yes. Dr. Hannah El Sali, yes. Dr. Jay Portnoy, yes. Dr. Stephen Pergam, yes. Dr. Stanley Perlman, yes. Dr. Arnold Monto, yes. Dr. Paul Offit, yes. 
Dr. Douglas Badzik, yes. Dr. Archana Chatterjee, yes. Dr. Amanda Cohn, yes. Dr. Holly James, yes. Dr. Adam Berger, yes. Dr. Hank Bernstein, yes. Okay. Um, Hannah, if you would be so kind to read question number two um, for um, so we can go ahead and vote on that one. Okay. Both in question two for the influenza A, H3, and two component of the 2324 influenza virus vaccines in the US, does the committee recommend an A Darwin 9 2021 H3N2 like virus egg based vaccines and A Darwin, A Darwin 6 2021 H3N2 like virus cell or recombinant based vaccines? Great, thank you. Um, Joseph, please let me know when all the voting members are present. Okay. out of 13 members have voted yes and um 
I'll read the names for each of the votes for the public record. Great, thank you, Joseph. Um, Dr. Stephen Pergam, yes. Dr. Adam Berger, yes. Dr. Haley Gans, yes. Dr. Archana Chatterjee, yes. Dr. Arnold Monto, yes. Dr. Paul Offit, yes. Dr. Hannah Sali, yes. Dr. Jay Portno, yes. Dr. Amanda Cohn, yes. Dr. Sandy Perlman, yes. Dr. Hank Bernstein, yes. Dr. Holly Janes, yes. And Dr. Badzik, yes. Um, Hannah, if you would be um, kind to read the third voting question for the public record. Voting question three for the influenza B component of the 2023-2024 trivalent and quadrivalent influenza virus vaccines in the US. Does the committee recommend the inclusion of a B Austria 1359417 2021-like virus B Victoria lineage? Great, thank you, um, Dr. Asali. Joseph, please let me know when all the voting members are present.
All right, we're ready to share results. Okay, great. Thanks, Joseph. Mm -hmm. um, again, we have 13 members who voted yes for voting question number three. Um, it was a unanimous vote, and now I'll read the votes for um, the public record, the official votes. Great, thank you. Um, Dr. Archana Chatterjee, yes. Dr. Paul Offit, yes. Dr. Jay Portnoy, yes. Dr. Haley Gans, yes. Dr. Stanley Perlman, yes. Dr. Amanda Cohn, yes. Dr. Hank Bernstein, yes. Dr. Stephen Pergam, yes. Dr. Adam Berger, yes. Dr. Holly Janes, yes. Dr. Douglas Badzik, yes. Dr. Hannah El Sali, yes. Dr. Arnold Monto, yes. Okay. With that, we will move to our final voting question, voting question number four. Um, Hannah, would you, Dr. El Sali, if you could please read the question for, for us. Hmm. Voting question four, for quadrivalent 2024, 2023, 2024 influenza vaccines in the US, does the committee recommend inclusion of a BFUCAT 30732013 like virus B Yamagata lineage as the second influenza B strain in the vaccine. Great, thank you. Joseph, please let me know when all the voting members are present. We're ready to display results. Great, thank you. Okay, we have um, 13 uh, voting members for voting question number four. Um, seven out of 13 have voted yes, two out of 13 have voted no, and four out of 13 have abstained from voting. 
Now, with that, I will read individual votes for the public record. Okay. Um, Dr. Archana Chatterjee, yes. Dr. Haley Gans, yes. Dr. Adam Berger, no. Dr. Jay Portnoy, yes. Dr. Stanley Perlman, abstain. Dr. Paul Offit, no. Dr. Amanda Cohn, yes. Dr. Arnold Monto, abstain. Dr. Hank Bernstein, yes. Dr. Stephen Pergam, yes. Dr. Holly James, abstain. Dr. Douglas Badzik, yes. Dr. Hannah Sali, abstain. Okay. Um, this concludes the voting portion for today's meeting. I'll hand the meeting back to Dr. El Sali for asking the committee for their vote explanation. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pedar. So um, to start us off, I see a raised hand from Dr. Weir. Dr. Weir. Uh, yes, I'm sorry to have to say this. Uh, there was a typo in question number one. Um, we uh, the second part of it. The Wisconsin should have been the sixty-seven two thousand and twenty-two, not two thousand and nineteen. So I'm not sure what we need to do about it, but I thought I better point it out now rather than later. Should have given we it a different at, name, right? <laughs> Would have been we, much easier. <laughs> we all looked at this at least a dozen times. Don't but, worry uh, about it, Doctor Ware. We will adjust okay. the writing and we resubmit <laughs> it when we uh, web post the final. It's okay. okay. We'll post it at that point. As long as the committee is comfortable with their voting based on the current information, we should be okay. We can. Okay. Uh, Thank you. No worries. Thank yes. The committee wants the strain displayed by Dr. Wentworth. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I'm going now to go over the virtual table and request that uh, the committee members um, provide the, uh, the rationale for their votes as briefly or as expansively as you wish. Uh, and I'm going to go in the order that the names appear here on my screen, and I think it's Dr. Berger. Two weeks in a row, I think the first. <laughs> so, but at least it's just one one explanation. I, I'm I'm going to skip my my votes for for questions one through three. I, I think those are self explanatory as to why those are needed um, components of the vaccine. So I'll, I'll I'll say I voted no on the last question around the inclusion of B. Yamagata for the same reason I voted no in the last meeting. Um, the inclusion of a strain that's not circulating doesn't seem to offer additional protections for the public. And this isn't a vote against continuing the currently licensed quadrivalent, but at this point, I think we really need to send a strong signal that in the interest of public health, we need to be conducting the studies to generate the evidence base for a much more flexible vaccine composition now. So that's the reason why I voted no. That's it. Thank you, Adam. Dr. Cohn. Great, thank you. Um, I will also skip my first three votes, which were yeses. Um, I voted yes for the fourth vote uh, to include the Yamagata because um, even though I completely agree with Dr. Berger's uh, points, I did have concerns about what would happen to the quadrivalent vaccine and the program if we didn't have a usable vaccine for this year. And so um, in the spirit of um, in the spirit of ensuring that we had accessible choices of vaccines um, while we continue to move forward with um, improving the strains there and there, I voted yes. Thank you, Dr. Cohn, Dr. Ch Dr. Chatterjee. Thank you, Dr. Al Saleh. Um, so I will follow in the footsteps of my co-committee members and uh, not explain um, my yes vote for the first three questions. Um, I basically looked at the data that were presented and it seemed reasonable to include those three strains. With regard to the uh, B. Yamagata, I've given it a fair bit of thought and I do not disagree with the comments already made. Um, I do think, though, that uh, the concern that Yamagata may reemerge, the fact that 
a large proportion of the B uh, um, strains were actually not subtyped, so we don't know exactly what they were, um, were concerning to me. One other thing I will say with regard to including a strain that is does not appear, at least from the data we have at hand, to be circulating at this time is uh, something that I haven't brought up before, but has been in the back of my mind, and that is including uh, an antigen that um, doesn't perhaps provide any benefit uh, and yet uh, certainly has some element of risk, although it might be minimal, attached to it, but mostly the expense that it involves to grow up those viruses, to get those viruses ready um, uh, through recombinant me mechanisms and, and to have it have them available uh, for use in the port of England vaccine. So it, I, was, I was really torn uh, in trying to decide between those two things. And I came down on the side of being um, prudent and cautious and, and voted yes, um, because I do think that uh, probably a little more time is needed to make those decisions. But I would echo my co-committee members' comments about the powers that be um, working on uh, trying to remove uh, Yamagata from future vaccine compositions. Thank you, Dr. Chatterjee. Dr. Monto? I think I explained uh, previously what I was going to be doing. Uh, it, uh, even if we voted no, uh, we're only advisory and uh, the uh, um, staff could be moving ahead with uh, the global recommendation and uh, it really would have very little effect this year. However, we've waited a long time for some action about uh, a questionable uh, uh, choice uh, to continue with B. Yamagata. Uh, I disagree with uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the opinions we've heard. The evidence for the need for the quadrivalent is mixed. And uh, there are a number of studies uh, which were conducted when both vaccines were being used in the United States, which showed uh, very little benefit, at least in an adult population. I think the evidence in children may be different. And perhaps at that time, the data were not sufficient to really observe uh, the need. But uh, I think we really need to move ahead on this. We are giving vaccines which have good benefit, not great benefit, and we need to do everything we can to improve the vaccines. And one of the things we know does improve the vaccines is giving more antigen. And uh, we should give the right antigen uh, over. Thank you, Dr. Monto. Uh, Dr. Wentworth. Oh, you're non-voting, I'm sorry. Dr. Dr. Batsik. Yeah, um, good afternoon, everybody. So um, hang on a second, let the video kick on here. Um, so kind of as the, the rest of the group has you know, previously stated, I'm not gonna go over my reasons for you know, voting yes for the first three, because I think it's self-evident. Um, I did kind of struggle with um, you know, voting on the, the fourth one. I ended up casting a yes vote for that, uh, mainly because I didn't really see an alternative. There was an alternative provided. That being said, I, I think that you know, going into the future, you know, as has been stated previously, um, I think it's important just not to go and maintain in the course unless there's data to support that. Um, I'm a bit concerned as you know we come out of the pandemic and we see you know the increasing fervor of the anti-vaccine crowd 
Um, and I, I'm concerned that if we just continue to, you know, maintain, you know, this um, this lineage in the in the quadrivalent without, um, you know, data to back that up, that type of behavior I think could be misconstrued um, by some, you know, in the anti-vax movement just to, you know, further their cause. So, you know, I, once again, I voted yes, but I would encourage, um, you know, the manufacturers and, you know, the, those that are collecting that, you know, surveillance data to do what we can to justify that for next year. Thank you, Dr. Batsik. Dr. Dr. Gans. Hi, thank you. Um, I um, I guess we're we're all sort of leaning towards explaining um, our vote for the fourth question here, since we were um, in agreement with the other ones, and there was lots of data to support it. So, I just want to echo that um, I voted yes. Um, and the reasons I did that um, are not because I would like to downplay what um, others had said. Um, there's definitely um, data to support us um, moving in a different direction. And I just wanted to echo, I guess, what um, Amanda Cohen said was that really reflected on me as the sort of global stage and what we need to do to actually keep the global populations healthy and um not necessarily understanding fully what's going to happen as we all recover from the pandemic and not seeing strains. And maybe there has been some, um, you know, immunity that hasn't been boosted over that period of time. So um, I voted yes for that to hold, maintain stability, but really um, as my remarks in the past have said, really do urge um, further studies, not only just for this particular strain, but actually to have some um, ability to be more flexible in general about the um, strains at which we actually need to vote on because this issue may come up again. So while this one is current, um, it will be a different one next time. And so I just would love some flexibility to respond better to the data. Thank you, Dr. Gans. It's good. Uh, next, someone trying to say something? Oh, it isn't anymore, yeah. but it may have been taken over by someone. Uh, hot mic, maybe. Uh, Dr. Bernstein. Uh, thank you, Dr. Osali. I, um, uh, I agree with my uh, colleagues around the virtual uh, table about questions one, two, and three. Um, the issue about number four, I, I voted yes. And in part, that's why I asked Dr. Weir during his introduction right at the beginning. And to me, his response suggested to me that change uh, was not possible for this uh, particular season. And so that being said, it's not clear to me what pre ex uh, precise data are needed and during what time frame uh, this will happen in order to make such a change, which scientifically seems to be uh, make a lot of sense. And so I also didn't want that the public to interpret that the quadrivalent flu vaccine is not necessary because I uh, think that it's important to get as many people vaccinated against influenza as uh, possible. Over. Noted. Thank you, Dr. Bernstein. Dr. James. Thank you. Um, I I'll uh, skip to my vote for the for the fourth vote, and I abstained from this vote, um, you know, similar to the reasons that have been stated before, B basically I felt that, that there wasn't, you know, adequate data um, given the absence of, apparent absence of circulation of B. Yamagata to make a recommendation as to strain selection. Um, and so I hoped that voting abstain would, um, you know, c c convey the inability uh, in my mind to, to to make a determination, but but I fully support the, the messages um, that others have put forward around the the continued importance of vaccination and and that you know my vote vote doesn't call into question the the importance of vaccination. Um, I, I also wanted to second Dr. Gans's comment and and request for 
uh, additional flexibility in terms of how this this committee consid considers the the strains that are included in the vaccination um, in in future meetings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jaynes. Dr. Portnoy. Great, thank you. Um, is in terms of strains, one questions one, two, and three. Again, I voted yes, and I'm. Uh, okay with those, even with the uh, error in the, the typographical error. Um, so it's not a problem. My, my <clears throat> I voted uh, yes for the Yamagata strain, not because I think that there's a lot of that, but I don't know, does extinct really mean extinct? The uh, 1350, black the Black Plague uh, in 1350 was extinct, and 10 years later it came back. So we don't really know for sure that things like that aren't going to return. Uh, besides, if we don't, if we vote no for the Yamagata strain, there aren't really a lot of B strains out there. It's not clear that we even need B strains in the influenza vaccines at all. So I voted for that just because I'm not sure that it's extinct. What I do want to comment on, though, is that I'm hoping that in the future we will start seeing use of more advanced technologies than these legacies like cell cellular vaccines or egg-based vaccines. We're injecting eggs with with influenza virus and extracting it, that, that's a very old fashioned technique. I'm looking forward to the messenger RNA based influenza vaccines that not only could be modified very quickly as the strains of influenza modify, but could also possibly induce more of a cellular immunity, which I think for long-term benefit could be uh, quite helpful. Uh, so so I'm, I'm hoping that, that that's going to be a possibility. We, we allow uh, the COVID vaccine to have variants in its strain without having a whole new licensing thing. I don't know why we can't take an influenza, license it for just flu, and then make all of the modifications depending on what strains are present that year. I think a newer technology would, would allow that to happen, and I look forward to that happening in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Portnoy. Dr. Offit. Yes, thank you. Um, I, like Dr. Berger, voted no, um, because I think that if you're going to inject someone with a biological agent, even if it's only one component of a multi-component product, there should be clear evidence for benefit. I don't think we have any evidence for benefit with this strain. And although I agree that it's the, that, that this, this strain may come back in the, in, the, in the near or distant future, that is not a compelling enough reason for me to include it now. Plus, I agree with Dr. Mato's comment that should it come back, you wonder whether or not it would be distant enough from the current strain as to be of value. So I voted no. Thank you. Thank you. Dr. Perlman? Yes, I think it's going close to the end here. I don't have very much new to say. Uh, I think that there's not evidence for including Yamagata. I voted, I abstained uh, because I thought there wasn't great evidence for including it. And because of where we are in the course of vaccine development, I, I felt that if for this year, uh, it, it would be okay to include it. I didn't vote against it for that reason. And I hope that next year we don't have the same discussion. I hope that there's either more data saying we should include it, or we uh, have data showing that we should remove it and have removed it. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Pergam. Thanks, Dr. Rosselli. Um, I don't have much to add um, from what my colleagues have already talked about, but um, I voted yes um, because it felt like the train had already left the station when they, before they did to the, um, the quadrivalent. I don't feel like we can do a trivalent um, international, at least what was responded. That's a little harder to do. And um, I think it's important that um, the process has sort of already begun in some ways within the, the world stage. Um, but I think I voted yes with the sort of um, a little bit of trepidation because um, I, I think, as others have commented, um, it doesn't feel like Yamagata is getting us a lot of benefit. But what I think we'd all really like to see is additional data and studies planned for what would be a potential replacement um, for um, the B strain if it is, if it is removed. Um, so um, encourage the FDA to start working with companies to start coming up with those studies to further identify how that might be advantageous for future vaccines. Thank you. Um, I think it's my turn. Uh, so I abstained uh, from voting on the inclusion of B. Yamagata, hesitated between a no and an abstain. 
but it's definitely not a yes. Uh, influenza virus is not known to be shy. If uh, it was gonna, if Yamagata was gonna circulate in the last four years, it we would have picked it up. We do note that the trend preceded the pandemic, and we indicated for I think two or three meetings now that. Well, the, the non-pharmacological measures of the pandemic are going over. We're seeing a whole lot of flu, but we're not seeing the Yamagata. We said we'd give it one more season. The season was this year, and we had really an abundant circulation of, of flu all over the world, and Yamagata did not rear its head. When and if it does, we'd be ready. From a regulatory standpoint, going from four to three shouldn't be a hurdle because there is a trivalent vaccine and no additional research or developmental work needs to happen for us not to include the Yamagata. And, um, and when it comes to implementation and, and, and uh, vaccine distribution, also not including the Yamagata should not impact our ability to distribute the vaccine uh, to those who need it each year. So that's that's why I chose not to vote for the Yamagata this year. Um, I think uh, we are uh, done with the task uh, that, that was uh, given to us. Uh, any final comments from the FDA? or Dr. Weir, Dr. Kasla, Dr. So for the closing comments, I just wanted to thank um, the committee and CBER staff for working so hard to make this meeting a successful meeting. Uh, we're very grateful for your presentations and for your um, input. Uh, I'll call the meeting officially adjourned at 3.27 p.m. Eastern time. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Bye-bye.